My name's Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan, the Lion's Eye, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of the guy from Gower Gulch. It's a gray building, about the color of moldy bread. It's an apartment house in the middle of Hollywood, and it figures that the guy who built it quit voting when they named the street it sits on, Taft Avenue. My place is furnished with war surplus from the Spanish-American War. Well, it's got a hat rack, and that's where I live, number 308. In back, where you get a view and some fresh air from the alley. One's about as bad as the other. But I got it fixed up kind of nice. Hot plate, coffee pot, an autographed picture of Sally Rand that somebody left there. Only mistake I made was putting in a telephone. It spoils a lot of things. Regan, it's the lion. Wake up. We got a job. Why don't you sleep at night? Lucky for you, I got insomnia. We go broke. Try Ovaltine. What kind of a job? How should I know? Get your clothes on. What are you doing, reading the want ads? I got a note from a client. You mean you got money? Hundred bucks is all. Says he'll match it if we run him an errand. Where to? Santa Ana Canyon? He'll tell you. You know, you got morals like a cash register. Can he write his name? Davy Crockett. He's 50 uh, years old. Well, he's a little old for cowboys and Indians, isn't he? That's his name, Davy Crockett. Well, when's the wagon train pull out? Regan, I don't know how I stand for you. Get over there. Get where? Listen, a guy works pretty hard building up a business like I have takes a lot out of him. Well, you got plenty on tap. I just want you to understand that's all. Money doesn't grow on trees. Now, sometimes you got to play your hunches. Like George Gallup. This time I got a feeling the guy's okay. He writes like a gentleman, Regan. I want you to treat him like one. But where do I find him? He's in a location can give us a lot of business. Where? The city jail. <laughs> Yeah, that's the lion, born under the sign of the dollar. Well, it happened on Monday night, and I found the Lincoln Heights jail looking real tired after a rough weekend. They were putting fresh creosote on the walls in front of the drunk tank, and the guy at the desk looked like he'd burst his radiator if anybody phoned for another reservation. It was about 1 a.m., but after a couple of jokes I know about alligators, Sergeant Gonzalez hauled out a drawer with some cards in it. Under C, he found it. Full name, David Crockett. Cell 273, solitary. Gonzalez walked me through a couple of quarters, and then he opened his cell and let me inside. Davy Crockett was there, awake and standing up. He was about four feet high, skinny, with a head like a sunburned turnip. He had blue veins roaming all over his nose and a handlebar mustache to hold him up. He looked at me like I was holding the fifth ace. Howdy, stranger. My name's Regan, International Detective Bureau. How do I know? Start anything and I'll set up a racket. No, I work for the lion. You called him. Maybe yes, maybe no. You got credentials? Where do you want them? Easy, son. Not talking to an amateur. Flyweight champion, Buenos Aires, 29. Grab yourself a squat, partner. Mm -hmm. What are you so nervous about? Nothing. Precautious, that's all. All right, look, let's start at the beginning, shall we? What are you locked up for? Fire plug. Got him in the dangerous places in this bird. What'd you do, steal it for your dog? No. Parked my landlady's car alongside it while I ran in there. You don't get jugged for traffic tickets. There were two cops. Looked like a posse. I don't like injustice. All right, resisting arrest, is that all? What more do you want? Told you I'm not a man to be trampled with. Taught judo in Tokyo, 34. <laughs> the Jap still lost the war. Sit still, Regan. You're working. On what? Well, it's... Just another errand. It's not much. Well, come on. Let's pick up the tempo, will you? My bicycle's double parked. Say, you ever get saddle sores on a bicycle? I did once. Eight-day race. Yeah, yeah, I know. Now, what about this errand? Little package wrapped up in a sweater. In the alley, by the ash can. Go on. I calculate I dropped it about three and a half feet to the left of the big ash can. By accident? Man can't fight with his hands full. I wrote down the address for you here. All right. What's in that sweater you didn't want the cops to see? A pole cat. It fits the rest of your story, yeah. Son, there's nothing in the life of Davy Crockett won't stand inspection. 
When you get the package, check it in at the Union Station. And then what? Save me the stub. You get a hundred. Save it for bail. You could do this job yourself. Thought I told you, Sonny. I'd like to be lonesome. So you had him lock you up on purpose? No, I just like it here. You want a reference? Check any of the boys in Gower Gulch. Movie cowboy, huh? Laddie, you're looking at the greatest jockey since Paul Revere. Eddie Sand, Eddie Arcaro. I beat them all. Kentucky Downs, 39. Yeah, sure. Well, a job's a job, Davy, but I got a hot tip where I fit in. Where's that? Trailing the field. Well, I left the little man running his fingers through an old copy of Variety, and I went out into the street. It was about 3 o'clock, and a truck was throwing some water out and giving the gutter a shampoo. I picked up my car and started out to play retriever. That's when I spotted the blonde tailing me. She was using a 37 Packard, and the top was down. I could see her in the mirror. I could tell she had yellow hair like a rag doll. It took a few fast turns to get rid of her, but then I was solo when I pulled to a stop by the alley off Gower. It was in back of some old movie studios. About then, a drunk came pouring down the street, did a loop around a fire plug at the head of the alley, and sat down. He was the talented kind, and I figured he thought I was Arthur Godfrey. Well, I scrambled over some broken beer bottles looking for the sweater. It finally showed, lying beside a pack of newspaper and some dame's torn petticoat. That's when the drunk lost his tilt and began looking at me. I picked up an old shoe, I wrapped it in a newspaper, and I started out of the alley. The drunk went back to his audition, moving toward me. Dawn is breaking, Marie. You'll soon be waking. Hiya, friend. Have a drink. That's not my brand. Don't be a mug. A little drink between friends is real nice. Well, we haven't been introduced. Well, my name's Maxwell. What's yours? Slipped my mind. Ah, that's the trouble with the whole world. No fellowship. Except for my girl, Marie. You know Marie? No, I don't. Sort of short and plump, a little sinus trouble. That's too bad. Thought you might have met her. Lots of fellowship in that girl. Every time you look, another fella. All right, move it, buddy. Now, you don't want to get by me, friends. You want to stand right there and have a little drink. You got the subject we're going to talk about? Yeah, sure, sure. What's in the package? Dirty laundry. Ain't that funny, though. I just got me a new Bendix. Why don't you go into business? That's what I'm going to do. You're my first customer. No, I lux my dainties. Yeah, don't go away, friend. I ain't through with my sales talk. Well, hire a skywriter. Hold up, I said. Get your hands off of me. All right, Regan, the rock's over. Yeah, what makes you the referee? This does. Friend here wants to play rough, Red. Reconsider, Regan. It'll make you happy. All right, what do you want? The package. You heard what he said, smart guy. Why don't you work for hey, it? Heavy, Max. <laughs> Don't leave, Regan. We're not finished. I got the package, Red. Give him a tip for picking it up. Sure. Guess I overpaid him. Well, it was easy to see. It was their play. I had about as much chance as a midget in a basketball game. The muscles ambled off with the package that they took from me, and I crawled back for that sweater. It was still there, wrapped around something hard and round. And when I ripped it off, a shine caught my eyes. It was a metal can of movie film, and the word Peru was marked on it. Not much for all the hush-hush, but it must have had a story. Well, I looked up a friend of mine who owned a camera shop, and I made a commotion with a five-dollar bill. That shook the sand out of him, and he rented me a projector with sound. The lion's house was the next stop. We threw up a sheet on the wall and turned on the film. That completed the night. We had a trip to a good neighbor without a passport. Wonders turned out to be a Joan Fitzpatrick giving with some kind of a travelogue. One of the most colorful in the world. A temple of worship. Home of Peru, 2,000 years old. You can't in the to see a movie. Well, stop screaming, the will you? It's free. You know I can't stand movies. I got sore eyes. All right, shut up and listen to this. Peru, the marketplace. A street vendor dressed in gay native costume. Selling delicacies to Peruvian children. Beads and jewels of exquisite beauty wrought by the hands of master Peruvian artisans. Horse racing, an innovation from the modern world. And native dance. I'm going to bed. You won't sleep. I stole your eye shade. Oh, Regan, I got to get up early. I got lots to do. It'll keep. A veritable symphony of motion. And so, it's with heavy heart we say adieu to lovely Peru. Land of the Peruvians. Land of charm and enchantment. And with the setting sun, we take our leave. 
Well, what'd you get out of it? A headache. Yeah, we'll talk about it in the morning. No, I can't wait. No. What you doing now? I'm phoning the city jail. Looking for a room? Looking for information. Davey will supply it. You've been drinking. Now listen, big shot. Somebody's after this film for some reason. I'm going to find it. City jail, Sergeant Gonzalez speaking. Danny is Regan. Oh, hi, you, Regan. I'm glad you called. I just got that joke about the alligators. <laughs> yeah, well, do me a favor, will you? Sure, pal, sure. Say, I told it to the lieutenant. He's still laughing. You know, it may earn me a promotion, pal. Let me talk to Davy Crockett. Oh, I can't do that, Regan. Well, you can say I'm his lawyer. Well, it's not that, pal. He's not here anymore. What do you mean? Some guy bailed him out 20 minutes ago. When I was telling the lieutenant the joke, this guy in the briefcase comes in, slaps down the bail. Out walks your friend. Well, he said he liked it there. And Davey must have changed his mind. Where'd he go? Not very far. Just over to the morgue. Well, the cowboy from Gower Gulch had spun his last yarn. Gonzalez told me that somebody had shot Crockett as soon as he hit the street. Oh, none of this made sense. The phony job, the blonde who tailed me, the fight in the alley, the corny movie. Well, the lion shoved the film in a desk, and I went out the door. I cut across his yard, but I stopped on the opposite sidewalk. My car wasn't alone. It was a 40-foot nash sniffing at its rear fender. Hey, Regan. Well, Maxwell. That's me. You look different. Did you take the cure? Shut up. Somebody wants to see you. If it's Marie, tell her my book's full. Thought you might like a lift. No, I got a friend who runs a streetcar. Now go on, beat it. Regan, don't be that way. Oh, Grimm, a tell her, Maxwell. Who's this, your father-in-law? You smoke, Regan? No, it might explode. Yes. Uh, so long. Hold this, plastic. <laughs> Get in. Oh, Max. Max, I told you before, you're on probation. Oh, that's all right. Don't pick on him, teacher. He didn't hurt me. Get in front, Max. Sure. Where's your other boy, Red? We could play some bridge. I thought he'd do better in the shoe business. The one I gave him didn't fit, huh? I'm a much misunderstood man, Mr. Egan. I'm sure you'll put your best foot forward. I'd love to. My card, Horace Grundy. Mm -hmm. Sometime earlier, a little man called me, Mr. Egan. Uh, Custer or Boone or... uh... Davy Crockett? Of course. I want you to understand I get many such calls. Party line. It's a private number, but the salesmen bother me anyway. It's tough to be popular. Davy tell you what he was selling? No. Well, he didn't tell me either. Have it your own way. When I told him I'd meet him, he said he'd arranged to get out of jail. He said all he wanted was a job. And he got one. Yes, only there's no future to it. I wouldn't want anything like that happening to you, Mr. Regan. I'll renew my insurance. Oh, no, you'll come with me. It's more friendly. I suppose I don't like to talk. You won't have to, if everything goes all right. Well, it's your taxi. And you're paying the fare. All right, Maxwell. Clover Field. I never knew a guy could say the name of an airport and make it sound like Forest Lawn. Grundy sat in the corner checking the manicure on his fingernails, and Maxwell drove out Olympic. By the time we skidded into Clover, I'd figured absolutely nothing. It was still only 4 a.m., but there was a string of cars parked in the lot. I spotted a 37-packard roadster, but I was too busy getting rushed up onto the field to look for the blonde. Besides, the faster we ran, the more excited Grundy got. Hey, Grundy. And then uh, we rounded the hangar, and the reporters hit us. Say, hey, Louis B's pretty sore, huh? No, no, Louis B and I are friends. Just his plugs are burned. <laughs> but it's true, boys. Hey, wait a second. This Juno who's traveling on the plane. They say he wants a quarter of a million. You going to pay him today? After I see a workout. Come on, Regan, let's go. Yeah, you're a real big man, Grundy. I'm going to be, Regan. El Romano. Best rip of any horse in South America. So that's it, huh? Where the ruins come from. Uh, What's that? Peru. Oh, sure. Peruvian National Airways gave Julio a special plane. Everything special. Like in the movies. Well, look, suppose you watch him unload. I'll take a back seat here. Oh, no, no, Regan. This is a big day. I want you to see what... What's the ambulance for? Don't look at me. Stick around, Regan. It could be you. Romano. Hey, get that stretcher over there. Oh, he kicked me, hit me, kicked me. It's Julio. Is that the guy who owns him? Must be. I, I tried to hold him, the hold on break. Oh, my rib. Take it easy, boy. We got you. What happened? Bounce, bounce. The landing, she is rough. That is all. Where is the doctor? You're going to the hospital. Lie down. Oh, I'm broken in six places. Lift up the stretcher. Come on, boys. Hurry it up. Oh, he kicked, he kicked me. Move fast, boys. Yes, hot. Hey, Mr. Bundy. Mr. Bundy. Mr. Bundy, the horse. 
The guy by the plane started to yell just about the time they took Julio toward the rear of the ambulance. Grundy took a dive for the cargo door, and so did everybody else. And then I had to stand there while six feet of big shot cigar turned into a crybaby. Look, Regan. Look at the horse's leg. He's kicked himself. Okay, so he's clumsy. But he might not run again. He was going to be mine, Regan. That's too bad. Call a vet. I have already paid 50,000 retainer on the horse, Regan. I'll send you a lawyer. I got an idea you're connected with this. Oh, dry up, Buster. It's an accident. Yeah? I got an idea there's going to be another accident. Yeah, Grundy. Maybe you're right. <laughs> Go! Hey, stop him! I didn't wait to see if he went down. Maxwell swung, but I took off through the crowd. I figured that Cloverfield wasn't for me, and I wasn't going to stick around for the daisy. And then I spotted a ride, the rear end of Julio's ambulance. And I made it just as the buggy started to move. I pulled the door shut and tried not to step on that stretcher inside. I shouldn't even have bothered that. The stretcher was empty. The only patient was me. You are listening to the story of the guy from Gower Gulch. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. Commissions are still available in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve. Graduate registered nurses between the ages of 21 and 45 may qualify for service with this fine organization. If you are interested in joining the Army Nurse Corps and believe that you qualify for a commission, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to Jeff Regan, investigator, and the story of the guy from Gower Gulch. Well, things were beginning to move like a hula dancer with a hot foot. Davy Crockett sent me out to pick up a roll of movie film. A Joan Fitzpatrick travelogue on beautiful Peru. There was something in it that was hot, but Crockett got himself plugged before he could say what it was. There were shots of a horse race in Peru. And when a big buster named Grundy turns up buying a nag from a Peruvian breeder, I figured a connection. So did Grundy. When the horse got hurt and Julio did a disappearing act with his money, everybody looked at me. That's when I took the shortest way to Hollywood in an ambulance, got in my car, and made it for home. Only parked up the street from my apartment was that same 37 packet roadster I'd been dodging all evening. The blonde wasn't in it. She was sitting in my place looking real hopeful. Good evening. You keep late hours, Mr. Regan. No, it's the kind of friends I've got. Perhaps you ought to change them. I'll stick it out. What do you want? A little chance to talk to you. It'll keep till morning. Oh, but Mr. Regan, I've been waiting so long, you've got to talk to me now. Why? I'm Davy Crockett's wife. You've got something that belongs to me. I don't see any wedding ring. I... I don't wear one. Scare off the other boys? That's not a very nice remark, Mr. Regan. No, but you'll let it go. Only because it's not important. Oh, stop it. You're not Davy's wife. If the little guy had anybody he could trust, he wouldn't have had to call him a lion. All right, Mr. Regan. I lie. Now, let's have it, lady. What are you after? The roll of film. That figures. It's mine. Convince me. Mr. Regan, you're becoming very annoying. Why don't you call the police? But I tell you, it is mine. Let's see the pink slip. And so it is with heavy heart we bid adieu to... That's enough. Yeah, yeah. I thought I knew that voice. Mm. Davy stole the roll from my library. Now may I have it back? Homicide will turn it over to you when they're ready. I can't wait. Well, what makes it so valuable? Mm, I'm not sure. Then how do you know it is? Because I'm not stupid, Mr. Regan. Somebody goes to a lot of trouble to break into my film library. But he only steals one roll of film. Go on. I put the police on Davy, followed them to the jail. So you go after the film. That added up to pretty important business. Did you push those holes in Davy? Of course not. Now, you're going to get a chance to prove that when homicide starts speaking in your cupboard. About the film, I'll buy it from you. No sale. There's the door, lady. Use it. I threw the light switch and grabbed for the floor. When the noise stopped, I looked up. My landlady was going to be mad. The shots plowed a few holes into her flower pot. The blonde turned a couple of different colors and decided she could find safer company. She left with a fire escape without even goodbye. Well, I headed for the lions. The idea being to make sure that he'd turn that film over to the police and advertise that I didn't have it anymore. That figured to cool me off and I could catch some sleep again. When I got there, the lion looked kind of excited. He was wrapped up in a silk robe with red and gray stripes, and he carried a drink to match. He was holding a piece of that movie film up to the light. Hey, Regan, I've been calling all over for you. Where you been? I've been looking for a bed. I don't pay you to sleep. You're on a job. Now, uh, I've been drinking since you left. 
We're handling this wrong. Yeah, now that's what I figure. Get on the phone. What for? To tell Homicide you got a package for him. You're turning over that film right now. Easy, Regan. You heard me, big shot. I'm tired of playing the fall guy. Now, Regan, you don't know what you're saying. I've been running over the section on that Peruvian horse race. And you know what? You picked the winner. And we're going to collect. Who's making book? The insurance company. Well, come on. Clear it up. Look at this clip. Yeah. Well, what do you see? What do you see? Looks like a horse. But look at him. He's way out in front. El Romano. Yeah, maybe. Now, here's the way I add it up. This film tells a story, or everybody wouldn't be grubbing around for it. Well, now, that takes a big brain. So somebody's engineering a phony. Who? That's what you're going to find out. But I'll tell you one thing. That nag's insured by Banner Trust, and they pay off big if we can turn up the swindle. All right. Give me that picture. Where you going? Over to Grundy's to check the horse. Now you're talking, Regan. You dig that out, and we'll be eating squab. Yeah. And if you don't, you'll be collecting your unemployment insurance. Well, the payoff's about the same. I didn't like it any better than a fan dancer likes a wind tunnel. I'd already seen enough of Grundy and his boys for one night, but when the lion gets an idea, he's like a hangman with a new rope. So I went out to test it. I found Horace Grundy's place. It was a bright new house in the San Fernando Valley. There was some fancy fence in back, and a stable looked like the paint was still wet where it said El Romano. A trailer was parked on the road with a truck from the veterinarians. When Grundy opened the front door, he looked like he'd been sitting a three-day wake, but without any beer. Hello, Regan. Well, what's the verdict? It's bad, Regan. Bad. Tendons torn. Never run. Never. Yeah, you said that. I can't believe it. Uh Uh-huh. I knew somebody else liked animals. A guy from Gower Gulch. Decided to talk? Maybe. If you keep your hands in the audience. What else did Crockett say? Now you got him on the wheel. All right, you drive. That's better. Do you know the horse is insured? Not by me, it isn't. You don't own it. You just paid a deposit. Sure, 50 G's. You got it back yet? There's plenty of time. Julio's in the hospital. Oh. Well, now, if it wasn't for the accident, you would have coughed up another 200,000. Yes. No. Oh, what difference does it make? The whole deal's a bust now. Well, that horse is a phony. Say some more, Regan. I don't know much more. Davy Crockett was a movie fan. You're doing fine. You had pictures? I wouldn't advertise them, but there's a shot of a horse winning a race. Take a look here. Give me that. All right, it's economy size. You're going to ruin your eyesight. I got a magnifying glass for my income tax. Well, let's get a light behind it. Now, what do you see? Horse. Well, you get a star. Four white feet. I can do that well myself. Listen, Regan. Horse in the stable's got three. That does it. My boss gets promoted. Come on. Come on outside. I'll show no, you. No, I'll take your word for it. Let go of me. I got my information. Max. Maxwell, where are you? I told you, don't whistle the bulldogs. You're in it now, Regan. You're on my side. I right, drop your blood pressure. There's a handkerchief on the play. Hey, wait. Wait. Hello. I look for somebody. Good morning. Pan America. See, si, see. Si, I'm Julio. Is Mr. Grundy? Uh, it's the guy with his mouth open there. How do you do? I'm so glad to meet him. Choke Pro- it. Okay? You switched horses. Mm, no, no, you'll not understand. El Romano, he kicked me. Wait for the encore. Mr. Grundy, with belief, I'm telling you. Now look, you better make it fast, Julio. This guy goes Shut off. Shut up, Regan. A man trades a stretcher for a slab. Let him talk. Mm, oh, the hospital. I did not go. Julio is honest. A debt comes first. The interest's going up. When El Romano hurts himself, I know the deal is off. I know I must see the consul, so we cash the check. What? Here we are. Ten thousand, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty. Your down payment is up. Now we are one big happy United Nations, no? Well, that's what happened. Now there were two guys with their mouths open. By the time we got him closed, the little gent from Peru had waddled off someplace, and Grundy folded his money and started to laugh. He was happy, and at least I had what I came for. Figured I could dump the whole plate of spaghetti on the lion. The lead horse in the travelogue was a different nag from the one in the stable. So I got in my car and headed for home. But I picked up a newspaper on the corner, and then the whole bucket turned upside down again. The green sheet was loaded with publicity shots of El Romano from South America. And he was exactly the same oat burner that came in on the plane, feet and all. No switch there. Well, if there was something phony in this act, it was that winner in that Fitzpatrick film. Well, for a minute I felt like a test pilot in a yo-yo factory and then the string broke. 
I took a fast run to the Lions and one more look at those movies. I had it. The case was beginning to wind. Ten minutes later, I was back on Gower Gulch. Yes? Who is this? Regan. You alone? Don't be insulting. I'll open the door. What's the matter? You're slow. What do you want? Ask me in. No. No, I... Ask me in. Regan, look out! Be careful, Regan. I have a gun. Well, Julio. Uh, yes, Julio. Uh, what are you doing here? Well, I told you. I know. Back at my place, you're aiming at her, not me. She's been to Peru. She has the films. You knew that. You wish like I know. I go to the movies like everybody else. I keep my eyes on the winner. After Hollywood Park, I should have known better. Yeah, there are lots of races. El Romano was a dud. He came in last. Sixty lengths with Davy Crockett digging in the spurs. You gave the nag a build-up, phony publicity of the sucker and insurance company. A quarter of a million I was over. Can it? You could have never closed a sail without Grundy watching a workout. That would have been a slow boat to China. You want to be a sailor, too? Oh, stop being tough, will you? You wore yourself out when you kicked up El Romano in that plane. It looked good. Yeah, not to me or Joan. Look out, Regan. You're asking for a daily double. Well, well I'm going to take it across the board. Give me that no, gun. Leave me alone. Drop it. No, you're breaking my arm. That's the idea. I'll kick you in the stomach. No. Oh. He better go back to his stretcher. Well. Yeah. My, you can be useful. Well, when I'm working. What about after hours? I'm not bad, you know. No, I never noticed. Look again. No, I'm all through with the ponies. Wanna bet? Davy Crockett told me to play my hunches. Here I am. Yeah, but you're a loser. What do you mean? You threw those holes into Davy. It was Julia. Oh, you're trying real hard, but he was on the plane. What do I do now? Well, you might bet a fond to do to Gower Gulch. That's not funny, Regan. I know it. But you ran out of film. Well, the whole thing blew up like a hoop skirt in a high wind. Julio had a real good thing until he ran into the little man with a good memory and a dame with a fast trigger finger. Her blackmail pitch was already set up, but Davy figured to queer it, so she had to knock him off. Well, the hospital boys came after Julio, and homicide dated Joan, the travel queen. The lion was pretty excited about the way things worked out. He figured that the insurance company would come across with some green stuff for exposing a fraud. They did. That was the color of the season pass they gave him to the Burton Holmes travel lectures. Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at the same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by Larry Roman and Jackson Gillis, produced by Sterling Tracy. Included in tonight's cast were Leo Clary, Clayton Post, Devon Patey, Ed Bagley, and Herb Ellis. Twenty-nine thousand nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. For the first time in history, qualified nurses have the opportunity of receiving commissions in the regular Army Reserve. These nurses will remain on inactive status, ready to serve their country in time of emergency. Four thousand of them, if they wish, may choose active duty. All nurses who receive commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. Inactive reserve status will not interfere with the nurse's civilian life, but the educational opportunities offered her by the Army Medical Department will be of a great advantage in her work. Don't wait. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Original music for this program is by Milton Charles, Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From New York City... The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1,036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> this 
week's adventure, A Case of Identity. Well, here we are, as usual, about to pay our weekly respects to our favorite rock and tour, the good Dr. Watson. What about tonight's story, Doctor? Well, tonight I have prepared a little challenge for you and our radio friends. Yes, the story I'm going to tell is one of Holmes' more mental adventures. It has its bizarre moments, of course, but still, all in all, its solution is fairly obvious. As you know, Holmes was the world's greatest master of the science of deduction. As a matter of fact, he unraveled this particular problem without moving from his armchair. Hmm. I wonder how many of our listeners have learned enough of Holmes' methods to do the same. Well, I think I can make a fair stab at it, Doctor, if the clues aren't too involved, that is. Oh, no, no. All the clues are right out in plain sight, Mr. Harris. All you have to do is listen for them and make your own deductions. Oh, but uh, before we become too involved with hidden clues, uh, hadn't we better discuss a few clues to the secret of good grooming without straining the pocketbook? Good idea, Doctor. If you need a fine new suit for business or a good-looking sport jacket for weekend wear and really want your dollars to do double duty, here's how. Insist on Clipper Craft Clothes. Famous for stretching your dollars, for giving you positively amazing value, is the fine local independent store in your community that sells Clipper Craft. Despite rising costs of materials and manufacturing, you can still buy long-wearing, beautifully tailored Clipper Craft suits for only $40 to $47.50. Luxurious tropical worsteds for only $33.75 to $40. And smart sport jackets for only $26.50. It's the Clipper Craft plan and the Clipper Craft plan alone that makes Clipper Craft clothes possible at these low prices. Concentrating the buying power of 1,036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. Providing steady year-round operation, reducing manufacturing and distribution costs. And the savings go to you. Simply compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, back to the adventure you think we should be able to solve for ourselves. Right, Mr. Harris. It was <clears throat> during the middle years of our joint occupancy of the lodgings in Baker Street... Holmes and I sat relaxed in two easy chairs on either side of the living, ro living room fire. Holmes' long legs stretched out in front of him, his head wreathed in the smoke from his favorite pipe, a, a horrible black, greasy old clay affair that he coddled as if it were a child. Well, we had just finished an excellent breakfast, and Holmes was in the philosophic mood that so often accompanies the process of digestion. Strange thing, life, eh, Watson? Infinitely stranger than anything the mind of man could invent. Yes, I know that's one of your pet theories, and I dare you to put it to the test. Now, take today's paper. If you, if you can find anything bizarre in that, I'll, I'll buy you a new smoking jacket. I don't want a new smoking jacket, Watson, but I'll take up your challenge. Choose any article, any paragraph at all on this page, and I'll guarantee to find something outlandish. Very well. Here. Take the very first heading. Husband's cruelty to his wife. Now, there's a half column of print about that, but I know what it's about almost without reading it. There's the other woman, the drink, the push, the blow. <laughs> no writer could invent anything more crude or commonplace. Your example, Watson, happens to be rather unfortunate. The husband was a teetotaler. There was no other woman, and the cruelty complained of was that he had the habit of winding up every meal by taking out his false teeth and hurling them at his wife which you'll allow is an action any literary man would hardly be able to make believable. Well, maybe so, but that's just an exception. Life is made up of exceptions, Watson. There's one now, standing on the pavement on the opposite side of the street. Well, you mean that large, hebe-like young woman with the enormous boa around her neck and the curling red feather in the hat? Yes. <laughs> well, look how she oscillates backward and forward. And the way she fidgets with her glove buttons. Oscillation on the pavement always means an affair de coeur. She would like advice, but it's not sure that the matter may not be too delicate for communication. Mm, she's de decided to take the plunge. Here she comes across the road like a swimmer leaving the bank. I say perhaps she's been seriously wronged. No, Watson. In that case, the woman no longer oscillates. She pulls out the bell wire to the front door. You hear that, Watson? Decidedly fluttery. The maiden is not so much angry as perplexed and possibly grieved. Oh, but here she comes. Come in, come in. I... I hope I'm not intruding. Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the detective. Yes. Won't you sit down? 
Uh, this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Pleased to meet you. Oh, delighted. My dear young lady, don't you find that with your short sight it's a little trying to do so much typewriting? Oh, I did it first, and that's a fact. But I've got so now I know where the letters are without look... Oh! Oh, but how did you know? Someone's told you about me. Oh, don't look so alarmed, my dear. That's just a bit of detection. Mr. Holmes can tell things like that by looking at you. It's uh, his way of showing off. Oh, I, I see, but it, it take me aback, your knowing things like that. It's my business to know things. I knew you used the typewriter from the appearance of your fingertips and the double line pressed into the plush above your wrists. It was equally obvious that you're nearsighted from the marks left on either side of the nose by your pince-nez. So you see, my dear Miss, uh, Miss, uh... uh my name's Sutherland, uh, Mary Sutherland. So you see, my dear Miss Sutherland, there's nothing terrifying in my conclusions. Well, no, not when you explain it like that. And now, perhaps you'll tell me why you came away to consult me in such a hurry that you managed to put on two odd shoes. Why, well, bless my soul, so I did. The right one's my Sunday pair. Yes, you must have been rather agitated when you left home. Yes, I did bang out of the house, and who wouldn't? It made me very angry to see the easy way Mr. Windybanks... Oh, that's my father, took it all. He wouldn't go to the police. He just sat there and said there was no harm done and everything would come right in the end. So finally I got mad and told father I was coming to you myself. Uh, you say your father, but surely you mean your stepfather, since the name's not the same. Yes, he's my stepfather. Mother makes me call him father, though it sounds kind of funny, him being only five years and two months older than I, myself. I see. How recently did your mother marry this Mr. Windybanks? Oh, about two years ago it was, Mr. Holmes. And I'll admit I wasn't very pleased, seeing as it was so soon after father's death. And, and him, a man nearly 15 years younger than herself. Enough to start complications in any home. Hey, Holmes? Right. But uh, please continue, Miss Sunderland. I gather your father left your mother fairly well off. Yes, sir, he did. You see, father was a plumber in Tottenham Court Road, and he left a tidy business behind him. After he went, Mother carried it on. Although I must say that William, oh, that is, uh, Mr. Hardy, father's foreman, did most of the work. And a good thing he made of it, too. This Mr. Hardy, was he your father's age? Oh, no, sir. He was just two years older than me. The fact is, we had a sort of an understanding till this year Mr. Windybanks came along. Oh, and he didn't approve of Mr. Hardy? Oh, it weren't that so much as that he didn't approve of the plumbing business. Said it wasn't high class. Oh. Uh, Mr. Windybanks is a very superior gentleman himself, Mr. Holmes. Travels in wines for West House and Marbank, the claret importers in 10 Church Street. Oh, a real toff he is. I see. Yes, sir. So, after him and Mother got married, he made us sell the business. They got £4,700 for the goodwill and the interest. But Mr. Hardy said it was practically giving it away. And so, him and my stepfather had an argument. And my stepfather told Will to clear out and never darken his door again. Hmm, quite theatrical. Yes, my stepfather's like that. Well, Will says he's off to Birmingham. And will I come with him? And I says, well, I can't hardly be expected to leave me own mother. So then he gets mad and biffs off. Without giving you a chance to change your mind? Well, yes. And how is he doing in Birmingham? Very nicely, I hear. Got his own shop and all. Oh, not that I write to him. I wouldn't send him a word if I was dying, I wouldn't. Of course. Serves him right for not being more persuasive. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, but that's neither here nor there, Mr. Holmes. The fact is, I, I, I don't know why I even mentioned Will Hardy. Except that I'm so unset in my mind, my tongue kind of wags on by itself. Uh, oh, let's see here. Where was I? Your mother had just sold the plumbing business for something over 4000 You inherited part of that, I presume? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I've got my own money, outside of the plumbing business, that is. Oh? It was left to me by my Uncle Ned in Auckland. It's in New Zealand stock, paying me 4%. Gives me £100 a year, it does. Then the capital amounts to around £2,500. Yes, sir. But I can't touch that. Just the income. Hmm, quite a tidy little amount. I believe a single lady can do very nicely on £60 a year. Oh, I could do on even less than that, Mr. Holmes. I'm a good one at managing things. But so long as I live at home, I don't want to be a burden to them, so I let them have the use of it while I'm staying there. You mean you give the money to Mr. Windybanks? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I draws it out every quarter and pays it over to my mother. That's very generous of you, Miss Sutherland. Oh, it's no hardship. I, I do pretty well with what I earn at typewriting. Makes me quite self-supporting, as you might say. Yes, these independent modern young women. Soon they'll be competing with men in business. Oh, no, sir. I'm sure I wouldn't presume to be as bold as that. Hmm. 
Well, to resume, we find you are a young lady very comfortably fixed. Well, I, I'm not exactly rich, Mr. Holmes, but I'd give all I have to know what's become of Mr. Hosmer Angel. Hosmer Angel, eh? Quite a romantic name. Oh, yes. And he was romantic, Mr. Holmes. Recited Browning, he did. Sounds quite devoted. Oh, yes, sir, he was. I could swear he was. And now he's gone, too. Disappeared like into thin air. And naturally, I'm, I'm anxious about him. Being as it's the second time I've been left in the lurch, as you might say. I, well, I... I feel a bit sensitive about it. Of course. Had you quarreled? Oh, no, sir. We was as affectionate as two cooing doves. Mother said it used to make her quite sick to watch us. Oh, oh not that she wasn't all for Hosmer. That she was. Helped me to keep it from father and all. Oh, then your father didn't know about this new admirer. No, sir. Th that is, not until later. And then he never really saw him. Hmm. And how did you first meet this Mr. Hosmer Angel? Uh, well, Mr. Holmes, I... I met him at the gas fitter's ball. How romantic. Oh, yes, sir, it was. The gas fitters used to send father tickets while he was alive, and afterwards they kept on sending them to me and mother. Well, Mr. Windybanks didn't wish us to go. He never did wish us to go anywhere. If I so much as wanted to go to a Sunday school treat, he would get quite mad about it. Rather unreasonable. Yes, sir. Well, it happened that the week of the ball, he had to go to France on business. So he wasn't there to make a scene when Mother and me went. <gasps> it was a lovely ball, Mr. Holmes. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. It, it was there I met Hosmer. He was a lovely dancer. You should have seen him do the polka. Swept you quite off your feet, I've no doubt. Yes, sir. Well, he called next day to see if Mother and I got home safe the night before. And after that, I went out once or twice for walks with him. And, and things was going along as smooth as you could wish. And then Father came home and Hosmer couldn't come to the house anymore. No? No, sir. Father didn't like me to have young men come to the house. Said it didn't look well for a young girl to have followers. Hmm, rather tyrant, eh? Oh, yes, sir. But pretty soon, he had to go off to France again for a couple of weeks, so I started walking out with Hosmer again. And this Hosmer made no attempts to see you in the meantime? No, sir. I wanted to, but Mother said she didn't think it was safe. Oh, he wrote to me every day, Hosmer did. Oh, here, I, I, I brought the letters. I thought they might give you a clue. Quite right. We'll look them over later. Am I to take it that you and Mr. Angel had, uh... An understanding? Yes, sir. We were engaged after the first walk we took together. <laughs> the first worker, eh, Holmes? And Watson, don't interrupt. What was Mr. Angel's business, Miss Sutherland? Uh, he was a cashier in an office in Leadenhall Street. What office? Oh, that's the worst of it, Mr. Holmes. I don't know. Where did he live, then? Oh, he slept on the premises. And you don't know his address? No, sir. Except that it was Leadenhall Street. Where did you address your letters? Uh, Leadenhall Street Post Office, to be left till called for. He said if they was to come to the office, he'd be ragged by the other clerks. <laughs> I offered to typewrite them like he did his, but he wouldn't have that. Said that when I wrote them myself, it seemed like there was something of me in them. That'll show you how fond he was of me, Mr. Holmes. He was always thinking of little things like that. Yes, quite suggestive. Can you remember any other little things about Mr. Hosmer Angel? Any little peculiarities? He was a very shy man, Mr. Holmes. He'd rather walk with me in the evening than in the daylight. Because he said he liked to hold my hand, but he didn't want to be conspicuous. Very considerate and gentlemanly. Oh, yes, sir. He was a thorough gentleman with the silkiest brown beard. Even his voice was soft-like. He told me he'd had quinsy and swollen glands when he was young, and it left him with a weak throat. How unfortunate. Yes, sir. His eyes were kind of weak, too, like mine, and he wore tinted glasses against the glare. I'd say he was about five foot five and had small hands and feet. I see. And what happened when Mr. Windybanks, your stepfather, returned to France? Well, I wrote Hosmer and he came round to the house. And he said I'd have to marry him before father came back, as he couldn't stand the separation any longer. So I asked mother and she said, why not? Every girl was entitled to her own husband. Oh, mother was all for Hosmer from the beginning, almost more than I was myself. So you got married? Well, no. Well, that is... Not quite. Oh, what happened? Well, the wedding was set for yesterday morning. Uh, we thought it best to make it a quiet ceremony. It was to be at St. Saviour's Church with a wedding breakfast afterwards at the St. Pancras Hotel. Well, about nine o'clock, Mother and me was all dressed and waiting for Hosmer. I, I was a bit upset, I guess. Uh, you know how a bride feels, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> Oh, 
dear, I'm that nervous. I, I don't know whether I ought to get married or not. Don't you fret, Mary. All brides is like that. Why, when I was married to your father, I was so jumpy, I split both me gloves. Oh, I know, but I haven't known Hosmer very long, Mother. Maybe I oughtn't to jump off the deep end like this. What's the good of waiting, Mary? Better get married now before your father gets back. Yes, I, I suppose so. Oh, dear me, I, I wish my shoes wasn't so tight. Shh, here comes Hosmer now. Don't he look handsome with that flower in his buttonhole and all? Uh, no, you stay here, Mary. I'll answer it. A bride should act shy like on a wedding day. Good morning, Osma. As the groom. Good morning, uh, mother. Oh, I'm fine. Uh, hello, Mary. <laughs> hello, Osma. What's the matter? You look kind of white. Oh, I'm I'm all right. How are you? Oh, uh, I'm all right too, Hosmer. Well, we we better be shoving off. I got a handsome waiting outside. Oh, but Hosmer, it's such a little way, and handsomes is expensive. Oh, you don't think that any bride of mine is going to walk on her wedding day? Why, who can that be? Hosmer, you're as full of jumps as a kangaroo. Now I'll go. What is it? <gasps> Telegram. Oh, thank you. It's a telegram. M maybe somebody's died. I'm almost afraid to look. But here, let me. I'm uh, used to these things. Expect me home today. Erasmus G. Windybanks. Father! Father's coming home. What if he gets here before... No, <laughs> don't lose your nerve. You're of age, remember, so it don't matter how he raves afterwards. Oh, Mary, promise you won't let him... Uh, Tear us apart. No, no. Swear it, Mary. Now, where's the Bible? Mary's carrying mine. The one I got married with both times. All right. Now, put your left hand on that Bible and swear that whatever happens, you will always be true to me and to me only. But, but what could happen? Oh, you never know. Now, swear it, Mary, for my sake. Swear it. Yes, Mary. Why not do as Osma asks? All right. I... I... I swear. Oh, good. Now then, let's get on with it. Uh, yes, Osma. Oh, dear. Is my bonnet on straight? Uh, yes, yes. Only hurry. Mr. Windybanks may get back any minute. Mary, don't forget your flowers. No, Mother. Well, hurry, hurry. Now, here's the cab. You first, uh, Mother. Now, easy. Don't upset the cab. Now, Mary. That's right. Aren't you coming too, Hosmer? Uh, no, there isn't room. I'd must your dress. Uh, I, I'll hail another cab. Oh, yes, there's a four-wheeler now. Hey, cabby! Now, you go on. I'll follow after. See you at the church, Hosmer. Uh, St. Saviour's driver. Yes, Hosmer got the other cab. It's following us. Oh, my, my knees are knocking together like anything. Now, hush up, Mary. Anyone would think you didn't want to get married. Well, maybe I do. And maybe I do. Well, just hold your breath and it'll be over in no time now. Here's the church. You get out first and mind your dress. That's it. Now, now, help me. Here, not such fast. I'm no blinking acrobat. That's it. Be off, cabby. Oh, here comes Hosmer's four-wheeler now. Yes, she saviors like yes, but... What? Why doesn't he get out? Give him time. Maybe his knees is shaky, too. Come on, sir. What ails the man? Mother! Something's wrong with Hosmer. Oh, stuff. I I'm going to see. Wake up there. I I'll speak to him, Cabby. What? The cab's empty. What? Something's happened to Hosmer. He's gone and left me waiting at the church. <laughs> Every day is value day when you insist on clothes by Clippercraft. Yes, we have to know our values are really great when we suggest you compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for very much more, which is exactly what we do suggest. Because there's a great big idea behind Clippercraft clothes in the form of the famous Clippercraft plan. You get the benefit of great savings made by concentrating the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. Yes, the Clipper Craft Plan really streamlines the fine old craft of clothes making. When you can get such remarkably fine quality in suits for only forty to forty-seven fifty, 
In tropical worsteds for only thirty-three seventy-five to forty dollars, and in sport jackets for only twenty-six fifty, why pay more? For selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suits, top coats, sport jackets, and tropicals. In Manhattan, Saks Thirty Fourth, Broadway at Thirty Fourth. John Warner Mega Men's Stores, Broadway at Eighth and Sixty Seven Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B and B Clothes Shop, One Sixty Four O Eight Jamaica Avenue. And now back to Baker Street, where we find Doctor Watson commiserating with the young lady who has been left waiting at the church. A shameful way for any gentleman to act. Deserting his bride at the altar. Oh, no, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he didn't do that. Not on purpose, that is. He was too kind for that. And then there's that pledge I gave him. Oh, you think he foresaw some unforeseen danger, and that's why he made you take the oath? Yes, sir. Have you any notion what it could have been? No, sir. How did your father take it? I presume he found out. Oh, yes, sir. He was quite consoling, really. Remarkable. Oh, it drives me half mad to think of it, Mr. Holmes. It's not as if it was the first time I'd been disappointed. I understand. I shall be delighted to glance into the matter for you, Miss Sutherland. Now, let me advise you to turn the whole matter over to me, and don't let your mind dwell on it any further. Above all, try to let Mr. Hosmer Angel vanish from your memory, as he's done from your life. Then you, you, you don't think I'll ever see him again? I'm afraid not. Oh, dear me. <laughs> You've been very kind, Mr. Holmes, I'm sure. I, I don't know how to thank you. Not at all, Miss Sutherland. Well, good day, gentlemen. Oh, where's my hanky? Oh, here it is. Oh, dear me. Another romance blighted. <laughs> Holmes, what a horrid mess of bottles and test tubes. Yeah, that smells of hydrochloric acid. Marvellous, my dear Watson, marvellous. I don't believe you've budged out of this room since that poor young lady left early this morning. No, it wasn't necessary. Then you've solved it? Certainly. It was by sulfate of paratar. No, I mean the mystery of the disappearing bridegroom. Oh, that. There never was any mystery in that affair, Watson. Pretty self-evident, don't you think? Oh, no, can't say I do. Oh, Really? But I let you look at Mr. Hosmer's love letters. But they were typewritten, even to the signature. Yes, that's what's really suggestive. Mm. Now, what's that? Mr. Windybanks, I fancy. Well, you mean the girl's father, uh, stepfather? Quite. I sent off a note to him this morning to his place of business. But I must say, Holmes... And you... this afternoon, I received this business-like reply on West House and Marbank stationery, saying he'd be here at six o'clock. Come in, come in. Ah, Mr. Windybanks? Yes, Mr. Holmes... This typewritten note was from you, on which you set the time for this appointment at six o'clock? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Uh, I'm afraid I'm a trifle late. It's about Miss Sutherland's missing suitor, eh? Quite. Uh, I'm sorry she's troubled you, Mr. Holmes. But you know what young girls are. Besides, it's a useless expense. Because how in the name of this and that can you expect to locate Hosmer Angel? Uh, pardon me if I disagree with you, Mr. Windybanks, but I have every reason to believe that I have located Mr. Hosmer Angel. Uh, uh oh. Ah, delighted, Mr. Holmes, delighted. Yes. I wonder if anyone's ever told you that a typewriter has really quite as much individuality as a man's handwriting. Ah, you don't say. Oh, but I most emphatically do. Every typewriter develops its own little idiosyncrasies. Now, this note of yours, Mr. Windybanks, you'll notice that all the E's are slightly slurred and there's a slight defect in the tail of the R. Yes, yes, I never noticed it before. Hmm, obviously. Now, I have here four letters which purport to come from the missing man. In all of them, the E's are slurred and the R's tailless. Well, uh, I didn't come here to waste time with fantastic talk like this. If you're going to catch the man, catch him. And let me know when you succeed. Certainly. Watson, be good enough to lock the door. With pleasure. Now then, Mr. Windybanks, I have caught Mr. Hosmer Angel. Because you yourself are that gentleman. But I... 
Well, 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 what if I am? I didn't marry the girl, did I? It's, uh, it's not actionable. No, your conduct is even worse than that. It's dishonorable and degrading. In the first place, you're the sort of scoundrel who marries an older woman for her money. Not satisfied, you want to assure yourself of the daughter's income, which you'll lose if she marries. You'll make her break off with her first sweetheart. And when you see it's going to be impossible to keep others from falling in love with her, you arrange to do so yourself. Well, it, it was only a joke at first. I failed to see any humor in it. Well, I, I didn't know she'd fall for me like that, did I? You made the girl swear she'd be true and wait for you. And then you played the cad and disappeared. Well, maybe so, and maybe not. But I'm not breaking any laws. And as long as you keep that door locked... Quite so. Should you care to call a policeman? There's one in the street below. I'm sure your employer, Mr. Merrill Marbanks, who, by the way, is an old friend of mine, will be very interested in your little joke. Oh, no, 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 Mr. Holmes. You, you couldn't tell him. I, I'd lose my job and my, my, my social standing. Quite so. I'll keep quiet on one condition. Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Anything at all. You are not to discourage any more of Miss Mary's suitors, past, present, or future. Oh, oh, no, Mr. Holmes, I wouldn't think of it. It was all just a little game, you see. Yes. Well, the game's over. Watson, you may show the gentleman out. Right. Now then. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Well, good day, gentlemen. I hope you won't hold any hard feelings, Mr. Holmes. And if you ever... Come along, old loitering, or I'll boot you downstairs. I'm a good man to do it anyway. Well, I'm going, I'm going. The filthy blackguard. I see, but I... I still don't see how you spotted the man. That typewritten letter, Watson, particularly the signature. Obviously, the man wanted to disguise his handwriting, which would have been familiar to the girl. Well, whose handwriting would have been familiar to her? Answer, the father's, as he was the only man she was allowed to come in contact with. No, it's really quite simple when you explain it. Well, by the way, are, are you going to tell the girl? I? <laughs> no, heaven forbid. I shall let Mr. Will Hardy of Birmingham have that privilege. I wrote him the facts of the case this morning. No, he'll be able to persuade her to believe it. I never could. Holmes, you're a moral coward. Perhaps, Watson. You remember the old Persian saying, There's danger for him who taketh the cub of the tiger, and danger also for whoso snatches a delusion from a woman. <laughs> Now then, Mr. Harris, did you guess the solution? Well, when Holmes began to talk about typewriters, I started to have an inkling, Doctor. But before that, I'll admit I was pretty much at sea. Why, Mr. Harris, I'm surprised. And after all my teaching... <laughs> well, how about giving us a hint about next week's story, Dr. Watson? Yes, Mr. Harris. Uh, next week, I think I'll tell you about a particularly complicated case of violent and untimely death that Holmes and I ran across on what started out to be an uneventful excursion up the Thames. I call it the complicated poisoning on Eel Pie Island. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Meiser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Complicated Poisoning on Eel Pie Island. This is Cy Harris speaking for Flippercraft Clothes. This is the network for the Indianapolis Speedway races on Monday, the Mutual Broadcasting System. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. (laughs) 
Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Evening, Francis. You look like you're going out. Yes, sir. Miss Asher wants me to go down to the delicatessen for some cold cuts. Oh, where is Miss Asher? In the study, sir. Well, I'll see you later, Francis. Why don't you bring back some roll mop? Roll mop, sir? Herring with the bends. Very toothy. Uh, yes, sir. Ali Ali Oxen free. Red. Hi. Hi. Well, get the silk thing there. Lounging pajamas. Yeah. I guess we're going to stay in, huh? Uh huh. I just sent Francis out for some food. I uh, met him at the door. Look, I've got to do a few things in the kitchen. Why don't you stretch out on the couch and take it easy until dinner's ready? Okay, I'm, uh, I'm pretty tired. Might rock out. No, a little sleep might do you some good. Here, read a magazine if you want to stay awake. Hmm? Oh, swell. Gory detective. Who sends you these things? The corpse of the month? Mm, pretty bad. I won't be long. Okay. Oh, no. The case of the bloody... Oh! <sighs> it was going on 11 o'clock, and the fog encircled the old house like a thin, wet blanket. Oh, swell. The figure of a man crept stealthily across the gravel of the garden path. Oh, his rider's really dreaming up. Hmm? Hmm? Miss Diamond? What? Uh, how did you get in here? I followed you from your office. Shh! You left the door unlocked when you came in. Well, now, look. I know I shouldn't have come into someone else's house, but, but this is a matter of life and death. Hey, stop pulling down the blinds. I don't want anyone to see us talking. Well, you're on the eighth floor. Who's chasing you? A herd of monkeys? Please. Please, you must listen. Now, look, if you got troubles, come to my office in the morning. Tomorrow morning may be too late. I'm supposed to die tonight. Try, try breathing. You expand your chest, take a lung full of air. No, no, I... Yeah, it does wonders, keeps you around for days. You better get out of here. Please, Mr. Diamond, don't give me away. Please. Uh, yeah, baby, uh, wait a minute. They're talking at the desk. Oh, bless you, Mr. Diamond. Yeah. I thought I heard you talking to someone. Talking? Oh, no, no. Must have been reading out loud. This is swell literature. Hmm. The case of the grizzly ghost, oh. I like to keep up on the exploits of a private detective. You don't tell me anything about your cases. Oh, I'm modest. Hey, you got your coat on. Where are you going? Oh, Francis just called. He's had a flat tire. I'm going to pick him up in the other car. Uh, don't you want me to do it? Oh, I'm not going to let you out of this house. I'll be right back. Okay. Read the grizzly ghost. It's not bad. Bye, baby. Bye. Okay, Spider-Man, you can come out now. Oh, thank you. Now, what the devil's going on? I told you my life's in danger. I need help. Tell me about it. I haven't time now. Come to this address in about an hour. My name's Leeds. Leland L. Leeds. Oh, for Pete's sake. I must get back before they miss me. I don't want them to know I got out. Say I called you and told you to come over. Here's the address on this card. Please don't fail me, Mr. Diamond. Now, wait a minute. My fee's a hundred a day in expenses. Of course, of course. I'll have a check for you. Goodbye. <laughs> He went out like an undertaker stealing a can of embalming fluid. And I poured myself something just about as strong. Helen would scalp me for leaving, but for some reason, nutty little guys like that interest me. I left Helen a note saying I'd be back later and took off to the address Leland L. Leeds had given me. It was out of town about ten miles, but after hunting around for a while and running up a good-sized taxi fare, I finally found the house. Yes? Uh, uh, yes. I, I, I got a call from a Mr. Leeds at this address. He asked me to come over. My brother? I don't know. Well, it couldn't have been. He's very sick. He's upstairs sleeping. Well, he was just coasting off to Dreamland when he called me. I, uh, I think you'd better let me in. Oh, a detective. All right. Just, uh, what did my brother tell you, Mr.? Uh, Diamond. He said his life was in danger. I'm Nina Leeds. I think you'd better come into the living room, Mr. Diamond. Dr. Miller can explain things better than I can. Sure. Roger? Mm hmm? This is Mr. Diamond. He's a detective. Oh? Lee just called him. This is Dr. Miller, Mr. Diamond. Hello, Doctor. How do you do? Are you from the police? No, no. Private stuff. Oh, I see. Oh, Mr. Diamond, I'm afraid you made a trip for nothing. Oh, here are the drinks. Uh... Oh. George, uh, this is Mr. Diamond. He's a private detective. What? Mr. Diamond, this is George Brodine. How are you? Well, fine, thank you. Anything wrong? I don't know. Lee phoned Mr. Diamond and told him he was in danger. How did you know that, Doctor? 
I told Miss Leeds what he said, but not you. I'm Mr. Leeds' doctor. He's having a nervous breakdown and suffers from an extreme persecution complex. If he called a detective, I'm sure he must have said something like that. That's quite correct, Mr. Diamond. What do you do, Mr. Brodine? Why, I'm with the New York Museum. I'm a friend of the family. I've been watching Lee break up for the past month. Mm Mm-hmm. May I talk to your brother, Miss Leeds? I don't think you can. I gave him a very strong sedative. Let me get you a drink, Mr. Diamond. When Lee wakes up, you can talk to him. Sure. We went into the bar and she got out a big bottle and two glasses. I forgot all about Leland L. Leeds for a while and started uh, concentrating on his lovely sister. It was easy. Champagne? Uh, sure, but I've run out of slippers. I've got a small foot. Might take you a long time to get enough. I drink fast. It's the open toes that bother me. I like the paddock. Where'd you come from? Same place you did, lover. Experience Alley. What do people call you after they get to know you better? Oh, different things at different times. For now, you can call me Rick. And later? Oh, you'll think of something easier. It's like that when you haven't got much time to talk. Here's to later, Rick. Uh, yeah. What does a doctor specialize in? Lodge is a brain specialist. Mental disorders, mostly. It's Lee. He's off again. Maybe he's been listening to Sam Spade. Come on. You'd better stay down here, Nina. I'll take care of it. I'm going up. Lee needs me. Uh, George, get my bag. It's in the hall. All right. You'd better not come in, Mr. Diamond. I think I'd better. <laughs> Lena. Lena. Lee, what is this? I saw the blood again. Oh, Mr. Diamond, I'm glad you came. Now, calm down, Lee. Everything's going to be all right. Get away from me. He thinks I'm insane. You all do. You want my idol and you stop at nothing. Now, there's no sense in this much self-indulgence. Uh, here's not... your bag, Roger. Thanks. What are you going to do? Just give you something to make you sleep. I don't want to sleep. I'll wake up and see the blood again. There's no blood. It's just your imagination. You're overwrought. You think I'm crazy. But I saw it. I tell you, I saw it. Now, this won't hurt. No, I... I, I don't want to sleep. Please, Mr. Diamond, help me. Please, do what Roger tells you for my sake. Come on, come on, come on. The injection should take hold. I'll get up. Just a minute. I, I, I won't go to sleep. Lee, please. Then leave Mr. Diamond with me. I want to talk to him. Well, I guess it'll be all right. Don't stay too long, Mr. Diamond. I want him to rest. Okay, doctor. Remember, he's not at all rational. Come on, Nina. I'll see you downstairs, Mr. Diamond. Hey, what's the idea, Leeds? I, I'm locking the door. I, I don't want anyone coming in. It, it, pardon me for walking around in circles. I, I've got to stay awake. Uh-huh. Those people downstairs are uh, trying to drive me crazy. They must have been working overtime. They're after my idol. Your what? My idol. That carved image standing on the night table. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Here. Here, look at it. Look at it. Well, that's dandy. How many box tops did you have to save? Mr. Diamond, at this moment, you are holding $100,000 in your hand. I am? Last month, my grandfather passed on and left his entire estate to my sister and me. Among the effects was that idol. It was left to me. What is it? Platinum? Oh, no. No, Mr. Diamond. That is the lost idol of King Tut. I always wondered what happened to it. Oh, Oh, then you know the legend. Well, uh, I'm a little, little hazy on it. Maybe you'd better bring me up to date. Oh, of course, of course. It was supposed to have been buried with King Tut. However, the story goes that a slave absconded with it before they sealed the tomb. And that makes it worth a hundred thousand? I guess so. Uh, you guess. You don't know? I only know what my grandfather told me before he passed on. He told me its value and said there was a curse on it. Uh, what does it say? Crime doesn't pay? Well, Mr. Diamond, it seems that on the first night of the new moon, after one has gained possession of the idol, he will die. Next week, Tom Swift and his electric grandmother. You don't believe me. Oh, sure. No, you don't. You're just like the rest. But it may interest you, Mr. Diamond, to know that one month after the idol was uncovered and my grandfather gained possession, he died. It was a new moon. How old was he? Seventy-four. Oh, oh, well, that couldn't be it. Now relax and tell me why you came to me. What about your fee? Oh, forget it. You can just buy me a broom to ride around on. Good night, Mr. Lee. Remember, Mr. Diamond, it's a new moon. You don't have much time. Oh, brother... Did you talk to him, Mr. Diamond? Yeah, uh, you might call it that. Now, do you understand? Your point's well taken, Doctor. What about that hunk of stone? Maybe if you gave him a teddy bear? Oh, the idol he's got is absolutely worthless. His grandfather had the same unusual ideas about it. Is there such an idol? Oh, there's a legend, but no one has ever found even the slightest clue that it's a fact. Now, I've examined Lee's idol, and it's certainly not worth more, oh, any more than the granite it's carved from. Hmm. 
Well, I'll be saying good night. I hope he gets better. Can I get you another drink, Mr. Diamond? You certainly deserve something for your trouble. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, goodbye, Doctor. Mr. Rodin. Thanks, Miss Leeds. I wish I could make this up to you. I'll uh, take a rain check. It'll be raining a lot this month. Uh, yeah. Well, good night, Miss Leeds. Good night. and got a cab. As far as I was concerned, the frightened little man in the nightshirt was going to end up modeling straitjackets, and a private detective would only add to the confusion. It was 8 o'clock, and I told the cabby to take me to 975 Park Avenue. Helen would be angry, but it was worth going back to. A couple of hours with her could make a guy as contented as a bear that had just cornered the honey market. We pulled up in front of Helen's apartment, and I paid the cabby. I was just going in when a small convertible skidded to a stop in front of the building. Mr. Diamond! Mr. Diamond! It was Leland L. Leeds again. And you could still see part of the nightshirt under his top coat. He leaned out of the car window and called. Over here, Mr. Diamond! Please! I must talk with you again. I'd had enough of the jumpy little man with the idol, so I started into the apartment without answering. He called again, climbed out of the car, and started to cross the street toward me. I looked back just in time to see the other car swing in toward me. back into the street and looked after the disappearing car. The lights were off and I couldn't get the license number. It was too far away. I leaned down with the little man in the nightshirt. He was pretty far away, too. He was dying and hurt. Mr. Diamond? Yes, Leeds? Take the idol. When you left, I... I found out why it was worth all that money. They... They didn't want me to tell you, so... So they... They followed me and... And ran me down. Ran me down. It's... It's in my coat pocket. He died lying on his back in the street. Several people were coming out of the building, so I reached into his pocket and pulled out a chamois bag. I guess the idol was inside, so I put it in my coat and went in to call the police. Oh, Mr. Diamond, Miss Ash has been worried. Hello, Francis. Tell her I'm back and let me use the phone. Certainly, sir. She's upstairs. Is something wrong, sir? You look worried. A man got hit by a car. I've got to call the police. Oh, my goodness. Is he hurt badly? Bad enough to get buried. Oh, my goodness. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Otis, let me talk to the lieutenant. Is this Diamond? No, it's the Beaver Boys. Now put the lieutenant on the phone. And what do you do with all those tired jokes? You can't keep using them. I give them away to idiots. Want to start a collection? No. Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, this is Diamond. I got a body for you. I go off duty in 20 minutes. Call back then. Lying out in front of Helen's apartment, 975 Park. Rick, my stomach is bothering me. Why can't you be a good boy and stay out of trouble? Take some soda and get over here. Take some soda? Every time you call, I end up taking enough to give an elephant the hiccups. Well, you're a fine one. Oh, I'm sorry, Rick. I didn't know you were on the phone. Uh, wait a minute, Walt. Hello, baby. I'm talking to the lieutenant. Hmm. Aren't you afraid you'll catch cold in that thing? I'm mad at you. Oh, you're cute. Hey, what's going on? Uh, just Helen. If you could see her, your ulcers would start popping like chestnuts. Uh, say hello. No, uh, the law sends you his greetings. Hello to the law. Uh, she says... I know. I heard it. Now, what about the stiff? His name's Leland L. Leeds. He got belted by a car. It was too far away to get the number. What makes you think it's a job for homicide? Get over here and Helen will give you the story. I've got some work to do. But uh, wait a minute, Rick. Oh, you're getting lazy. What's the matter? Don't you want to find out things for yourself? Rick, what happened? Francis told me some man got hit by a car. Right on your doorstep. Oh. Let's go to the other room, baby. I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> We went into the warm study and Helen poured me a tall drink. I briefed her on what had happened earlier in the evening and she sat down next to me. There's something about red hair that does things to me. It smelled fresh and clean and with her that close I could have been sitting in the middle of the Arctic and still kept my temperature above 102. Rick, do you have to go back out there? Well, somebody's got to tell his sister and in a way I feel a little responsible. Are you going to give her the idol? Hmm? The idol. 
The thing you took from poor Mr. Leeds' coat. You could at least show me what I'm playing second fiddle to. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I nearly forgot about it. Oh, here it is in a chamois bag. Oh, what an ugly little thing. And that's supposed to be worth all that money? Oh, that was what Leeds, uh... Hey, something's missing. Yeah, one of the eyes. Must have come loose when the car hit him. Probably in the bag. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Rick! Yeah. Well, it was painted over. You'd never guess it unless you pried it loose. Why, it's as big as a marble. Is it real? Well, you've got enough of them around, you tell me. It is. Rick, I think it's a pigeon blood. Why, it's worth a fortune. What are you doing? I'm scratching the other one. Well, Mr. Leeds wasn't so squirrely after all. This is ridiculous. You only read about things like this. Two pigeon blood rubies. No wonder he thought it was worth $100,000. He said he found out tonight. He must have been scratching at them. Oh, then it wasn't just a hit and run. I don't know. Baby, I don't want to get hung up with a lot of explanation to Walt. Rick, what are you doing? Taking the other eye out. There. Now, now here. Hang on to these and don't let them get out of your little hot hand. When Walt gets up here, tell him what I've told you. Well, will you be back? An hour ago, I laughed at a little guy when he told me he was going to die. He said it was a full moon and he had a curse on him. I'm still a skeptic, but I'm a new boy when it comes to voodoo. I've got to hurry over there before the whole bunch of them turn into bats. I went down in the service elevator and out on the street. The wagon was driving off with Leeds, and Walt and Otis were going into the building when I slipped up to the convertible and got in. Leeds had left the keys in the ignition like I figured, so I took off and headed across town. Twenty minutes later, on a lonely stretch of road, I started counting suspects. All three of them could be in on it. Dr. Miller, who said Leeds was insane. George Brodine, the man from the museum who said the idol was worthless. And that lovely sister. I didn't notice the car pulling up behind me until it was too late. It was doing a good 70, and as it swung around to pass me, the guy at the wheel cut in sharp and hit me broadside. Hey, look out! I went through a white fence and over an embankment. The car rolled, and somebody dropped the night on my head. I went to sleep. I don't know how long it was before I started coming around, but when I tried to shake myself back, it was like pulling my head out of a barrel of molasses. It stuck to my eyes and plugged up my ears. I tried to claw the stickiness away, but my hands were like two baseballs. I moved my shoulders and felt the stiffness in my back. It spread out to my hands and down to my feet. I opened my mouth and took in a lot of air. I finally made it. Someone was trying to get me from the highway, so I pulled myself clear of the wreck and started moving in a circle, keeping whoever it was at a good distance. I was too pushed around to put up a fight, so I made it back to the highway and walked along until I found a little gas station on the road. The joint ain't open. And then your lock's busted. No, it ain't. Then I floated through the wall. Where's your phone? It ain't for public use. Try isn't. Okay, wise guy, the joint isn't open. The phone isn't for public use, and you isn't so big you can't get tossed out on your face. And you isn't so wealthy, five bucks won't make a difference. Oh, why didn't you say so? Phone's on a wall. Thanks. You know the Leeds family? Yeah, they get gas here sometimes. Hello, Evergreen 34369 operator. How far is the house from here? I'm a little turned around. About a half a mile. Hello, Francis? Is Lieutenant Levinson still there? No? Well, just tell him to get out to 19319 Jackson Heights Boulevard. I've got a killer for him. Yeah, oh my goodness. Now hurry it up. You a cop? Shamus. What do you take for the use of your car for an hour? My wife would kill me. I'll drive you wherever you want to go. He gave me a lift in his old sedan, and ten minutes later I was ringing the doorbell to the Leeds house. I was glad the girl answered. She made me feel better right away. Oh, Mr. Diamond, come in. Oh, thank you. Where are your friends? Raj and George. Well, they went out to look for my brother. He disappeared right after you left. I'm terribly worried. Oh, uh, have you got that drink? I could use it now. Certainly. I don't know why Lee ran off like that. 
He shouldn't have been driving in his condition. Were Roger and George together when they left to look for Lee? No, they took separate cars. Why? Has something happened, Mr. Diamond? Have you heard from my brother? I guess I'd better give it to you straight. Your brother's dead, Miss Leeds. I'm sorry. Dead? Oh, no. He was hit by a car. It's all because of that horrible idol. That stupid, horrible idol. If my grandfather hadn't told Lee it was worth that much money, this never would have happened. Did you think it was worth anything? No, of course not. But we couldn't convince Lee. Now he's dead. <laughs> would you please answer that, Mr. Diamond? Sure. You take it easy. <laughs> Nina, I... Oh, what are you doing here, Diamond? Did you find Lee? Why, no, no, I didn't. I've gone to every place I thought he could possibly be. I even looked up your address when over there, but the building was closed. You better go in and see Miss Leeds, Doc. She's pretty upset. Upset? Nina, what's wrong? Oh, Raj, it's Lee. He's been killed. What? That's right. But how did it happen? Bingo. I'll tell you as soon as I let Mr. Brodine in. There, there, Nina. Just put yourself on the line. Please. Come in, Mr. Brodine. Uh, well, Mr. Diamond, what are you doing here? I think I'd better have a sign made. The doctor and Miss Leeds are in the living room. Has something happened? Mr. Leeds is dead. What? This is the most surprised household I've ever run into. Roger, is this true? I guess so. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Nina. Is there anything I can do? No. No, thank you. Where did this happen, Mr. Diamond? In front of 975 Park Avenue. Car hit him. I was with him when he died. Oh, this is terrible. I thought at first it was an accident, but I'm not sure. What do you mean? When I left to come out here, someone ran me off the road, nearly killed me. Who would want to kill Lee and then try to kill you? <laughs> probably a coincidence. Certainly, certainly. Probably just a drunk. Could have been. Lee gave me this before he died. The chamois bag. What's in it? The idol. Oh, that awful thing. What do you want done with it, Miss Leeds? I don't care. Just get it out of this house. What are you going to do? I don't know. You want the thing, Doctor? Why, what for? That's a good question. How about you, Brodine? You want it? Oh, well, what would I want a worthless piece of stone for? Well, as long as no one wants it, may I use this fire poker, Miss Leeds? What are you going to do with it? The idol is worthless. It's caused a lot of trouble for you and your family. I'm going to break it up. No! Give me that torch! Well, Brodine, you're sure getting grabby. All right, now all of you stay right where you are. Well, for a museum collector, that's a pretty modern gun. Yes, and I know how to use it. George! This is the hokiest case I've ever been on. Even the dialogue's bad. I suppose you think you're pretty clever making me show my hand like that. I read Gory Detective. I found that the idol was really worth all that money, but I had to make the killer tip himself. You did. Mr. Diamond, do you mean my brother was really right all along? In a way, yes. He believed what his grandfather had told him. But it wasn't until tonight when he scratched one of the eyes of the idol that he knew for sure. Scratched one of the eyes? That's right. Pigeon blood rubies, painted over. Well, now I'm leaving you. Well, that's good, but you're minus something. Minus what? A couple of rubies. I took them out of the idol. You're lying. Take a look at the bag. What? They're gone. I'll kill you for this. Give me the gun, George. Look out. He's going to shoot. Give me the gun. All right, everyone. This is the police. He shot Diamond, all right, Lieutenant. Put the bracelets on him, Otis. Sure. Come here, you. Not him. Put him on Diamond for disturbing the peace. Pin the medal on the other guy. No, no, no. Sure no. thing. How do you like that, wise guy? <laughs> oh, no. Rick? Oh, I'm dying. Ricky? Oh. Rick, wake up. Uh, 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 all right, all right, George, drop the gun. Rick, you've been dreaming. Uh, oh, hello. Oh, you were having a big, fat nightmare. Oh. I came down from upstairs and you were asleep on the couch with gory detectives. Oh, well, well, I started reading some story and I got mixed up with Egyptian idols and the rubies. I got shot. That's the case of the ruby eyes. That was the craziest dream. I solved the crime and got shot six times for my trouble. Oh. Oh, Lieutenant Levinson and Otis came in and arrested me for disturbing the peace. After you were shot six times? Yeah. <laughs> Otis loved it. That wasn't in the magazine. I worked out my own ending. Move in. That's pretty. What are the lyrics? Well, uh, 
An awful lot of them. <laughs> Sing them. Okay. I'm sitting high on a hilltop. Oh, I remember that. Tossing all my troubles to the moon. It's from Thanks a Million. Where the breeze seems to say, don't you worry. With Alice Pay. Things are bound to pick up pretty soon. Here neath the sky on the hilltop, seems to me the world is all in tune. I forget all the bustle and hurry, tossing all my troubles to the moon. Someone will love me And everything will be just grand Just so the stars up above me Continue doing business at the same old stand It's mighty sweet in the evening When I've had a busy afternoon Sitting high, high, high on a hilltop Tossing all my troubles to the moon Sing it again, Rick I'm sitting high on the hill Oh, Rick, the grouch Yeah, listen to that Where the breeze seems to say Don't you hey. worry <laughs> How do you like that way, guys? Oh, that's really awful Yeah, well, maybe you know how I feel When you open that big bazoo of yours You mean I sound like you do? Look, Diamond what do you think the rats keep jumping out of my window for? Well, maybe if you had some plastic surgery. <laughs> and your crummy jokes are as bad as your crummy singing. So please, save the world from a horrible fate and cut your throat or something. Oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you all about... Oh, I'm sitting high on a hilltop, tossing all my trouble. Here we go! Shut up! We want to hear Diamond. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Peter Leeds, Yvonne Patey, Stephen Dunn, and Jack Crucian. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. <laughs> now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC tomorrow? Detective story fans will want to hear Madeline Carroll and Basil Rathbone in the detective melodrama, The Amazing Dr. Clitterhouse, tomorrow on Theater Guild on the Air. And for more detecting, listen tomorrow for The Adventures of Sam Spade. He'll present his most humorous caper of the season. Yes, you'll enjoy both Theater Guild and Sam Spade tomorrow on NBC. <laughs> Next, it's Free Ride to Danger with Dorothy McGuire on NBC. Broadway's My Beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover.
The carnival scream rises high on Broadway, carried high on plumes of neon light. And its shape is of many things. The metallic anguish of a trumpet shriek, the futile beating against closed doors, the laughter, bargained for, bought, paid for, under the winking girl in the spectacular. Broadway's scream rises, shatters into fragments of glitter, prowls through the city, and finally touches you. Wherever you are, it touches you. For me, it was a phone call. A girl dying, it said, from a jackknife in a dime a dance palace on Broadway. Come to it, Danny. Maybe you can grab yourself a free dance. The welcome committee is out, the pale girls with the scarlet streaked across their mouths, and the restless scarlet-tipped hands playing in the spinning lights, reaching out for you. Someone called, said a girl was hurt. Where is she? Me, I called. Sure you don't want to dance with one of those girls first? Where is she? You're square. You're a square policeman. Come on, I'll take you to her. George is the neat type. Don't like to spoil the fun. That's why she picked the lonesome lounge to die in. You got her picked out where you're gonna die. You should. You really should. The lounge with the beaded curtains. With Georgia. Get out. Go dance. It's all right, Danny. You? You, Georgia? Me, Danny. Fran can stay. She's my good friend. Okay if she watches me die, isn't it? Who did it, Georgia? A dancer. Keen dancer. You should have been here for his mambo dancing. It was a show. Who? He stabbed you, Georgia. That makes it all right to tell me. Who was it? He bought five dollars worth of tickets. A man like that, you feel you know. Don't ask his name. It spoils it. With this knife? <laughs> yeah. While dancing. I'm keeping it for a souvenir. Make sure it's with me in the coffin, huh, Danny? Promise. You're a long way from home, Georgia. What brought you here? I like it here. Come here a lot. It's peaceful. The man blows the bugle so peaceful. A crowd, Georgia? Will the boys in the crowd stab you because you're not liked anymore? How can you talk when he's... Listen to him, Danny. Listen. A girl feels young again with music like that. A girl... After that, the place got cluttered up. People started to come into the lounge. Policemen with notebooks. A woman in a tweed suit with a press card in her hat band. A couple of men with a stretcher. The only thing the doctor picked up on his stethoscope was a trumpet blowing what is called the blues. Because there was no heartbeat from Georgia Gray. Because she was dead. Find out why. <laughs> Go now to Mott Street, where it intersects an alley whose name no one remembers. Climb four flights of stairs and wonder briefly why the quality of sound and light in a tenement is like nothing else in the world. And walk a corridor where mice and men live together in perfect tolerance. And stop at a door. Stand in the light a little bit more so I'll know who's... It's Danny Clover, Benny. Oh, you coming to check? I'm okay, I'm okay. Can I come in? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay, Danny, I'm okay. Except for the stomach. It hurts when I press it. You've been behaving yourself, Benny? Well, since I got out of the hospital, sure, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm beating now. He taught me to make things out of beads when I was resting in a ward. Belt buckles and ladies' uh, accessories. You know why I came here, don't you? I ain't a stool pigeon no more, Danny. I get cured of that, too. I'm a, I'm a beater now. Who killed Georgia Gray? I'm a beater. How long since you checked in with your parole officer, Benny? Oh, Danny. What about Georgia? You know as much as me. Georgia was close to Nicky Gallon. You know that. Bought his shirts from him. Ran down the drugstore for him. What's the word on Nicky? The crowd ain't happy with him, Danny. Oh, Danny. Leave me alone. I got an order from a lady down the hall for a love bracelet. 
I got to deliver to you or I'll be breaking my contract. Nothing else, huh? Say, so help me, Daddy. Nothing. Where's Nick again? Uh, I'm a beat him now. Well, you, huh? Off your beaten path, aren't you, Danny? Inside, Nicky. Oh, strong arm, Danny. I was going to invite you in anyway. Georgia Gray, Nicky. She's dead. Word came to me how you closed her eyes. I wish it had been me. Maybe you got there ahead of me, Nicky. Maybe you went dancing, saw Georgia in a place you never thought she'd be. Killed her because she was getting away from you. <laughs> oh, you're tired, Danny. Awful tired. No one gets away from me, not even the dead. Come on into the den. I want you to meet my mother. If she'll be hurt, I don't show her my friends. All right, Nicky. I wouldn't want her to be hurt. You'll wish yours had been like her. Just wait. Mother, look what I brought you, Danny Clover. Sit down, Danny. Have a mint. Nicky has a made-up special for me. Thanks. Well, special, huh? Nothing too good for my mother. It's always been like that with my son. Up to now. Nicky hasn't been good? He let his girl die in a cheap place. Dancing with another man for pay, for dimes. That cheapens his name. You could have stopped it, Nicky? How could I have known, Mother? I told you. Don't snap at me, Nicky boy. I'll slap your mouth. Wash it out with Doit. Georgia liked that hole, Danny. I never understood why. She tried to explain it to me about the music, about dancing. Crazy for dancing. Who understands these things in a girl? When she had everything a girl... Everything you gave her. Everything you worked hard for. You're getting your share, huh, Mother? The funeral, too, Nicky? Will you buy me one like the one you're buying for Georgia? Let me show you the invoices, Danny. I never knew dying came so high. Inflation, huh? Maybe it'll wipe out the taste of what happened to her. Where it happened to her. It's just a maybe, son. Don't build a monument on it. <laughs> Want to know why they killed her, Danny? You know, Mrs. Gannon? They think my son is finished. Done. Used up. They killed the girl to frighten my Nicky boy. And you know what? My boy's frightened. Who does that to you, Nicky? Your friends? Your boys? You'll know when you see their bodies on a slab. It'll be in all the papers. You'll save the clippings for me, huh, Nicky? Oh, is it your dream, Danny? I told you. Wonderful girl, my mother. When I got back to headquarters, there was a file on my desk. The neatly centered sticker on its front cover was typed Georgia Gray. Open it, read it, digest it. Georgia Gray, age between 25 and 29, computed from data gathered from arrests. Hometown, Salina, Kansas. Followed a soldier to New York port of embarkation in 1943, but never caught up with him. So she stayed. Counter girl in a 5 and 10. Then model for ladies' garments. Then nightclub hostess. And two years ago in night court, after losing a race with a squad car, she said she'd retired. Because I don't have to work anymore, she said. No a better reason, she asked. Name linked with Nikki Gannon from here on in. Address Park Avenue. Expenses shared by Fran Holland, who said now she'll have to look around. First thing I'm going to do is get another roommate. Did you get along well with Georgia? She had her ideas, I had mine. You know what I mean? Tell me. No, this and that. Georgia was what, a pretty girl? I'd say she was beautiful. Yeah, I guess she was very beautiful. Very. Ah, but she was ruining it. Ran around, danced, but she didn't enjoy herself. I know she didn't. She only enjoyed herself relaxing here with me. Something I haven't made up my mind about. Well, you better make up your mind about it, Danny. Sure. She had all that dough and she lived with a dance hall hostess with me. You know why? Because she needed someone like me. To run home to her. Right. So she could have soft hands rubbing the back of her neck. To bring her cold tomatoes when she needed it. She run the orphan, friend? Look, Danny, she was dance happy. That's why she hung around the place I worked. A little bit of music and a guy in a high waistband with two strong feet could make her smile like she was happy. Did Nicky Gannon mind that she stepped out on him? Why did Nicky care? He used her for a front for his business. He didn't care about her dancing. Who killed her, friend? A man. What else but a man? What man? Who? You know what you ought to do, Danny? You know Tommy Chandler? Nicky's hood? 
The padded shoulder that stands near Nicky with his hand in his pocket. Ask Tommy. See how he reacts when you ask him. You know where Tommy is? I know where he'll be in the morning. You know where the ducks are in that pond in Central Park? Eight o'clock, he throws them bread. Stale bread. But what do ducks know? That one over there likes pump a nickel, Danny. Here, give him a piece. We'll make an impression. We got none of these advantages at city jail, Tommy. You gonna arrest me, kid? No. Ducks will miss me. You want a piece of pump a nickel, too, Harm? Sure you do. You see how Harm looked at me, Danny? Sad. Like he already knows about the arrest. What are you taking me down for? We'll think of something. Feeding the pintails in Central Park? I won't be able to hold up the head for the shame, huh? Let's go, kid. That's your squad car over there? You gonna blush when I say suspicion of murder? That's been done to me, too. Hmm. You didn't come up for a long time. Georgia. You got me case for that? Georgia was murdered. Maybe Nicky Gannon goes, too. The whole crowd will miss him. I'll tell you something else. Whoever stabbed George ain't gonna be around long, ain't he? The crowd will see to that, huh? I didn't say that. I just said a prediction, that's all. Who takes over if Nicky is rubbed, Tommy? You? Take over what? A backroom poker game for matchsticks? What are you talking about? Well, baby, arrest me if you want, but don't ask me stupid questions. It makes Herm nervous. Hey, Herm. Hey, you are, boy. Herm looked sad when I took Tommy away from him. All the ducks looked sad. For a minute. Then they found a new love with a stale loaf of bread. Swam away, screaming for it. Tommy looked back over his shoulder, stopped to call them a name. Got shoved into the squad car. But on the way down, a code call, a woman's voice in the police radio. Man dead, she announced with a quiet number. Then she said it plain, in an alley, 4th Street, off 6th. Get there, car 62. We got there. Mind if I tag along, Danny? Man dead. I recognize from the number. <laughs> you gotta share these things. Hold your gun on him, Mugovan. He wiggles a toe. Break it for him. Pleasure, Danny. Let me through. Let me through. They can't scare you anymore, can they, Nicky? Not anymore. He was propped up against the wall, his head thrown back, his mouth open. Like he was trying to tell someone about it. The furtive dog scrubbing for food in the trash, not listening. The small crowd he'd assembled because the blood sighed across his shirt front, but not listening. Watching an alley wind gather soot at his feet. Watching me lean over him. Watching Nicky Gannon. Dead Nicky Gannon. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. You'll find Jack Benny in the desert this Sunday night on CBS. Jack and his gang are making a safari to entertain the boys at an airbase in Nevada. And for more laughs, there'll be another session with Eve Arden as the gay, romantic, fun-loving schoolteacher, our Miss Brooks, on most of these same CBS stations. <laughs> Broadway is wide enough for everybody. Generals in open touring cars, blondes in taxis, and sailors against lampposts. It's the place to come to, for one reason or another. To be a tourist, or get stared at by the tourists. To make a pitch, buy a bargain. Get cheated, insulted, or have your picture taken. And end the day with a memory, depending upon what you wanted, what you got, and what you gave for it. And part of the day's memento of Broadway will be the news item, Nicky Gannon shot down in an alley, 
hoodlums slain in new outbreak of mob violence, police seek clues in killing, especially me and another man, a Sergeant Gino Tartaglia, who had once passed a civil service examination. And the medical examiner, Dr. Sinsky, reveals that death was caused by hemorrhage in the pleura, parentheses, lungs, close parentheses. And that is why Nicky Gannon was done in. Thanks, Gino. Oh, you're quite welcome, I'm sure. Anything else? May I? Yes, you may. Thank you. You know, Danny, this shooting up an alley brings to man mind a case which was solved by Lady Jane Pugh, the ne'er-do-well girl detective from London Town. Do we have to, Gino? Lady Jane looked at the deceased and flipped her shiny tuppence. Flipped her what? Her shiny tuppence. Lady Jane has a lucky tuppence which she flips before she undertakes a case. Ah, uh, that Lady Jane. May I interrupt? Oh, you're the boss. Do you have anything else to tell me about Georgia Gray or Nicky Gannon, please? Oh, indeed I do, Danny, indeed I do. In the murder of Nicky Gannon... Tommy Chandler, our prime suspect, has been released. And without a nickel's worth of bail. What? I have said it. So help me if you're kidding, Gino. Why was he released? Oh, because another fellow has confessed to the deed. You remember Cozy Barrett? Even at this moment, he is with Sergeant Mugovan, confessing all over the place. And that, Danny, is all the news I have for today. Case is solved, huh, Danny? <laughs> Yes, and that ain't all of it, Sergeant. George ain't all of it. Lots of people met with me then ended up under a sheet in the ice house. You killed before, Cozy? Oh, hi, Danny. Come on in. Join the fun. This is a new kick, isn't it, Cozy, for you? Confessing to a murder? Well, what's the matter? You don't trust me? Read me to him, Sergeant. Yeah, I'll brief it for you, Danny. Cozy says he took a pocket full of dimes to the diamond dance joint where Georgia Gray was. To celebrate the end of a perfect day, he tells me. You danced with her, Cozy? Sure, I dance. How else I get close enough to kill? You didn't like the way she danced, huh? Crazy for it. Dream about it. Who else I dance away my hard earned dawn? That buys you her dying, too, huh? Oh, she gives his insults. And from a foot away, at that. But I got close. Eventually, I got close. Yeah, yeah. Get on the phone, Muggerman. and have a policewoman sent up here with a portable radio. Danny, you all right? You've been working so hard. You you got a thing against telephones, Muggerman? Yep. Okay. Okay, I'll do it. Uh, what you going to do, Danny? Yes, you got Muggerman. tricks with batteries and portable radios to make people talk? Uh -huh. I'm talking. Yeah. Why you need electricity? Should be right up, Danny. Hey, you going to put me away, huh, Danny? To the sound of music, huh? You treat me nice because I'm nice to you, huh? Killing. A little out of your line, isn't it, Cozy? I always figured you as more of the purse snatcher type, the jackroll kid, the friend a drunk finds in an alley. Well, I got a right to come up in the world, ain't I? This gives me class, a reputation, the things a fellow needs so he can admire himself in the night. Sure, I understand. Man has to get ahead. You sent for me, Lieutenant? You want this? Yes, come in, please. Turn on the radio. Go on, turn it on to dance music. That'll be all right. Dance with the lady, Cozy. Huh? Go on, dance with her. <laughs> hey, uh, you're crazy, Danny. I give myself up to you and you, you, you go crazy. <sighs> there are people like me, honest. Dance with her like you did with Georgia. Show me how it was with Georgia. <laughs> you know I can't dance, Danny. You know I wouldn't go near a dame to dance with her. They laugh in my face when they see me coming. You were never near Georgia Gray, were you? No. Not even close enough to... Then they promised me they'd get me off, Danny. They said confess, and then when I got off, they'd give me the big dough. Who promised you all that? Well, friends, Danny. I, I got good friends. They they, they, they promised me things. They, they called me up and, and, and promised me things. <laughs> you got to lock me up, Danny, so I don't disappoint them. You got to lock me up. Make it come true for him, Muggerman. Lock him up. <laughs> Now the afternoon was two hours old, and the gray had turned into a wetness, a drizzle that hung skirling in the air before it touched the pavement. But the citizens didn't mind getting wet. It was a sight to see. The funeral procession wasn't very long, not like the good old days when a gangster's death took up a mile of Broadway. Not like the good old days at all. None of the mourners walked, they all rode. And the wreaths were wrapped in cellophane, which not only protected the snapdragons from the rain, but it was more sanitary. I went along because I'd known Nicky Gannon for a long time. The rain let up a little when they lowered him into his grave. And none of the mourners stayed, not even his mother. And I wanted to talk to his mother. 
Mrs. Gannon? Hello, Danny. You want to ride back to town? I wanted to tell you how sorry I... You talk like that, you don't ride with me. Come on. My son was a hoodlum. Why should you be sorry for him? We've talked together. We've had a beer together. That's the reason. You cry. Not me. Whatever you want. He was your son. My son got scared. Men get scared, a man don't live anymore. And that's all his dying does to you, Mrs. Gannon? Look what I've got, Danny. A thug's funeral on a rainy day. He was your son. He's dead, Danny. I'm not. I'll think about him. Some things will come up in my mind from time to time that I've forgotten about right now. And I'll smile. And I'll think nice about Nicky then. Do you know who killed him? I know. Who? I said I know. The same person who killed Georgia? If I let you out of the car now, you'll get wet. You're going to do anything about the person who killed Nicky? I'm sure of it, Danny. Sure of what? It's going to rain all day. Funny, ain't it? The paper said it was. In a hurry, Danny Clover? Yeah, I am. Bother you, mister? Mm-hmm. But it bothers me more, your unhappiness. Let's have a good cry over it in my office, huh? Here in the hallway suits me. Used to draft your hallways, spend my life in them, waiting to do things for unhappy people. Spreader of good cheer. That's your business at police headquarters, Mr... What name do you spread it under? Forbes, Counselor at Law, my card. Forbes, Counselor at Law. Someone came to you, said I was unhappy. You took the case. Almost precisely how it happened. I told you what makes me sad. Kindly people, they grieve when a policeman throws away a confessed killer. Cozy Barrett? It seems to them almost ungrateful. However, they respect your analytical prowess. You got something I can hang on my wall that says that? Something much better. Silver cup, maybe, with an inscription. Better? An envelope, manila with money. It could take you hours to count. No silver cup, huh? Better? A bonus, the killer. The real true killer of George and Nicky. That could bring so much happiness to a man like you. Where do I find it? Mm, where else? Envelope and killer, the Diamond Dance Palace, where Georgia danced upstairs, one o'clock. That's this morning. Be there in a smile, a grow on your face. You've brought me true happiness, Counselor. Thank you. Then he walked away. At the end of the hall, he stopped and looked back over his shoulder, grinned at me. Then he turned up his collar and walked out into the street. This was at 7 p.m. Then a walk down Broadway and dinner and a double feature on 42nd Street. Then it was time to go. The Diamond Dance Hall was blaring against its time of closing. I walked through it, pushed my way across the floor into a doorway. No one stopped me. Then up a flight of stairs and into a loft littered with old telephone books, cigarette butts, and a neatly stacked bundle of your old newspapers. The only light... The light from the spectaculars down the street, spelling out the evening's pleasure. Forty girls, forty, no cover charge. Up front with Willie and Joe, continuous performance. Chinese food, fried rice and dancing. And I waited. I didn't wait long. You here, Danny? Come on in, Tommy. Thanks. I brought you some. Here. It's all yours, Danny. Who is he? The killer that got promised to you. Dead? Uh huh. You bring the envelope, Tommy? <laughs> you bring it? <laughs> sure. Sure, I brought it. Here. Count it at your leisure. 15,000, kid. I don't know, Tommy. A dead killer. How am I going to explain a dead killer? I thought of that, too. What did you come up with? Danny, I found a guy in Skid Row. He wasn't doing anybody any good. So I figured he could do us some good. So you shot him? With a police positive, just like you carry. Here's the gun. You track this killer down, he tried to escape, you shot him, makes you a hero. That's right. And how many heroes have (laughs) $15,000? We're going to get along fine. You've taken over for Gannon? I deserve, don't I? Yeah, yeah, you do. Killing George and Nick again, sure you deserve it. The courage. You don't know how much. Had me sweating there for a while that she didn't die right away. 
Only Georgia was a girl with character. Live and let live. Die and let live. Great girl. Well, I call you from time to time, Danny. Wait a minute, Tommy. Get used to it, Danny. I said I'd call you. Don't go away. You're under arrest for murder. You practicing being a cop? Don't be a cop around me. You forgot something, Tommy. I can't be anything else. Let's go. Because you're pointing the police positive. You got trouble, sucker? It's that way all over. <laughs> I... Don't let me fall! I got your coat! Don't! Don't let me fall! I, I don't want to die that way! Hold me! Yeah! Daddy! Daddy, hold! Hold me! His fingers clawed against the sheer stone. Daddy! Body twisting. Face tortured. Daddy! Pleading for a return to life. Daddy! His body hung there, below, Daddy. out of reach. Daddy! Then the fabric that held his life together gave way. Daddy! And the noise of the street came up to meet him. Killed a scream. And I got outside and walked through the gathering crowd. I remembered something in my hand. Tommy Chandler's torn coat. It's the gathering place of all the sleepless nights, this Broadway, and all the unwept tears. The place to come to, erase what's happened, start all over, make a memory, and try to forget it, if you can. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's cast, Anthony Barrett was heard as Tommy Chandler, Francis Cheney as Fran Holland, Martha Wentworth as Mrs. Gannon, Larry Dobkin as Nicky Gannon, Joy Terry as Georgia Gray, Leo Cleary as Benny Fane, and Junius Matthews as Cozy. Every Saturday night on CBS, Jan Murray gets on that coast-to-coast -coast phone and gives away $1,000 at a crack if you can identify the phantom voice. Be listening for Sing It Again, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walters speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan investigator, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Man with the Key. A block above Wilton on Hollywood Boulevard, there's a street they call Taft. It isn't very long. About 48 palm trees and a couple of bad sewers. It figures that the guy who laid it was nearsighted. He didn't see the hill three blocks away. Got kind of a tired look, like an old lady who's been moving furniture. There's a dirty gray apartment house on the right-hand side of the street. That's my place. 308. A low ceiling and a leaky faucet. 
a telephone that rings at the wrong time. It was last Monday night, about 11 o'clock. I was in bed listening to the party next door when it rang. It was the lion. Regan, get your clothes on. That the way you sleep? You're going to be busy. We got a new client. Now, tell me all about it in the morning. Special messenger came to my place 15 minutes ago with a C note. Any good? It was from somebody named Dora King. Well, who's that? That's what you're going to find out. I can see better in the daytime. She's waiting for you right now. Oh, yeah. At a place on La Brea called the Southerner. Should I take my banjo? Don't be funny. She wants to talk to you, so get over there. Well, what does she want to talk about? How would I know? Well, don't you ever check into things? That's what I pay you for. All right, where's last week's salary? You'll get it. When? As soon as I find out if your expenses were legit. Now get busy. That all? No, call me right after you've seen her. Why? I want to know what's what. You mean you want to know if she can afford more than a C-note? You're getting out of line. That's what they told Gypsy Rose Lee. <laughs> Well, I got over there about 11.30. Turned out to be a small place, long on the shadows and short on the whiskey. There was a bald-headed guy playing a piano in one corner. I guess he'd been inside for a long time, because he'd never been out for a music lesson. The bartender was the only other guy in the joint. His name couldn't have been Dora King. So I went to work on a straight shot and waited. Two drinks later, a girl in a black dress walked in. She took in the piano player and the bartender and me. I won. She started toward me with a slow, easy kind of a walk, like a panther looking for breakfast. When she oozed onto the stool beside me, the bartender got damp all over. The air conditioning wasn't doing him any good. What'll it be, miss? Make it the same as his. Okay, put it in water. Got a match? Yeah. Got a cigarette? Mm-hmm. Got a name? Maybe. I'll bet it's Regan. All right, you got that much. My name's Dora King. I'm sorry I'm late. You ever on time when you meet a guy? No. Your money, you can spend it any way you want. You always this nice to customers. I don't get paid to be nice. What do you get paid for? You got a story? Mm, I haven't had my drink yet. Hey, you. Coming up, coming up. I'm Jet Propelled. Here you are, miss. Hey, hot night, ain't it? You waiting for the weather to change? Yeah, it ain't gonna change in here, brother. What's your first name? Jeff. Hmm, I don't like it. Neither do I. I'm gonna call you Regan. All right, let's start calling. Have you got a license? Covers up a hole in my wall. Oh, have you got something that says you're what you say you are? All right, here. Hmm, the lion's eye. Six feet, 170. Brown eyes. Mm. You fit? Yeah, I got a mole on my left shoulder. <laughs> Let me see you. You pass. Okay, you won the toss. Let's kick off. Well, this isn't where we play. We'll go in my car. Where? You'll find out when you get there. Maybe I won't like the field. You trust me, don't you? No. Good. Uh, fill her up again. We're just leaving. Floor show starts in a couple of minutes. That uh, piano player going to be in it? Yeah, he's my brother. He's going to play something he wrote himself. Any good? Stinks. Maybe you better go. Well, the bartender was pouring himself four fingers of rye and about a fingernail of water when we walked out of there. We climbed into a big Nash convertible, parked in front of the place, and headed for Santa Monica Boulevard. Then we turned east, past Western, down to Vermont, and south to Marathon. All at once, we were climbing a hill on a dark street that gave us a view of the city. Twenty years ago, a real estate broker might have had something, but now it was just an old neighborhood with a sad look, like a toe dancer with a short leg. Nobody said anything. And I was beginning to have a feeling that maybe she'd forgot her compass when she slowed the car down. She pointed to a two-story house in the middle of the block, and I nodded. Then she shoved the car in second, and spun around the corner and came to a stop. I got out and walked around to let her out. She didn't move. End of the line. Short fare. Time for you to go to work. What kind of work? The white place back there, 3936. You saw it? It came through. It's a boarding house. I already got a room. On the second floor, number 10. Knock twice. Prohibition's dead, lady. There's a man there. His name's Bender. Ben Bender. 
It'll wake him up. He's expecting you. You're quitting? My job's finished. You're the new help. Well, what do I do? He'll tell you. That all? One thing more. Come here. Yeah. Mm. Part of my fee? That's extra. I don't generally get tipped. Just for luck. You act like I'm going to need lots of it. You are. When do I see you again? You don't. Goodbye, gorgeous. <sighs> I stood there and watched her drive away, and then I noticed it. Somebody in a black coupe coasted around the corner, kicked into high gear at the bottom of the hill. I kept watching, but whoever it was hadn't read the traffic laws lately. He didn't use his lights for two blocks. Oh, it registered. He was on a tail job, and Dora was nice to tail. Thirty-nine, thirty-six marathon. Inside, it smelled like stale beer and rotting wood. Room number ten was at the top of the stairs. The door was already open. A thin guy with a hungry look was sitting on the edge of the bed. He was all bones. He didn't get up when I came in. He just kind of looked at me, and his eyes were full of water. All of a sudden, he pulled a bandana out of his pocket and began coughing. <laughs> You're sitting in a draft. All my life. <clears throat> you ringing? A girl with warm lips said I'd find you here. Thanks for coming. Sit down. <laughs> hey, just got back from a trip. Up north? Yeah. Sanitarium? State said I needed a cure. Did it take? What do you think? You're still coughing. The doctor said I could go. You can give me a going away present. Ten bucks and a suit of clothes. <laughs> it's a bum rap. That's what they all say. Who oh, I am? Ben Bender. Big Ben Bender. Huh? Does that mean anything to you, Pilgrim? Must have been before my time. Yeah. How old do you think I am? I'm out of practice. I look 60. And I'm 45. That's what seven years in the sanitarium will do. <laughs> <laughs> You ought to get a specialist. Already got one. What's his name? You. No, I'm only an intern. You'll do. All right, what do you want? When the guy goes up there, he makes a lot of friends. And a lot of enemies. Sometimes you can't tell one from the other. Does it make any difference? Big Ben don't trust nobody. No, what about that girl? Dora? Forget her. Her job's done. That's what she said. See this key? Yeah. I wear it around my neck. I wear it for seven years. You'll wear it for the next seven hours. Why? Them friends and enemies I was telling you about. What does the key fit? My safety deposit box at the American Security Bank. You meet me there. Tomorrow, the 10th. What if I oversleep? Stay up all night. I'll pay for the no dose. Just be there. After that? Then your job's finished. <laughs> it's off the off this door you ever made. Look, now you kept this key seven years. Why can't you keep it for seven more hours? My business. What's in the box? My business. Okay. Any of those friends or enemies drive a black coupe, white sidewalls? I don't know. Why? My business. I left him sitting there. He looked as happy as a sword swallower with the hiccups. Well, I put the key in my coat pocket, but it felt hot, like a dynamite stick with a short fuse. If Big Ben had been holding it for so long, somebody else might want it. Maybe somebody who drove that black coupe. Well, I went out the back entrance, walked down an alley, and doubled over five blocks to Vermont. I stopped a cab, and I had him take me over to the Lions place. It was 2.30 in the morning when he opened the front door. He was wrapped in a bathrobe big enough to keep all the silkworms working overtime. What do you want, Rick? Information. You have been drinking? I've been working. What kind of work? Well, I got a key. That all? That's what they say. Who's they? A con named Bender. 
Ben Bender. That's right. I thought he was doing a long run up in Quentin. Well, he's out now. Where does Dora King fit? Taxi service. She took me to Bender. He gave me the keys. Let me see it. All right, here. Safety deposit box. That's right. Nurse made to a hunk of metal until tomorrow at 10. But then? Well, I meet him at the American Security Bank and turn it over to him. Well, do it. Now, look, big shot. This key's hot. What makes it hot? Whatever's in that box. What's that? How should I know? Find out. You got the key? You got the client. Now, just a minute. Somebody waves a green back at you and you think it's a rainbow. That's enough. Oh, stop it, will you? It's another bum client and you know it. Let me worry about that. If Ben held that key for seven years and won't hold it now, he's scared. What's he going to be scared of? Somebody else who wants in on the so play. So what? I'm holding the key. That makes me the clay pigeon. You're getting paid for it? Just be there tomorrow at 10. Alive. <laughs> I left the lion and went out to the street. Nobody was there. I hailed a cab and he let me off in front of my place. Nobody was there. I opened the front door of my apartment. Nobody was there. It began to feel like a good bet for the Lonely Hearts Club. It was a good feeling. I sat up all that night waiting. Nothing happened. I felt about as popular as a bald-headed chorus girl. Nobody made a play. It was five minutes to ten when I pulled into the parking lot next to the American Security Bank. The car next to me was a black coupe with white sidewalls. It could have been the same one that tailed us the night before. But then I figured there's a lot of cars in L.A. like that. But I leaned in and I looked at the registration. This one belonged to a guy named Al Spandy, who lived in Van Nuys. I wrote the address down and walked into the bank. The guard in a blue uniform waved me downstairs to the safety deposit boxes was ten, and still nothing happened. I began to feel kind of relieved, like a flagpole sitter when the wind died down. Big Ben hadn't showed yet. The only one there was a blonde sitting in a glass cage in front of the vault. She looked at me, and I began to wonder what she did on her days off. Good morning. May I help you? Yeah, I want to see if the rent on my box has been paid. Here's the key. Mm -hmm. 60B. Just a minute. I'll take a look. 60B. 60 60B's 60 all paid for. Well, I guess my partner must have taken care of it. This isn't a joint box. You're the only one who can get into it, Mr. Bender. Would you like to go in now? No, I'm waiting for somebody. We're all waiting for somebody. I'm waiting for a man. So am I. Been waiting long? Years. Here? Yes. Better places to wait. The ones with money keep coming here. My name's Claire. I'll remember that. Will you remember this? Granite 3408. I'll try it on my phone. When? As soon as I get a spare nickel. I'll give you one. Well, you'll run out of them that way. Uh-uh. That's why I work in a bank. Kind of hard on the depositors. Your, uh, friend's late, isn't he? I can wait. Maybe he forgot. You should have tied a string around his finger. No, lady. He already had one around his neck. <laughs> Well, she went back to copping nickels, and I sat down in one of the plush chairs and waited. 10.30 came, 11 came, Benda didn't. I began to get an uneasy feeling, like a bubble dancer with a slow leak. At 11.10, I couldn't take any more waiting, so I left to head for Benda's place. Outside the bank, a thin guy with a sharp head was hawking papers. I slipped him the nickel that the blonde had given me, and he handed me a daily news. I wanted to see what a horse named Larry R. had done at Belmont. I didn't get beyond the first page. Bender's picture was there, right next to Governor Dewey's, only Ben wasn't running for office. They found him in his room full of bullet holes. I guess he finally got a cure for that cough. I took my car out of the lot and headed for home. I mixed myself a tall one, and I was just getting to the bottom of it when a couple of guys kicked my door open. Regan? Yeah. I'm Lieutenant Anderson, homicide. This is Sergeant Pinelli. Hi. Don't you guys believe in knocking? My knuckles are sore. Mmm, nice stuff. Well, help yourself. It's out in the kitchen. Don't drink on a job. Pinelli? Me neither. You boys should have told me you were coming. I'd have called some girls. Not done a job. Pinelli? I got a wife. All right, Regan, find your hat. What for? Well, you want to look nice. We're going downtown. You and me and Pete. Right, Pete? Right, Andy. No, it's too hot there. We thought of that. We'll give you a nice, cool place, won't we, Pete? 
Joe will, Andy. You got a warrant? Uh, no, we just figured you might want to tell us why you did it. Did what? Tell him, Pete. Knock off Ben Bender and burn his feet. You're out of your mind. Now, Regan, we know you saw Bender last night. We know you got out of a car on the corner and walked up to his place. We know you were the last one to see him while he was still alive. You got a witness? Pretty one. A girl told it. Oh, you're trying real hard, Anderson, but you haven't got anything. If you were the last one to see him alive, you're the first one to see him dead. That's how we figured. Did you figure on a guy named Al Spandy who drives a black coupe? I never heard of him. And how about a dozen other hoods who knew Bender? Now you're trying hard, Regan. You haven't even got a foundation. We got the whole building. It'll never stand up. We'll see. All right, you tell me why I did it. You private eyes get folders on bank jobs. I get them from Charles Atlas, too. Bender was in on an $80,000 heist eight years ago. He went up for carrying a concealed weapon, but the money was never found. You know that the Imperial Bonding Company's offering $5,000 for the recovery of that doll. A lion. Uh, don't make any dates tonight. You're not going to be available. All right. The lion will tell you I was working on a case when I saw Bender. Oh, we already talked to the lion. Well, what did he say? He says he hasn't seen you for five days. You are listening to the story of the man with the key. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. Commissions are still available in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve. If you were a graduate registered nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, you may be eligible for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps section of the regular officer's reserve. These commissions are still available, and those who meet the high standards and qualify may elect active or inactive status. Those who request inactive status will continue with their civilian nursing duties but stand ready to serve in time of emergency. Nurses who elect active duty become commissioned officers in the regular Army. If you believe you qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now back to the story of the man with the key and Jeff Regan, investigator. Well, I had about as much chance as a violin player with no chin. Anderson and Pinelli took me down and locked me in one of the rooms upstairs. They didn't ask any questions. I guess they figured they had enough answers. Oh, it was a real nice fix. A dame named Dora King takes me to a con named Ben Bender. He slips me a hot key and says, meet him in a bank at 10. I'm there on time, getting the phone number of a blonde named Claire, only Ben doesn't show. Somebody burns his feet and fogs him before he can keep the date. And then there's that black coupe registered to a question mark named Al Spandy. And then the lion deals one from the bottom. Oh, it was a screwy picture, and I was right in the middle of the frame. Well, I spent the next four hours taking in some free entertainment from the drunk in the next cell. Oh, oh what a beautiful day. I got Okay, Regan, on your feet. Bastille Day? You sprung. Well, I was getting tired of the floor show anyway. Try and make it Saturday sometimes. That's our big night. Part if I bring a date? Yeah, I got a phone. I got a phone. Oh, oh, my wife. That guy ought to be at Ciro's. Where do you think we picked him up? Regan, I'm running out of patience with you. How many times have I told you to keep out of trouble? Why didn't you tell him I was working on a case? I went to a lot of trouble to get you out. And you went to a lot of trouble to get me in. <laughs> that was easy. Still got that key to Bender's safety deposit box? I got it. Tomorrow morning at 10, you're at that bank getting into the box. You're crazy. It's in Bender's name. I'll teach you how to spell it. I won't do it. Homicide might like to know you got that key. Now, you listen to me and we'll both make dough. Where I'd be, I couldn't spend it. If the 80,000 bucks from the bank job Bender pulled happens to be in that box, like I think it is, the Imperial Bonding owes us five grand reward. I don't like it. You owe it to the company. Now, listen, you. Bender was knocked off for this key. Whoever wants it might make another try. Nobody knows you got it. Well, I'll give it to you and nobody will know you got it. Regan, I'm giving you a chance to straighten yourself out. That's right. What do you mean? I feel stiff already. <laughs> Well, it was a triple play. Homicide to the lion to the black coop. I went home to wash off some of the jailhouse lice all. When I walked in the front door, I had company. 
A gray flannel suit with a yellow tie was sitting on the edge of my bed. Both hands were full. The whiskey was mine. The gun was his. When he saw me, he set down the bottle and walked over and put the gun right against my neck. It felt cold, and I got kind of nervous, like a hula dancer in a forest fire. Hiya, Regan. Been waiting for you. You like my liquor? I'm a rye drinker myself. Well, bring your own next time. That ain't being sociable. You weren't invited. Huh. How could I have been? You don't even know me. You're Al Spandy. You drive a black coupe. what I have for breakfast? Egg, and it's all over your tie. You look hot, Regan. You have to hold that gun there. Right there. Same one you used on Bender? The same. All right, now give me, Regan. I told you, I don't have any ride. <coughs> Where's the key? I don't use one. My door's always open. <coughs> I'm talking about that key you got from Bender. I don't have it. <coughs> You hear any music? Yeah, but I'll sit the next one out. No, you won't. This is a men's cheat. I'll step on your toes. I don't mind. It's a polka, and I want to do it with you. Oh, it was a long dance, but Spandy didn't get tired. I knew I wasn't going to last the evening out. And then I saw Dora King standing in the doorway with Spandy. She was taking everything in like a Hoover vacuum cleaner on a dirty rug. She had a 25 in her hand and she knew how to use it. Thanks for cutting in, lady. I, I had to do it. He, he was killing you. Yeah, I'll take the gun, huh? You know I had to do it. Yeah. Here. Go oh, on, drink I, it. Oh, yes. Now you want to tell me all about it? Yes. I wanted to tell you at first, but Ben wouldn't let me. He's not around to stop you. Do you think Spandy hurt him much before he killed him? I wasn't there. He was sick. He couldn't have taken much. Why'd you tip the cops on me? I thought you might have done it. Now I know different. Tell that to homicide. I will. You better. Spandy can't. He's dead? That's right. You still don't trust me. No, I don't. I couldn't help myself once the gun went off. Big Ben was my father. Yeah? He didn't want anyone to know. All he wanted was to give me a break. Why'd he hire me? He was afraid. Yeah, that's what he said. Regan? Yeah? May I have the key? I haven't got it. You can get it. Maybe. You know what's in that box? I think so. Or why don't I turn it over to the police? That's my job. Like I told you. I'm Big Ben's daughter. Yeah, lady. You convinced Spandy. Well, I called Homicide, and Anderson and Pinelli handled it. We all wound up downtown. It didn't take them long to find out that the gun Spandy used on me was the same one that killed Big Ben. Dora gave Anderson her story. He said it would take some fixing, but he could keep her out of the papers. It was justifiable homicide. She wouldn't even be indicted, but they had to hold her overnight. Well, it was almost daylight when I pulled to a stop in front of my apartment. I was beginning to feel a little better, but it didn't last long. When I walked into my place, it looked like the L.A. Dons had been having a scrimmage. Every corner had been gone over. Oh, it didn't make sense. Bender was dead, Spandy was dead, Dora King was downtown, but somebody still wanted that key. Well, I crawled into what was left of my bed and set the alarm for 9.30. I didn't sleep much. I kept seeing keys and faces and $80,000 bills. Ten o'clock the next morning, Granite 3408 was still sitting behind the same desk near the same safety deposit vault. She gave me the same look. I waited for you to call last night. I spent the nickel. On a doctor? I ain't like to get into my box. All right, Mr. Bender, sign here. All right. Looks like part of the new freeway. One thing about a vault, it's quiet. So is a tomb. We're alone. Yeah. We're all? All right, sunshine, open your eyes. My box number is 60B. That can wait, I can't. Easy, baby, you'll set off the alarm. You and I can make a great team, Bender. But you know my name's not Bender. What is it? Regan. You and I can make a great team, Regan. Is that what you told Al Spandy? Why bring up a dead issue? 
What's your deal? You got Bender's key, I got the bank's key. You need both of them to open up the box. It's good so far. Go on. Oh, there's $80,000 there. Let's not let it go to waste. Big Ben waited seven years to open that box. Look what happened to him. I waited just as long as Ben. And seven years is harder on a girl. How'd you work it? Ben and I had a great plan. I was the cashier Ben heisted. Only I just gave him a bag full of paper. The real dough's in his box. Oh, that's the safest way. Keep your money in a bank. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When it cooled off, both of you go in and pick up the dough together. That's the way it was supposed to work, only Ben was dumb enough to get himself picked up and tucked away for seven years. Oh, you made real good partners. Nobody trusted anybody. I trust you. That why you went through my place looking for the key last night? Some girl's got to use her head. Besides, you might have been home. Ben and Spandy are dead. And we don't have to worry about either of them. The money's still here. Oh, we got the keys that'll open the box. Can you add that? Yeah. What's the answer? About 20 years. What do you mean? That bonding company will see that you get the full load for grand larceny. You wouldn't turn me in. Don't make book on that. You and I'd make a great team, Regan. We can't lose. That's what USC thought. <laughs> Well, I called Anderson and Pinelli, and they came out and picked her up. I rode down as far as the office with him. That wrapped it up. When I told the lion what had happened, he was as happy as a college boy in a harem. He got on the phone right away and called up Imperial Bonding, told him to make out that reward check for 5Gs to Anthony J. Lyon. But he was real good about it. He took me for a ride in his new Nash convertible. Well... I guess he deserved it. He was really the patsy that had done all the heavy work ever since he bailed me out of jail. Because that's when I slipped Bender's key in his pocket. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. Jeff Regan, Investigator, written by E. Jack Newman and Larry Roman, produced by Sterling Tracy, is heard each week at this time over CBS. Tonight's cast included Ken Christie, Yvonne Patey, Marvin Miller, Paul Fries, and June Martell. If you are a graduate registered nurse, please listen carefully to this important message. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. All nurses who receive reserve commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. Inactive reserve status will not interfere with the nurse's civilian life, but the educational opportunities offered her by the Army Medical Department will be of great advantage. For further information, drop a card to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Original music for this program is by Dick Arant, Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Mike Shane isn't burning the midnight oil over some unsolved crime. He's generally doing the next most interesting thing, talking about one. Right now, he's leaning back in his easy chair, doing a powerful lot of talking to his old friend, Inspector Faraday. It's a stag session for Mike's assistant, Phyllis Knight, has gone home early this evening. Of course, Faraday, I don't know much about the case except what I've read in the papers, but it seems to me that you're going after the wrong guy. Mike, this Joe has got a prison record as long as a kangaroo's tail. Why should he sidestep a little thing like murder? Just because he has got a prison record as long as a kangaroo's tail. Look, I remember a case back in New York that's almost a carbon copy of this. I've got some newspaper clippings on it in the files here. I'll read them to you in just a second. You don't get the point, Mike. This killing is gruesome, horrible. It would take a hardened criminal to carry it through. Doggone it, they're here in the files somewhere. 
Now, Phil could turn right to it. Yeah, she went home kind of early this evening, didn't she? Yeah. She's got a girlfriend staying up at the apartment with her. <laughs> went home to help her pack up. Friend from out of town? Uh-huh. Girl had a fight with her fiancé and wants to play hermit for a few days. I know. The old feminine trick. Goodbye forever. Till next Saturday night. Right. I'll get it, Mike. Hello? Mike. Thank heavens you're still there. This is Faraday, Phyllis. Mike's ransacking his files. I'll get him for you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You better hear this too, Inspector. Maybe it's your business. What's wrong, girl? You sound scared blue. I am. I know something's happened. I don't dare look. All right, but what is it, Phil? Wait wait a minute. Let me talk to her. Here. She sounds like she's going to cry. Hello, Angel. Oh, Mike. Mike, get over here quick. Now, wait a minute. Calm down, honey. Now, tell me what's wrong. Well... You, you know, Lois was leaving my apartment tonight, and I came home to help her pack. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, Mike, she's not here. At hmm? least I don't think so. Now, please, Angel, wait a minute. I can't tell what you're talking about. Well, I found her trunk already packed and locked. And, yeah? And I think... Yep. I, yep. What? What, honey? What? I think her body's inside. <laughs> last. I thought you'd never get here. Honey, we came as fast as we could. Yeah. Where's the trunk? In the bedroom. Hmm. All right, now tell me what happened. Well, I found the hall door off the lock, so I expected she'd be right back. I kept waiting, and then I started to worry. She had that row with Nelson. He threatened her. <laughs> you see what I mean, Faraday? A woman's intuition. <laughs> well, the, the baggage man came. He started to take the trunk, but then... Then I heard it. Heard what? Something slumped inside. And the trunk seemed so heavy, I... I told the man to leave it. We weren't going to send it after all. Oh, great. I looked at it real close, and and when I saw the padlock... I, oh, that's when I phoned you, Mike. Mm-hmm. Well, I see it. A smear of blood on the lock. But that's not unusual, honey. Maybe she cut her hand when she closed the trunk. Oh, for heaven's sakes, I'm no child. Look here in this closet. There. There are all Lois's dresses, still on the hangers. They weren't packed in the trunk. It just means that she hasn't finished packing. I thought of that, too, Mike. I started to push the trunk back against the wall, but it wouldn't budge. There's something inside of it, and it isn't clothing. Well, let's see. Hmm. I'll say. It's loaded with something. There. There, you hear that? Something slumped inside. Just as you tip the trunk, Faraday. Okay, I guess the only way we can satisfy you is to open it, if we can find the key. Oh, here, I've got it. It's, it's here in her purse. That's another thing that scared me, Mike. Lois's handbag. Just laying here on the dressing table. Let's have it, Phil. Honey, wasn't that the hall door? Of course, there's your girl now. Oh, well, it's about time that she... No. No, it's Nelson. Hmm? Let's see. Yeah. You looking for somebody, partner? Oh, uh, I, I didn't think there was anybody you here. You always walk right in when there's nobody home? Well, I meant, uh, I, I thought Lois was here alone. Uh, I'll come back again. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, we'd like you to stay. She uh, she may be in any minute. Well, I, I really... Uh, come in a minute. Come on in. We'd like to talk to you ourselves. Come on, come on, come on. I, I, I don't understand. You're friends of Lois? Yes. This is Mike Shane and Inspector Faraday. I don't understand. You don't have to. Okay, Phil, let's have that key. Here. Thanks. Hey, here, what are you doing? That's Lois's trunk. You haven't any right to Maybe it. not, uh, but we like to open surprise packages. Oh, oh, I hope I'm wrong. I hope it's a mistake. All right, Mike. Oh, let's swing her open. Honey. Yeah? What? What's inside? No, no, don't look. I'm afraid you were right. <laughs> is on his way. Oh, it, it doesn't seem real. Just a few hours ago, I was talking to her and now... I know, honey, I know. It's hard to take. You, young fellow, what's your name? Huh? Uh, Nelson Carter. Supposed to be the girl's fiancé, huh? You don't seem to be particularly upset. Uh, I'm stunned. What, uh, what brought you here? I came to see Lois. I, I was here this afternoon and we had another fight. I came back to apologize. That's something new. First time you ever apologized for anything. 
It drove the poor girl half crazy. Well, it was her fault. She wouldn't listen to me. I was right from the very start. Oh, sure. So right you never let her have a thought of her own. You hounded her with your rightness. That's why she moved in with me, to get away from you and your pestering phone calls and your fights. That's a lie. You came between us. Lois told me this afternoon you said she should forget me. I told her so at breakfast. But she couldn't. She was still in love with you. Huh? She was going back to her apartment tomorrow morning. There's something I don't get. If Lois was using Phil's apartment as a sort of hideout, how did this fellow know she was here? That's my business. It's also ours, son. What time did you come here this afternoon? Why, about 4.30. Hmm. And the girl's been dead three or four hours. Say, look here, if you're trying to pin this on me, you're crazy. Maybe. Lois told me about your insane temper. You threatened to kill her. I did not. Oh, you're a pack of fools. But I think I do know who did it. Yeah? Who? Wait a minute. Hmm? Who can that be? Oh, it's too soon for the coroner. I'll answer it. Good evening. Good evening. I'm well, sorry to bother you this hour, but we had some trouble about a pickup at this address. Oh, what kind of a pickup? Why, a, a trunk. I'm the traffic investigator for the transfer company. We gave one of our drivers a pickup order at this apartment, but he didn't bring it in. In fact, he's disappeared. Oh, wait a minute. I can explain part of it. I told your driver I'd changed my mind. I didn't want the trunk sent. Oh, oh, I see. You... Oh, you're Miss Phyllis Knight. That's right. Haven't I, uh... Haven't I met you somewhere before? Your voice sounds familiar. It ought to, Mr. Shane. You used to hear it every day. Hmm? Going up, sir? Floors, please? An elevator operator. In the Rust Building. Well, I'm... I'm sorry I disturbed you, but we're just trying to locate our driver. Good night. Yeah. Mm, uh, good night. That's funny. Why should a baggage company driver disappear? Right after he came for this trunk. I wonder... All right, kids, let's get back to business. Now, Mr. Carter, you start to say you knew the killer. Yeah, Lois's old boss, Joseph Spiegel. He's uh, head of the Spiegel Chemical Laboratories. She told me this afternoon he was coming to see her. Yeah, but he doesn't know she was here. Lois quit her job with him last week. As soon he did know. Why should our next boss want to kill the girl? Because he's a crook. I used to work in Spiegel's laboratory, and I discovered he was stealing formulas from other companies. So I quit. Yeah, but not Lois. Oh, no. Now, she was his private secretary, and her boss was just the soul of honor. That's what started our fighting. Yes, but when she learned you were right, she did quit. Three days ago. All right. But it sounds like a pretty flimsy reason to kill a girl. Not if Lois had the goods on him. He wanted to stop her tongue. You weren't fighting about that this afternoon? No. No, she told me she was going to go to work for another chemical company. I told her when I married, I didn't want my wife working. Well, we both got pretty mad. She said she'd never marry me. I can imagine how you took that with your conceit. Uh, how about it, Mike? I don't know. I'm a little worried, Faraday. This is Phil's apartment. She's been living here alone up till the past few days. Yeah? Lois and Phyllis are about the same height, same color hair. Yeah. Maybe... Maybe somebody thought he was killing Phyllis. Huh? Who'd want to? I haven't an enemy in the world. Oh, you've got hundreds, angels, as many as I've got. Mm. Mike Shane and Phyllis Knight have sent plenty of lugs up the river. Yeah, but Lois and I don't really look alike, Mike. A, a killer would be awfully certain before he did it. Why should he, honey? Yours is the only name on the mailbox. If some crook hired a gunman to come to this address and knock off the girl living in apartment 660... Listen, Mike, that stuff doesn't happen in San Francisco. Those are the old Al Capone days. <sighs> Well, maybe I'm a nervous Nelly. I just don't want Phil running any danger. Mike. Yes? Come here a minute. Look here. Hmm? Here. This ashtray. Uh -huh, I see what you mean. Mr. Carter, do you uh, smoke? What? Uh, yes, a uh, pipe. Oh. There's a cigar button in this ashtray. Spiegel. He smokes them all the time. I told you he was coming here. Maybe we should check that right now. You know where he lives? Yeah, he's got an apartment at his plant. It's next to the laboratory. That's on uh, Bay Street. Okay, suppose Phil and I mosey over there right now and swap formulas with Dr. Speaker. Good, and if the coroner gets through here in time, I'll join you. Oh, well, Mr. Shane. Hmm? Have you got a gun? You think I'll need it? You might. Spiegel's a huge man with a cunning, fiendish mind. <laughs> well, thanks for the warning. I'll be ready with a few Shane Nanigans of my own. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Oh. 
Quality of workmanship and materials has always been the hallmark of successful business. That is why Union Oil Company has copyrighted the name Stopware. You see, Stopware lubrication is more than just a grease job. It is a system that has been worked out from years of experience to give your automobile the best possible care. With Stopware lubrication, you can be sure that nothing on your automobile has been overlooked or hurriedly serviced. Each fitting is carefully and thoroughly lubricated according to the manufacturer's specifications. Only the finest, high-quality greases are used. And while your car is on the hoist, the Minutemen inspect out-of-sight points and check them for danger signs. As a proof of Stopware's superior lubrication, you receive a written guarantee with each job. Stopware lubrication jobs are a matter of pride with Union Oil Minutemen. And you'll know why when you take the wheel after a stopware servicing. You'll find your car rolls smoother, handles easier, stands up better with regular stopware lubrication. So, ladies and gentlemen, with correct car servicing so important these days, why take a chance on inferior work? Stopware, the best attention you can buy, costs no more than ordinary lubrication. Remember, stopware is an exclusive, guaranteed process. Available only at Union Oil Minuteman stations. It is a dark and foggy street in San Francisco's commercial district. Light streams out into the night through an open door. The entrance to the Spiegel Chemical Laboratories. In the doorway is the huge silhouette of a man. Shane? Michael Shane? Yes, sir. I do not know you, sir. I'm aware of that, Dr. Spiegel, but Miss Knight and I would like to talk to you. It's very important. Impossible. Tonight I'm working in my laboratory. It's about Lois Lavers, Doctor. Lois? Oh. Come in. Close the door, please. We will talk in the laboratory. I must get back to my experiment. This way, please. Thank you. Jeepers, he is a giant, Mike. Mm Mm-hmm. And those thick glasses make him look like a movie horror man. You said... Mr. Shane, you are a detective. How did you know that? Well, I rather expected Lois might talk to someone. She's a very neurotic girl. She imagines things. I'm afraid she's past that, Dr. Spiegel. She's dead. Dead. Murdered. It's a pity. She had a fine brain. But, uh, too much imagination? My laboratory... I caution you both not to handle the tubes or retorts. They are very fragile. Oh. Golly, it's it's an elaborate place. What are you experimenting on? That, madam, is my business. Doctor, I believe you knew Nelson Carter, Lois' fiancé. Hmm, he used to work here. Capable, but a wild temper. And very jealous. Of you, perhaps? Yes. I used to take Lois to dinner so I could continue my work without interruption. Nelson misunderstood. Yes. I should not be surprised if he killed her. Perhaps. Uh, You saw Lois this afternoon, Doctor. About what time? A very good detective. (laughs) About five o'clock, I would say. How did you know she was staying in my apartment? One moment. There is trouble with this retort. Better? Better? How did I know? It is very simple. Lois telephoned me. Her last paycheck was incorrect. I brought her a new one. Is that all you went to see her about? No. Also, I asked her to come back. She was an excellent secretary. Mr. Shane, what are you doing? Just admiring your laundry in the sink. Laundry? Does your experiment include bleaching of blood-soaked handkerchiefs, Doctor? Good heavens. (laughs) Yes, they, they are my handkerchiefs, yes. But the blood is not from Lois's veins. Ooh. She was strangled and stabbed to death by a sharp instrument, Doctor. Like this surgical knife here. <laughs> Perhaps I, I show you how I use that knife. In this cage... Ooh. Rats. Hundreds of them. One hundred, madam. Disease, very sick rats. When my experiments are concluded, they go in here. Into this bin. Oh, no. Very dramatic, Doctor. But it doesn't fool us. Sure. Sure, you wanted Lois to come back to work, but she told you she was going to another chemical company. That scared you, Doctor. 
If she told about your stolen formulas and your other cookery... Oh, she did talk. I thought this was a trick. Don't you reach for your gun, Mr. Shane. My hand is already in my pocket. You killed her. You lie. She's not dead. It is a trick to get something on me. Get out. Get out of here, both of you. Now you will forget you ever came here. You will drop this investigation. I don't take orders from you, Dr. Spiegel. This time you will. Your young lady has sense if you have not. Good night. Oh, I thought he was going to keep us in there and experiment on us. Yes. <laughs> he's a cold-blooded baby. Yeah. Right. Hmm? Hey, hey, the inspector. There, he's parked in that police car. Oh, with Nelson. Yeah. He's got here in time to see the bums rush. What are the odds? I don't know, Inspector. He's devilish enough to commit murder. Should I take him in for questioning? No, no, not yet, not yet. He'll be here. He doesn't scare out. Mike found handkerchiefs soaking with blood. He, he said he was experimenting with rats. Mm. I think he was sincere, though. He figured we were on the trail of those stolen formulas. He killed her, I tell you. If the police don't get him, I will. Oh, stop acting. You're too dead anxious to pin it on Spiegel. Yes, yes, and the good doctor threw the honor right back at Nelson. I'm on the fence. Spiegel had the motive, Nelson had the jealousy and the temper to do it. Each saw the girl about the time she died. Mike, if you ask me, you're passing up a bit. Hmm? The killer stuffed Lois into the trunk so her body could be smuggled out of the building. Find where the trunk was going and perhaps we'll have the address of the murderer. But she ordered the trunk picked up herself, Phil. Maybe she didn't. Anyway, it's worth a try. Hop in, Angel. We're heading for that transfer company. <laughs> Appreciate it, sir. You're coming down and opening the office at this time of the night. Well, lucky my wife saw you were a policeman or she'd never have let me out of the house. <laughs> uh, this is our dispatch office. Oh, uh, by the way, have you located your missing driver? Missing driver? I, I don't understand. Why, your traffic investigator came to the apartment. The driver that was to pick up the trunk had disappeared. He, he was checking up. Well, that's impossible. All of our men checked into that. And we don't have a, what did you call him, a traffic investigator? Mike. He was a fake. Mm hmm. That's not so good. Probably never ran an elevator in the Rust Building either. This thing is getting screwier by the minute. Oh, here we are. Here's the pickup order on the trunk. It's under the name, uh, oh, yes, Phyllis Knight. Not under Lois Lavers. Well, let's see. It was a phone order received 5.25 p.m. Yeah. Trunk to be sent to 9053 Jennifer Street. Mm hmm. Seems to me I've heard that address before. 9053 Jennifer. 9053 Jennifer. Yeah, there's something about it. I should hope so. It's the address of Michael Shane. I was right, Inspector. I was right. Lois was killed by mistake. It was intended to be filled. Well, if that's the case, then Carter and Spiegel cancel out. Correct, honey. The murderer had planned to kill Phyllis, send her body in that trunk to my apartment, and leave me to explain it to the police. All right, maybe so. Say the motive is revenge. You got a hundred enemies, Mike. One of them poses as a transfer company investigator, but who is he? He didn't leave a single fingerprint in Phil's apartment. Where do we start looking? Oh, if I could only remember the guy. I, I know his voice. But where have I heard it? When did I? I must know him. Well, he didn't know me very well, or he'd never have killed the wrong girl. Lois and I were the same height, same color of hair, Mike, but that's all. Maybe, maybe he figured you changed a lot, honey, if, if he hadn't seen you in a long time, if he'd been away, if he'd ha been... Faraday! Yeah, if he'd been away in prison. Kids, we're going to make a phone call right now. Hello, give me San Quentin. Phil, Phil, honey, close that door to the other room. We yeah. can't hear a thing. Hello, Inspector Faraday, San Francisco calling. Yes, I want to speak to him personally. Might get on that extension phone. Hmm? Yeah, okay. Hello, Faraday. What's on your mind? Plenty, sir. We need a list of all prisoners you've released from your little sanatorium in the past two weeks. Past two weeks, huh? Yeah. I'm afraid it'll hardly make a list, Faraday. Only one man. What's his name? Now, let me see. Well, it was Ford. Harold Ford. That mean anything to you, Mike? Hmm. Well, never heard of him. Oh, who's that on the phone, Mike Shane? 
<laughs> you got sharp ears, sir. We, uh, we figured maybe you had released a prisoner who had a grudge against me. Some old enemy of Mike's who might try his hand at revenge. Oh, that's the only release we've had lately. In fact, Mike, you can subtract one enemy from your book. Hmm? He died here last week. Al Smock. Al Sm- Holy jumping. Now I remember. It's Al Smock's brother, Jack Smock. That's right. He had a brother. Came up here and claimed the body. Does that mean anything to you? Ha-ha! Does it? Set an extra plate in your dining room, Chief. We're sending you a new border. Goodbye, sir, and thanks a million for your help. Jack Smock. Jack Smock. He must have dyed his hair and put on glasses. Phil, Phil, you remember the case, the two brothers, uh, about four years ago? Yeah, yeah, vaguely. It was, uh, it was manslaughter. You helped send the one called Al Smock up for 20 years. Right, honey, right. Jack was supposed to be Brothers Al, alibi. Yeah. But our testimony tied him up in bow knots. Yeah, that's so right. So Al died in prison. Now, Brother Jack is out for revenge. Oh, fine. But where is Brother Jack right now, and how do we catch him? Got it, honey. Jack claimed the body, so he must have buried him. Now we got to find that body. <laughs> We'll return to Mike Shane and his adventures in just a moment. Due to their position, the front wheel bearings of your automobile are subject to damage from dirt, water, grit, and brake dust. Because of their more exposed position, and because they are so important to safe, easy driving, front wheel bearings need the best possible lubrication. Failure to keep these bearings well greased can mean wheel shimmy, hard steering, and weakening of the whole front assembly. For these reasons, your neighborhood Union Oil Minute Man uses extra care when he lubricates your front wheel bearings. First, he washes out all the old grease and dirt with solvents. Then the bearings and races are individually cleaned until they are dry and shiny. Finally, the clean, polished bearings are carefully assembled in the races and greased with special equipment. With each bearing snugly sealed in a smooth, sturdy coating of Union Oil ball roll grease, your front wheels are all set for months of well-lubricated, easy rolling. The cost for the entire service is nominal, so for safer, easier driving, just stop in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil front wheel bearing service. Thank you. At police headquarters, Mike and Inspector Faraday each holds a telephone in his hands. They have checked every cemetery in the book. Well, here's the last one. Shadow Mountain Cemetery. Yes, sir. Here it is. Albert Smock, interred last Friday. The plot was bought by a Mr. Jack Smock. Swell, swell. Uh, what's his address? Our records show it as 1960 Waterfront. <laughs> This is it, kids. Looks like a busted-down rooming house. And somebody's head sticking out of every window. Yeah, there. There's a sergeant at the entrance. Good work, Sergeant. Anybody try to leave the building? No, sir. I got two boys at the back door, two in the alley, and two by the fire escape. Okay, let's go in, Mike. I'm coming, too. You are not. You want a hole in your head? I might get one just standing here, Smarty. Hmm? Smock may be in that crowd across the street. Something oh. to that, Mike. Yes. Sergeant, your job will be to take care of Miss Knight. We're all going in. Right. Oh, jeepers, it's dark again. Why don't they light these stairs? Quiet, honey, quiet. Right. He's on this next floor. If he's in his room. The landlord said room 305. Now, oh, let me see. That'd be here to the left. Keep close to the wall. There it is. That door there. There's no light shining under it. Maybe he's playing possum. Sergeant, you and Phil stay here, flatten out against the wall. Yes, sir. Now, you ready, Fanny? Ready. Mm, he's playing coy. Open up, Smock. You're completely surrounded. Okay, so you won't open up. All right, Fanny? Yeah. So that's his answer. Okay, Mike, let's go. I'll get the light. Oh, hurry up, hurry up. Here Something it is. Happened. Mike, 
Oh, he's flat on the floor. Mike, are you all right? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Okay, Inspector, okay. Climb out from under that table. We... I knew somebody got hit, but who... He shot the gun right out of my hand. Yeah, I know. I didn't know where to aim in the dark till he fired, and I saw his flash. Thanks to you, Mike, I'm still breathing. No, oh, this man on the floor won't be unless we get an ambulance quick. Oh, you found out. I didn't think... That... Hey, you're right, buddy. You didn't think, period. Revenge doesn't take much in the way of brains. Just an awful lot of lives. <laughs> Don't be silly, Phyllis. Mrs. Faraday will be glad to put you up for a couple of nights. Here, drink this down. Mm. He's right, honey. Stay out of your apartment for a few days till you sort of forget what's happened. No. All right. I was just thinking. Mm? You know, this was a freak case. Everything stacked up so strongly against Nelson Carter and Dr. Spiegel. Mm -hmm. And yet at the last minute, it turned out to be almost a complete stranger. Because we were looking for the wrong motive. Yeah, I'm worried about that guy Spiegel. He looks to me like a guy who'd commit plenty of murders. And will before he gets through with his career. No, you can spike that, Faraday. Lock him up for stealing chemical formulas. That'll keep him quiet. Hey, not a bad idea. Keep him so busy making little ones out of big ones that he can't make dead ones out of live ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope, honey, that this little episode won't scare you out of the detecting business. Nearly getting bumped off by your boss's enemies. He's got plenty more enemies besides Jack Smock. Oh, I don't know. I'd stick anyway. My boss forgets the attractions of the job. What? <laughs> what? Why, honey? <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, and Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Holliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In the early twilight, Broadway is dappled with beginning shadows. It's the time of the small shock. The springtime's day starts its long scream down into night. It's time clock time, the hour for going home again. Close the ledger, lock the store, figure the overtime, smile at the boss, and out into the street. Blink, then run. The subway waits for no man. Home again. End another day again. My day was just beginning, north on Broadway and to the east, Central Park around the 80s, to push through the crowd whose focus was a park bench that faced the street. All right, come on, come on, break it up there, let him through. And Sergeant Muggerman tells you why you're there. Head over here, Danny. Lay right there near the bench. I phoned the knife. I didn't pick it up. I read... Who's the boy? Paul, uh... Paul Gilbert. Yeah. I haven't been home from school yet. Oh, you'll go home in a squad car, Paul. I promised him with the siren, Danny. Yeah, with the siren. What happened, Paul? 
How did the knife get there? I saw the man take it out of his own back and throw it down. And then the man staggered away. Mm -hmm. Did I show you this, Danny? All this blood? Wherever he is, he's hurt real bad. I want you to think for a minute, Paul. What did this man look like? Tall, I guess. Yeah, I guess that's all. He was tall. Uh, most grown-ups are tall, aren't they, Paul? All of them, except for midgets. One more thing, Paul. Was there anyone with this man? Think hard. No, I don't think so. Well, you told me that... The other man I saw wasn't with him. The other man in the hat just watched him. Then the man in the hat ran away. He wasn't with him. What did the man in the hat look like? He had a hat. That's all I know. I got scared. I ran. That's right, Danny. Paul ran right into Officer Curcio on the beat. Almost knocked him down. Curcio came back, saw the blood on the bench, the knife, phoned it in. Paul, did you know the man, the man with the knife? No. Uh Uh-uh. I usually don't come home from school this way. We had an after-school game with the 8B2 over there on the playground. This is the first game of the intramural. A squad car might have been for Paul with a siren. Then the careful tracing, the sifting through the shadows of a city, the dust of a city, the hiding places of a city into which a wounded man must crawl and lie for a time and then wander in search of a kindlier place, a darker place, and leave behind him the trail of the wounded, the blood of his life. But the man who'd been stabbed had done none of these things. The hospitals told me that, the doctors, the fellow in the neat white jacket in the drugstore across from the park, who, not having a wounded man, offered me a special on shaving cream. Then the legwork of the man on the beat, harvesting the crop of those who had been at the scene of the crime, sorting them, packaging them, parceling them out to me, one by one. Look, mister, how many rides do we have to give you guys? I was calling on my girl. I brought her a box of chocolate-covered peppermints. She was beginning to understand me. Oh, we won't keep you long. Y- you don't understand, mister. I don't stick close to my little bird. She busts out of her cage. I've known her to do that when I pop out two minutes for a corner newspaper. You were in the park this afternoon. Saw a man who was stabbed. Can you describe the man? I was never in no park where an unfortunate got stabbed. An officer took your name. You made him erase it. Start all over again because he wasn't spelling it right. So you caught me in a lie. Can you describe the man who was hurt? Describe? Who got a chance to get close to him? Everybody pushing, shoving like it was a parade for a general. I'm lucky I got a peek at the top of his fleeing skull. Well, that's all. Look, uh, I won't explain why I lied about not being in the park. Uh, my girl, the bird, thinks I work for a living. It's a little white lie I used to keep a cage. That's all. You can go. Then the man who is eager, whose eyes dart and pierce, who follows you as you move away from him, stays close to you, needs the lapel of your coat. I was real close to him. He had a knife in his back. He breathed in my face. I could tell you the color of his eyes, how close I was. Tell me. Blue eyes. Washed out blue and no tears in them. No tears at all. No remorse for the evil doing that had brought wrath upon him. Blue eyes. What color hair? Dirty. A dirty color. All matted. No. No, it was blonde and shining. There was a kind of light that shone about it. That's because he was dying. Dying in protest against all the wickedness that'll drown. Drown us all. A big man, a short man, a bit. What does it matter how he looked? I was close to him, I tell you. He reached out his hand to me, touched my hand, tears on my face. Help him out of your office. Motion a policeman over, watch him be gentle with the man, take him away. And then motion for the next one to come in. Realize, of course, that you're imposing on my time. Not that I mind. It could be a welcome relief from those spoiled monsters I simper and smile at and diaper. You're a nursemaid, Miss Cram, is that right? Call me governess and call me Virginia. Miss Cram doesn't sound like me at all, don't you think? You take the children to the park every day? Four to five thirty, except on rainy days. Hmm? On rainy days, the children and I stay at home and I'm permitted callers from four to five thirty. That's on rainy days. You told an officer you saw the man who was hurt. I was making conversation. I needed that to get those brats out of my hair. You didn't see him? I wouldn't have gone near him. But I can tell you who did see him, the looker. Who? The looker. All of us in the park know her. She sits in a window across the street on the fifth floor, watches every move we make every day. Sits there and watches. It makes you feel as if you're being spied on, you know what I mean? Fifth floor, in an apartment on 80th and 5th. Well, you can't miss her. Just stand out in the street for a while. Her eyes will bore right through you. But on a rainy day... I know, you're permitted callers. That's all, Miss Graham. Yes? 
I'm Danny Clover, police. <laughs> we haven't done anything. I know. I don't even know who you are. There's no name card on your door. You want to come in and talk to us? All right. I'm George Mason. She's my... in the wheelchair. Diane's my wife. Uh, good evening, Miss Mason. Diane? Diane, dear. Diane, we've got a visitor. He said good evening to you. Uh, say hello, Diane. This is Mr. Clover. He's from the police. Mr. Mason, there was some trouble earlier across the street from her. You talk to her, will you? I'm trying something. Maybe it'll do her some good, talking to her. No one ever does, you know. You just talk to her and I'll answer you. All right. There was a man stabbed across the street from you, Mrs. Mason, in the park. Yes, I heard about it when I came home. Have you found the man? No. Mrs. Mason, I understand that you sit by a window every day. That's right, that one. She sits there and watches. It's her pleasure. Today? Every day. Then she must have seen what happened. She must pretty. have... Uh... Pretty. Pretty. What? What are you trying to say, Diane? Mm-hmm. Can't you see how it is? I'm sorry. George? Yes. What is it? I saw a man today. I saw a knife today. Is there anything you can do? Can you talk to her? Diane. A man today. A knife today. Yes, well, can you tell me what the man looked like, sweetheart? Knife. Was he a big man? Was he a small man? Was he a nice man? Man. Did you like him? And try to erase from memory the eyes of the woman filled with the named terrors, the known terrors that dart and scurry, gnaw and nibble at the fleeting instance of serenity within her. And try to wash away in the city's night screaming the crooning of a tuneless song. And suddenly the known words, a man, a knife. And know that the eyes that absorb all movement, all shadow, all light on faces, and things that pass before them, have seen nothing. Not the man who was stabbed, not the one who did the stabbing. And then the long walk to the darkened room, turn on the shaded light bulb and search the cupboards for sleep. And finally, it comes. In the morning, the scorching cup of coffee, the walk to headquarters, and the cheery greeting on the threshold from the cheery Sergeant Attaglia. Oh, welcome, Danny. Welcome to your abode away from your abode. Uh, Good morning, Gino. Ah, the best. The sunniest, the bravest. Uh, Not so early. Gino, all I've had is a cup of coffee. For which I am delighted. Huh? For which I am delighted. Come, I will escort you to your office, Danny. You will see there how I have taken the liberty to spread upon your desk a repast. I shouldn't have done it, Gino. A repast consisting of a hot paper container of coffee and a half a dozen cinnamon bums. Voila, the repast. Partake. Uh, looks good. How else should they look? The cinnamon bums were baked in the oven of Mrs. Tartaglia with her own two lily whites. Go ahead, partake. Munch, if you like. Mmm, delicious. Uh, thank Mrs. Tartaglia for me. Goes without saying. And now, to the events of the morning. <clears throat> uh, okay if I disturb while you munch? Mm, yeah, yeah. We of the department have discovered that this park bench upon which an alleged man was allegedly stabbed has been a lucky bench. Or unlucky, depending, of course, on the point of view of whom sat there. You'll explain it to me, aren't you, no? It goes without saying. The lucky part of the bench is that five weeks ago, a man found upon it, wrapped in a newspaper, $300. Turned it over to Lost and Found. So? So is that four weeks ago, same man turned into lost and found from the same bench a like newspaper containing another 300. And we have not seen this pleasant, honest citizen since. Do you have his name? Oh, it goes with our... Uh, Harry Forster, 1345 West 16th. Want I should keep the cinnamon buns hot for you, Danny? I'll do that, Gino. You go ahead and do that. Please help me. 
Please come in and help me. What's the matter? My husband. No one will help me. I asked the neighbors. They said, call the police. Call an ambulance. Please, help. Where is he? You'll help. He's in our bedroom. I think he's... I think he's dying and no one would... No one... You're Mrs. Foster? Yes, Harry's wife. He came home last night and... And there was blood. He just looked at me like an animal and... There he is, mister. Help him. Please help him. Dead. No. No, you're wrong. He's been dead for a long time. He was asleep. Only asleep. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. On CBS this Sunday evening, Charlie McCarthy will play a tattoo artist for a group of sailors, while beautiful Ann Southern acts as his reluctant model. There'll be more fun with Eve Arden, Amos and Andy, Red Skelton, and Corliss Archer. Stay with CBS this Sunday, for these great comedy programs will be heard on most of these same stations. In the Maytime, the sun grins down and pats Broadway's cheek. Broadway loves it. The sunlit minutes are added to the ten-minute break for a cigarette. The walk is slower, the sway gentler. The windows are open wide, and the doors, too. And glints of sunlight are carried through long hallways on the sigh of a summer's wind, touching the lips of the girl at the typewriter, touching the hand of the man at the water cooler watching her, touching the steel of the file cabinets, warming them. And having made the tour, back onto Broadway and start all over again. But where I was, there was no warmth. Only a woman drawing a shawl tight around her shoulders and talking quietly to her dad. Harry, Harry, listen to me. You were right. We should have told them. We should have told them all about it. And you wouldn't be like this, and I would... Mrs. Foster, what should you have told us? What? What did you say? What should you and your husband have told us? About the money, nothing else. Money found on the park bench? Yes. You see, we should have told them, Harry. But he did, Mrs. Foster. He reported it. Turned it in. You don't understand. I knew no one would understand. Then maybe you can help me. Friday was always Harry's day off. From the factory out there, you can see it from here, see? On his day off, I'd pack him a little lunch and he'd kiss me goodbye. Walk uptown to Central Park. He... Go on. He always went alone. He always sat on the same bench. Harry used to describe it to me. What he saw, people he talked to. Felt as if I'd been there with him. And one day he found money in a newspaper. And turned it in, like you said. The next week turned it in. But after that, I told him he didn't have to do that anymore. You mean he found more money? Is that what you're trying to tell me? What? You mean he found more money? For five weeks in a row. I told Harry he didn't have to turn it in anymore. I told him to go back. To be sure and keep going back. Every week. Yesterday, too. (laughs) And we'd be rich. No more of this. No more factory. Why didn't you call us when he came home hurt? Call a doctor? Who would have spoiled it, ended it? The money, don't you see? I thought he'd live, and we... With that money... No. You couldn't. You couldn't see. Then she turned from me and walked over to the window, stared out of it. Across her shoulder, into the noon sunshine, I could see the factory emptying its lunchtime employees... The crowd breaking off its fragments, to the curb with the lunch pails, to the push carts for the ham on white and coffee. Then the other sound, the feet in the doorway, the entrance of the professionals, coroner, photographer, reporter. The man had been murdered. I left.
Then back again to Central Park and the park bench of the stabbing. Sit on it. A man named Harry Foster used to find money here. And he was killed. And a woman who had seen it happen, a woman who sat at a window every day. I looked up to the window. She wasn't there. I wondered why. I knew why. She was in the wheelchair. There was a man pushing it carefully down the steps. Can you scooch a little to the side, friend? Oh, need a hand? Uh, yeah, if you want. Ah, thanks. How are you feeling, Mrs. Mason? She ain't gonna answer you. I didn't know she left the house. Why should you even bother? Oh, I'm Danny Clover, police. Oh, hi, I'm Ben Taylor. Uh, got a you drive down the street. Only Mrs. Mason here, different. <laughs> kind of a take drive. Oh, I see. Just today? Oh, no, all the time. Uh, from one to three, uh, the elements willing. Uh, I take her for a ride. Sometimes here, sometimes ride. there. Oh, uh, Sure, sure. Uh, right away, Miss Mason. Uh, see you, Danny. Oh, wait a minute. How long have you been doing this, Ben? Right. Well, since her accident. Since at Coney last year. Hide her back. Here and up here, her head. Right. Come right. Uh, I, I guess I better take her. I heard her cry like that before. I can't stand it. Sure. It's a nice day, Mrs. Mason. I hope you enjoy your ride. Oh, she will. She likes riding in the car. See you around, Danny. I watched Ben lift her gently out of the wheelchair, lift her into the back of the car, close the door, fold the chair, place it in the car trunk, then back and saying something to her. She looked up for an instant. Her eyes found me. Then she smiled and shaped a lost word with her lips. They were gone. And back at headquarters, the wall clock ticking off the hours of Harry Foster's death, ticking off the hours that his murderer came to a park bench, looked at it, smiled, walked away in the warm sun, ticked off the question of why money had been left there for Harry Foster to find week after week on Friday's twilight. And at four o'clock, the door opening slightly, and all you saw of the man was his cocked head. You Mr. Danny Clover? That's right. You want something? Only to know if you, Mr. Danny Clover, and to give you what I have in my pocket. They said I should give it to you, you being the interested party and all. Uh, what have you got in your pocket? This. An envelope. Stamped and everything. I found it. Now give it to me. It's addressed to George Mason. Anybody can see that. That's the husband of that woman. The cripple. The one they call a looker in the papers. The one they think they saw that stabbing. <laughs> I did right bringing it to you. Huh? It's been opened. You open it? Don't lie to me. You opened it and then resealed it. All right, I opened it. I'm a normal kind of fellow with all the normal curiosities. First, I was going to mail it when I found it. But then I saw who it was addressed to. I couldn't restrain myself. I'm like the proverbial cat, Mr. Clover. It could be I... trouble for you being like that. Not when you see what's in it. Not when you see what it says. It says, you've made a terrible mistake. That's all. Not another word. See? You can't do anything to me for just reading that. You just read it yourself. That's why I brought it to you. Because I'm a cooperative citizen. Now, where'd you find I, it? At Glenn's tomb. You know, I've been curious about that tomb for years now. Finally, I took time off to go to study it. Then I found a letter on the steps. And I never did get to really study Grant's tomb. Tough. You'll stick around, huh? Some of our boys want to have a long chat with you. They enjoy curious fellas. Sure, anything you say. I'm nothing if I'm not cooperative. Just nothing. I wouldn't say that, but you stick around, huh? Hi, Ben. Well, hello, Danny. Hey, how do you like this, huh? I rigged up so when it's a sunny day, the telephone is on the outside of my shack. Inspiration, huh? Uh, fine. Who wants to be on the inside when outside it's sunny? <laughs> you car renting, Danny? I can give you rates. Oh, uh, just talk. <laughs> if you don't do business together, we never become enemies, huh? What's on your mind? Mrs. Mason. Oh, uh, yeah. Sad, huh? You know, if you set your mind to it and consider all she's been through, and then look at her, she's a pretty woman. I noticed. You said she was hurt in an accident at Coney Island, Ben. What, what kind of an accident? Uh, on the roller coaster. You know, one of them rides. Fell off. Right near the end of the ride. She stood up, fell. Was she with anyone? Uh, yeah, her husband. You want to know something? In spite of the heartbreak of having a wife like that, you know, Mr. Mason is one of the nicest guys I ever met. What about Mrs. Mason, Ben? 
Hmm? What about it? Can anyone ever talk to her, have a conversation with her? I talk to her. About what? Hmm. Things. You know, uh, ain't it a pretty day, Mrs. Mason? Is there a draft on you, Mrs. Mason? I talk to her, but she just hums and sings. But you know, I think she's getting better. It, Maybe I'm contributing. Where'd you go driving today? Um, down Riverside Drive. You know, the river, Grant's tomb, the churches. Thanks a lot, Ben. Anytime, Danny, anytime at all. Mr. Clover. Good evening, Mr. Mason. Uh, we're, we're delighted to see you. Please come in. Diane, it's Mr. Clover. Diane looks better, doesn't she, Mr. Clover? Yes, yes, she does. I brought you something, Mr. Mason. Here. Huh? A letter? It's addressed to you. Read it. I don't understand. Read it. Yes, it is. It's addressed to me, but it's been opened. That's right. Read it. All right. Oh. Note says you made a mistake, Mr. Mason. <laughs> Mrs. Mason, your husband might be electrocuted for a murder he committed. Leave her alone. I wasn't going to touch her. Cut it out, Mrs. Mason. What's the matter with you? Have you gone out of your mind, Clover? I said cut it out, Mrs. Mason. I told you leave her alone. All right, you've come here to accuse me of murder, but leave her alone. George. Don't, don't worry about anything, dear. Get me a drink of water. What? What did you say? A drink of water, George. Cold water from the refrigerator. Diane. Darling, a drink of water. Do it. You won't be able to wait on me anymore. Mr. Clover's going to take you away from me. You're talking like... You know what you're saying. You do know what you're saying. What's happening? What's happening to us? It's already happened. It's all over. <laughs> Poor George. It paid off, didn't it, Mrs. Mason? Sitting at the window watching. Watching for a man your husband could kill. Simple little man. He came and sat on the same bench every Friday. He got paid for a while. It was you. You wrote that first letter to him. And this one. Made me pay blackmail to a man who didn't even know me, didn't know anything about me. It was so simple. Write a letter, put a stamp on it, drop it from the car. Someone picked up the first letter and mailed it. About five weeks ago, a letter with instructions in it. Why, yes. Leave money every Friday on the park bench. And the man who picked it up, Mr. Mason, you thought was a blackmailer, so you killed him. She's crazy. She really is. She's crazy. No, I'm not. I'm just a cripple, George. I can't move from this chair. Honest. But I'm not crazy. She's crazy. What did that first letter say, Mr. Mason? One that a man saw me push my wife off a ride at Coney Island. He demanded blackmail, but I didn't push, Diane. <laughs> Then why did you pay the money, darling? But you weren't going to let your husband alone, were you, Mrs. Mason? Even after he did what you wanted him to do, murder a man. Another letter, the one your husband's holding, telling him he killed the wrong man. It's not much to ask, is it? Wanting George to suffer? Look at me. You're an accessory, Mrs. Mason. Am I? What can you do to me? A cripple in a wheelchair. In a prison? Will that be different? Tell me how. I didn't push you, Diane. I didn't push you. You fell off that ride. You fell. Liar. Diane. You're a liar, George. Diane, will you listen to me? I made it up to you. I carried you. I waited on you. I, I went crazy that day. I hated you. I don't know why. I don't know. Oh, I know why. You're an evil woman. Evil. Poor George. You should have died. You should have. <laughs> Poor George. Poor George. <laughs> 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 
it's night on Broadway now. There's easy laughter, and a trumpet scurls its music into the grinning mob. It's top of the evening. Have another drink on me, kid, and let's sit this dance out. It's a street gouged out of a scarlet dream. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Lamont Johnson was heard as George Mason, Kathy Lewis as Diane Mason, and Virginia Gregg as Mrs. Foster. Others in the cast were Herb Vigran, Lou Krugman, and Johnny McGovern. Every Saturday night, Jan Murray takes a tip from Danny Clover and goes looking for people. Only Jan's beat is the United States. By coast-to-coast -coast phone, he offers a grand in cold, hard cash if you can identify the phantom voice. So stay tuned now as Jan Murray and Sing It Again follow immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. It's another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure, The Funeral Wreath, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the White Verbenas. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter made a funeral wreath give him the answer to a cold-blooded murder. But first, a word of advice. As a homemaker, you know what a job it is to keep a home attractive. That's why you've appreciated the new beauty which Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, has brought to your walls. And that's why you'll appreciate Linux Cream Polish, which restores your furniture's original handsomeness in one quick, easy application. Yes, Linux Cream Polish saves one whole step in your housekeeping routine, for it cleans as it polishes without tiresome rubbing. And it removes cloudy dust and polish accumulation, banishes fingerprints, helps to conceal ugly scratches, drying to a hard finish that leaves no oil to attract more dust. So ask for Linux Cream Polish now at your hardware, paint, or department store. Headquarters for all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that covers in one coat. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As we look in on Nick's office, we find Lieutenant Riley telling Patsy and Nick about a rather unfortunate experience. Well, it's like this, you see, Nick. Tonight, after old man Bramwell gave me the devil this morning about there being four robberies on his street in three weeks, I picked the best man I got on the force. And I sent him up to Pine Street, where all these robberies been taking place, and I told him to watch like his life depended on it. Mm -hmm. And then about one o'clock this morning, I got to thinking about it. And I decided to go up there and have a look for myself. Just to be sure, you know. Sure, I know. The demon of the police force goes on the job himself. Oh, now, look, Nicky, you're going to let me tell this or not? Sorry, Riley, go on with your story. Well, like I said, uh, I went to Pine Street myself, and I found the cop I'd sent up there was right on the job, okay. 
and everything was quiet as, as far as I could see. So I asked him how he was making out. Nothing stirring so far, Lieutenant. No suspicious characters around at all. You've been right here all the time, eh, Green? Oh, every minute, Lieutenant. Good. I just dropped around to be sure. Uh, Lieutenant, have you got a minute to spare? What do you mean, have I got a minute? Well, it's like this. My wife's having a baby tonight, I expect. Oh. Uh, she went to the hospital this afternoon, uh, just before I came on duty. And being as how I'm out here where no one could reach me, I, well, I, I just kind of thought I'd... I'd you like want to call her to see if you're a father yet. <laughs> Well, yes, sir. And I, I thought that if you wouldn't mind watching here a minute, I, I just phoned from the drugstore just around the corner. It'll only take me a minute, sir. Oh, sure, sure. Go ahead and phone. I'll wait until you come back. But, but don't stand gabbing for a half an hour, man. Oh, oh I, I won't, sir. So he went off and left you all alone, huh? Oh, too bad. I say it was too bad. If we'd both been there, we might have got that dirty crook. So what happened then, Lieutenant? Well, I, I stood there in the shadow of the corner house, you see, watching. Uh -huh. And a moment later, I saw a dark figure come out of old Bramwell's house, which was just two doors up the street. Now, I knew Bramwell and his wife lived there alone with, with only a maid, so I wondered who it would be coming out there that time of night. And what made me even more suspicious, there was no light on in the hall, like there would be if somebody was saying good night to him. So I says to myself, I'll just go over and find out who he is, because I'm not taking no chances tonight. And you went over? I did that. And the guy just stood there at the top of the steps. He seemed to be fumbling with, with something in a bag there. And as soon as I got up to the house, he turned around and, and hung something right beside the door. But it was too dark to see what it was at first. But as he started down the steps, I saw it was a funeral wreath with a long streamer of purple ribbon on it. How was the man dressed, Riley? Just like an undertaker, Nick. Black gloves and a tall hat and a long black coat. Well, could you see his face? No, not very well in the dark, Patsy. Well, I wasn't looking for nothing like that. So I asked him who was dead. I regret to inform you that Mr. George Bramwell has just passed away. Bramwell, you say? Old man Bramwell himself? Yes, very suddenly. Almost in his sleep, you might say. Oh, and he was down to see me just this morning. Looking fine, he was. Yes, very sad. Well, if you'll pardon me, I must be going. Uh, allow me to present you with one of my cards. Huh? In case you ever have need of a man in my profession. A card? Oh, yeah, thanks, thanks. This is J. Atherton Osgood, mortician. Yes. If you should ever need my services, I should be happy to be of service in Jay any way I can. Atherton, Osgood. Osgood? There ain't no undertaker in this town by that. Hey, you! Just a minute. There ain't no one. No. Oh. 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 So long, Copper. Oh. 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 what happened? Uh, that man, the one with the black bag. What? There's nobody on the street, Lieutenant. What, what happened, happened to you? Undertaker. He knocked me down. <laughs> 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 What's that? Hey, that came from Bramwell's house. Uh, Come on. Come on. Hey, are you all right, sir? Of oh, course I can walk. Let's get going. Oh, right. hey. What's the matter here, lady? What are you screaming about? Look, Look there. Bramwell. With his head all smashed in. Oh, gosh, Lieutenant. No wonder you're worried. I'm afraid to read what the newspapers will say. I can see him now. Lieutenant Riley of the Metropolitan Police talks to murderer on steps of murder's man's home and then is tricked into letting him go. Oh, it is a sorry day for me. Well, Riley, feeling sorry for yourself isn't going to hurt you anywhere. This man interests me. Huh? He goes to commit a murder and takes a funeral wreath along to hang on the door of his victim's home. <laughs> That's a new one on me. Nick, why don't you give Riley a hand? See if you can't find this crook for him. I think I will, Patsy. That is, if Riley wants me to. Wants you to? What do you think I've been telling you this for? Just to pass the time of day? Very well, Riley, very well. Since you beg me so politely, I'll be only too happy to put my talents at your disposal. Well, where do we begin, Nick? Now, you say the murderer wore gloves. So you must have left no fingerprints behind him. Yeah, that's right, Nick. I, and I went all through the Rose Gallery this morning. There's nothing there that looks like him. Which leaves us, if I'm not mistaken, with two clues. The funeral wreath. And the card he gave you. Uh, neither one of them is worth the tinker's dam. No? Why not? Well, that's the same kind of wreath they tack on anybody's door when there's a death in the family. And you certainly don't think that guy forked over his own card, do you? You're wrong on both counts, Riley. Now, how do you figure that, Nick? Well, take the card first. May not be, probably isn't his own. But it's somebody's card. Look at it, Patsy. It's not printed. It's engraved. Mm-hmm, you're right. 
If it was a phony, chances are it would just be a printed one. Ah, good morning, folks. Beautiful morning. Lovely morning, isn't it? Yes, nice I'll nice take you. You, you report. Hi, Johnny. Oh. Come on in. Oh, morning, Johnny. You're just in time. Now, look here, Johnny. Would you see if you dare to print a word of this in that yellow rag you work for? I'll... Now, now, work. now. Hold on, Lieutenant. It's not a yellow rag, and I don't work for it. I'm a feature writer and not a reporter. So, just keep your shirt on, huh? Whatever it is, it's getting you all hot and bothered. Riley's in the spot, Johnny. And the very thought of publicity makes him squirm. Oh, fear not, fear not, lovely policeman. Your secret shall be locked forever within the four walls of my heart. Lovely policeman. Hey, Nick, what's this all about? <laughs> it's a long story. I'll give you the details later. But right now, I've got a job for you, if you have time to do it. Huh? Always at your service, Nicholas. And the beautiful Patsy. Speak on. I want you to get hold of someone who can let you into the public library. Right. At this hour of the day? I don't care if it is early in the morning, and I don't care how sore they get about letting you in. But dig up somebody who can find you a copy of the Mortician's Annual. The Mortician's Annual? Yes, you know. It's the Undertaker's trade publication. See if you can find an undertaker named J. Atherton Osgood. Uh, J. Atherton Osgood, huh? All right, then what? Come back here and let me know what it says about him. And make it a rush order. This can't wait. Huh? Consider it done, Nicholas. I'm on my way. to loop. Nick, are you batty? Do you mean to tell me you think that guy's name really was J. Atherton Osgood? Not at all, Riley. But since it's a genuine business card, he must have picked it up somewhere along his travels. This man Osgood may help us get a line on him. That's too much for me, Nick. Uh, you want me for anything more here? No, not just now, Riley. I'll let you know if I do. Well, what are you going to do? I'd rather be shot than do what I have to do, Nick. What's that, Lieutenant? Go down to headquarters and explain to the reporters how it happened that that <laughs> crook got away from me last night. Oh, well, well, good luck to you. And you better put a shamrock over your left ear for luck. Okay, Nick, okay. Have your fun. But you're laughing at this sick man. So long. So long, Lieutenant. <laughs> I uh, don't envy Riley when the reporters get after him. <laughs> well, perhaps we've got something to do ourselves. Get me the latest city directory. It's right here, Nick. I was using it. What do you want to know? I want a list of all the florists in the city. What on earth for? We're going to call on them and see which of them made this funeral wreath and for whom. So get busy. through, Patsy? Just a couple more, Nick. But what a list. Maybe we'll be lucky and only have to call on a few of them. I should hope so. Why, if we have to call on him... Hi, folks. Your messenger is back. Johnny. Well? Oh, yes, yes. Very well. I might say okay. Well, what do you mean? Well, I routed out the sweetest little redhead sub-third assistant librarian you ever saw. Name was Myrtle O'Toole. And I got her to open one of the branch libraries for me. Did you get what I wanted? That? Sure. Uh, Myrtle was kind of sore at me for making her lose her beauty sleep, but, uh, I sued her. Oh, yes, I sued her. Mm, Casanova Winters in person. Johnny, what did you find out? Uh, yeah, Nick, down in black and white. J. Atherton Osgood, Funeral Chapel, Akron, Ohio. Yep. Johnny, Patsy, and I are going out. I want you to go through the files and see what you can find that has to do with Akron. Right, Nick. Uh, about what date? Say, um, say within the last year. Huh? I'm not quite sure of the dates yet. I finished the list, Nick. You want to go now? Yes, Patsy, the sooner the better. Okay. Get your hat and let's be on our way. Hey, Nick. Where are you going with that funeral wreath? I don't know for sure, Johnny, but I hope to hang it around a murderer's neck before long. Nick believes the funeral wreath which the killer hung on his victim's door will lead him to the killer himself. What can there be about that wreath that makes it such an important clue? We'll see in just a moment. Ever notice how much a shining, clean floor adds to the appearance of any room? All your rooms will look brighter, more attractive, when you protect your wood floors and linoleum with Linex Clear Gloss, the durable coating that flows on easily without brush marks, drying to a hard, tough finish which wears and wears and looks well for a long, long time. Linex Clear Gloss gives a lustrous, transparent finish to all wood or linoleum surfaces in your home, resisting boiling water, hot grease, perfume, fruit acids, even alcohol. And it's so easy to keep clean, for Linex Clear Gloss keeps the dirt on the surface where it's easily wiped away. Its gleaming beauty, its protective durability... Make it a standby in thousands of American homes. So get it now. Famous Linex, spelled L-I-N dash X. Linex Clear Gloss, the ideal way to protect your floors and woodwork. 
Remember to ask for it at your paint hardware department store, where you'll find all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that dries in one hour. Now back to our story. We left Nick and Patsy trying to find the florist who made the funeral wreath which the killer hung on the door of the man he had just murdered. That's it, Patsy. Just ahead. Uh -huh. I, Silverman. Well, I hope this florist can tell you more than the other four we visited. They didn't know from nothing. I hope this wreath doesn't get worn out before I find out who made it. Yes, what is it? Did this funeral wreath come from your shop? From my shop? Let me see. No, it couldn't be from here. All day yesterday, business was very bad. I sent out not one single order all day. Only two customers. All right, all I'll, the... uh, I'll take your word for it. But how about the day before? Did you send it out then, perhaps? That's not possible, mister. These flowers, they are too fresh. They could not have been picked before yesterday. Or so fresh, they wouldn't be now. You mean the wreath was definite made up yesterday? Sure, mister. Couldn't be before yesterday. The I flowers, see. they are too fresh. Any idea who might have made it up? That I couldn't say, mister. It's a very ordinary piece. Could be anybody made it. Okay, thanks. Uh, come sometime when you want to buy something, maybe, yes, mister? Thanks, I will. Any luck, Nick? No. I did find out the wreath was definitely made yesterday, but that's all. Oh. Well, who's next on the list? Before we visit the next place, I want to call Johnny and ask him what he found. Maybe that'll give us a lead. I found three notices in the Akron police, Nick. Any of them the man we want, Johnny? Well, I, I can't tell. Descriptions are so general, they don't mean much. What are the dates on them? Well, one is dated almost a year ago. One is dated about three months ago, and, and the other is two months ago. I see. Well, not much help there, I'm afraid. And, uh, wait a minute. Two of the men are wanted for murder and robbery, and the other for robbery alone. Okay, Johnny, sit tight. I may need you again. So long. So long, Nick. I gather he didn't find anything that will help us. No, not without some additional evidence. Oh, too bad. Well, we better call on the next florist on our list. That's the only lead we have that's any good. Mr. Schwartz? That is right. Could you tell me if you made this wreath? Did I make it? No, oh, mister, I did not make it. Well, could you tell me who might have made it? Let me look. Hmm, yes. I could not say for certain, mister, but I am in this business a long time, and I think this was not made by florist. Oh? Is that so? Are you sure? Mm, no, I am not sure. But it looks as if it was made by someone who has seen a lot of wreaths like this, but it's not a regular florist. Someone who's seen a lot of wreaths like it, but not a professional florist. Finally, none of the other florists noticed that. They probably were not as experienced in the business as I am. Or they did not look closely enough. I am sure it is not professional. And, well, another thing. These flowers. Yes? Like a book, I know, all the greenhouses around here. And not one of them grows flowers like these. God, I'm sure. Thanks very much. You've told me a lot, Mrs. Schwartz. So long. Goodbye, mister. Any luck this time, Nick? Betsy, I think we've got something. Oh, good. What is it? Find me a telephone. I want to talk to Mr. J. Atherton Osgood of Akron. Walking, sallow-looking man. Thin cheeks. Looked like a cartoon of old man gloom. I see, Mr. Osgood. And you say he left your employ very suddenly? Yes, it was about three months ago. He went home one night and he never showed up again. No word from him at all. That's the man, all right. Thanks very much, Mr. Osgood. Could he help you, Nick? Yes, Patsy. He says he had a man working for him as undertaker's assistant who left him suddenly about three months ago. Huh? And his description of the man agrees with Riley's description of the man who killed Bramwell last night. So what do we do now? Visit some more florists? No, Patsy. We visit some undertakers. <laughs> Why are you so sure the killer works for an undertaker, Nick? It's logical, Patsy. He apparently came to town about three months ago. 
But he started these robberies, as far as we know, only three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Now, what could be more natural than for him to get a job at the trade he knew, Undertaker's assistant? That would give him time to look over the town and decide where he wanted to pull his jobs. And would it also legalize his being in town in case anything came up to question it? Well, we've tried seven Undertakers, and none of them had any nice, fresh assistance. Hope we have better luck at this next one. Why, yes, Mr. Carter, we do have a new assistant, a Mr. Carnes, a very fine man, most efficient. Came here about three months ago, but I'm sure he can't be the man What you does are. he look like? Why, he's about as tall as you are, not nearly as heavily built. His cheeks are thin, and he looks rather like... Like... Old man Gloom? Well, I wouldn't like to say that, but he does. Well, now that you mention it, he does rather resemble that character, yes. I'd like to see him. Why, he's not here today, Mr. Carter. He's home packing his bag. Packing his bag? You mean he's leaving town? Oh, just overnight, that's all. We're shipping one of our late <clears throat> clients to Cleveland. But Mr. Carnes is going with a body to deliver it to relatives there. I see. Well, do you mind telling me where your Mr. Carnes lives? Why, I'm not sure, Mr. Carter. I've never become that friendly with Mr. Great Carnes. Great heavens, man. Surely you know where your own employees live. Oh, but he's not one of my employees, Mr. Carter. I'm not the head of this establishment. Mr. Grayson is. He could tell you, of course. Well, where's Mr. Grayson? I'll ask him. I'm very sorry to say he's not here today. Not here? No, he's been called out into the country no. to supervise a very special... All right, all right. And you say you don't know Carnes' home address? No, I don't. But I believe he lives on Oakmont Terrace, if I remember correctly. Oakmont Terrace? Yes, Mr. Carter, but I don't know the number. I'll find it out. Oh, by the way, this body that Carnes is taking to Cleveland, who got it ready for shipment? Why, our Mr. Carnes did. He came to work early this morning in order to get it ready in time, and now he's... Thanks, that's all I want to know. So long. got a lead on the killer, Nick? I mean just that, Riley. He lives on Oakmont Terrace, but I don't know the number. Now listen, Riley. Meet me at the corner of Oakmont and Danbrew as soon as you can. Okay. I want you to identify the man for me when I find him. I'll be out there in two shakes of a lamb's tail, Nick. I want to get my hands on that guy. I'll give him the worst trip. Yes, I know, I know, Riley, but wait till we catch him first. See you at Oakmont and Danbrew in 20 minutes. Just drive slowly along the street, Patsy. I want to see if I can get any clue to which is Carnes' house. You don't expect to find him sitting on his doorstep, do you, Nick? Hardly, Patsy. But one of the florists I visited gave me an idea. An idea about what? About the flowers and that wreath. He said that... Ah, there. That's the house. My hunch was right. You mean the house where Carnes lives? Yes, I'm sure of it. Why, Nick, how can you tell? By the garden in front of the house. Well, what can... Oh, there's Riley putting around the corner up there. Shall we go meet him? Yes. I want to get this over with as soon as I can. Right. Hey, Nick. What's cooking? Just this, Riley. I feel sure the killer of old man Bramwell lives in that gray bungalow up the street. Huh? I think he's probably in there now. I'm going in and see. You wait outside in case he gets away from me. Oh, but why not let me go in? Because you know him when you see him. I don't. So you wait outside. And you, Patsy, stay down here at the corner, out of the way. But suppose he tries to shoot you, Nick. Wouldn't it be safer to take Riley in? If there's any shooting, Riley can come in and give me a hand. I'll do that, Nick, and happy to get a shot at that rat. Okay, let's get going. Leave your car here, so he won't suspect anything if he should happen to look out the window. Yeah, sure. Hey, well, uh, how'd you happen to get on the track of this mug, Nick? Investigation, Riley. Huh? Investigation and deduction, plus common sense. That don't tell me much. I'll give you the details later. All right, here's the house. Now, remember, stay here unless they're shooting, or unless he gets away from me. Mm-hmm. Then you'll grab him. Right, Nick. And good luck. Well? Mr. Carnes here? Uh, yes, that second door there. Shall I call no. him? No, he's expecting me, thanks. Oh, all right. You can go right in, then. Thanks. 
Hey, what the... Your name Carnes? Yeah, so what? I want to talk to you. Is that any reason for busting into a guy? I mean, is that any reason why you should enter my room without knocking? Why, yes. I was afraid I might not catch you if I lost any time. You seem to be leaving town. I don't know what you have in your mind, but I'm sure I'm not the one you want to see. I don't believe I know you. Well, I know you. You work for Grayson the Undertaker, don't you? And you're leaving town to chaperone a dead body to Cleveland. That's quite correct. I know a lot more, too. I know you killed George Bramwell last night in cold blood and took 3000 in cash and 10000 in jewels from his safe. It was a pretty slick stunt to impersonate a departing undertaker and leave the wreath in the door. Go on, you interest me. But that was where you made your mistake, Carnes. Because a florist told me that wreath wasn't made by a real florist, but by someone who's seen lots of them. So I figured that the killer who might have worked for an undertaker sometime was you. So you picked me out as the culprit. There's another mistake to use that card you picked up in Akron. Gave us a good line on you. Of course, going into the undertaking business here was an excellent idea. From your point of view, gave you a splendid chance to find out where the rich homes were located without attracting attention. Is that all? Not quite. I have a hunch that if we were to pry up the lid of that casket you're going to chaperone out of town, we'd find you'd hidden the loot in there. This is all very entertaining. But so far, you haven't shown any proof that connects this wild story up to me. So I must ask you... How about this, then? That homemade funeral wreath was made of white verbenas. A very uncommon flower around here. And there's a fine bed of verbenas growing in front of this house. The only white verbenas anywhere around here. So put on your hat, Carnes, and we'll go out and let Lieutenant Riley identify you as the man who slugged him last night. You can go to... Oh! 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 Jack! Take... You take better aims, Carnes. You really hope to shoot your way out. You got nothing on me. I was just trying to... Whatever you were trying to do, that shot you fired just now was a signed confession of guilt. Are you all right? Did you, did you get it? Yes, yes. Everything's under control, Riley. There's your killer. Hey, that's the guy, all right. Convicted by his own funeral wreath, which is poetic justice if I ever heard it. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. Here's a suggestion. Give your floors a handsome surface in a jiffy with Linex self-polishing wax. The liquid wax you simply wipe on without rubbing or polishing. Linex self-polishing wax keeps all your floors, wood, tile, and linoleum, looking their shining best. Yet it's so quick to use, and it dries to an elastic, satiny finish that wears amazingly and is unusually resistant to dirt and water. It contains the greatest possible amount of genuine Carnauba wax, with no gum, shellac, or resin to chip or crumble. So get it now, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, to keep your floors beautiful the easy way. If your dealer hasn't yet received his supply of the three great Linex home brighteners, he'll probably have them soon. Ask him to save one or all of them for you. Acme will see that he gets them, and you get them, as quickly as possible. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. How about it, Nick? Have you got something new and exciting for us next week? I think so, Ken. In the courtyard of a new and expensive apartment building, the body of a man was found floating in the lily pool. With a large knife in his back. There was practically nothing to tell us who did it or why. But when I got started on the investigation, I found a very confusing trail that took me all over town in unexpected directions. And led right to the murderer, thanks to a costly mink coat, which unfortunately did not belong to me. But Patsy, you made a nice little sum of money out of that coat, even if it wasn't yours. (laughs) True enough. (laughs) That was some compensation for what I went through. Well, it sounds interesting, Nick. What do you call the story? I call it Death in the Pool. Oh, the mystery of the mink coat. And that's all until next week. So long. So long, everybody. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. We'll be looking forward to seeing you again next week. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled... Death in the Pool. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mink Coat... Nick Carter, Master Detective, is a copyright feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. 
It is presented at this same time and over these same stations by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. In the Nick Carter Adventures, Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Helen Choate is featured as Patsy. Lieutenant Riley is played by Humphrey Davis. Original music is played by Lou White. The programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying, so long until next week. This is Mutual. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond Detective Agency, handy hints on homicide. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Just pick a victim. All right. Got it? Yes. Six of spades. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Helen. Hi. Am I going to see you tonight, Rick? Uh, it depends on how many lights you leave on in the study. But are you coming over? Wouldn't miss it. I've been puckered up since 8 o'clock this morning. Francis has the night off. I'll have dinner for you in by the fire. Well, take it easy. The last time you built a fire, it got so hot I had to keep basting myself for a week. Oh, Rick. Sure. The next day I walked by Linda's and some guy grabbed me and shoved an apple in my mouth. <laughs> Said he'd get fired if I didn't climb back in the window and lie down. Oh, I'll see you tonight. Bye. Bye. Now, let's see. Where did I put the soap? Mr. Diamond? Oh, it depends on what you want him for. If it's the rent, he's being buried over in Jersey this afternoon. My name is Dr. Edward Gerson from Bellevue Hospital. I have nothing to do with the rent. Well, if you're with the Sanity Commission, Diamond's still in Jersey. It is apparent that you are behind in your rent and you wish to remain buried in Jersey for the moment. Well, it's not as bad as it sounds. Are you a potential client? I'm a psychiatrist, Mr. Oh. Uh... Oh, well, pick a good one. How about Apple Knocker? All right. I'm in a rather peculiar position, Mr. Apple Knocker. Oh, I don't know. I always sit like that. <laughs> for the past four days, I've been treating a young man for an unusual type of shock. What did he do? Run his electric crane in the bathtub? <laughs> You're quite an interesting case yourself. Are you always so unconcerned when someone comes to you with a problem? Look, doctor, everybody's got a problem. That's why I'm in business. If you've got a big one, you'll get by uh, my little remarks, and I'll be glad to see what I can do for you. Quite a philosophy. All right, then. Let's both get down to business, Mr. Apple Knocker. Oh, now, uh, what's your trouble? This boy I mentioned, he disappeared five days ago. Hmm? You said you'd been treating him for four days. He couldn't have been gone very long. A day and a night. Hmm. He was found the next morning wandering through the Bowery. Unable to speak, unable to understand anything. I see. Someone took him to Bellevue. Luckily, the family's private physician is also on the staff at Bellevue. He saw the boy and called the family immediately. And you've been treating him ever since? Yes. Last night, the boy began to talk, make reasonable sense. Now, this would continue for perhaps a few hours, then he would lapse into a complete state of confusion. Each time, he was given a sedative, and each time, as the sedative wore off, he talked for a while... Knew who he was, start to tell about the missing night, and then lapse once more into this state of, well, confusion. Hmm. And you think something happened during this missing night, and he doesn't want to remember it. Correct. Did you ever study psychology? Uh, every day, Doctor. I get enough screwy cases in here to make your clientele look like a bunch of Einsteins. And now stop unlocking my mind. There's a draft. <laughs> well, as you said, this boy won't let himself remember something that happened on that missing night. He'll talk about everything up to that point, but the minute he reaches it... Yeah, he jumps the tracks. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, what do you want me to do? You uh, know what I want you to do, Mr. Diamond. Okay, okay. Now, here's one that will throw you. You know what I want you to do? <laughs> the boy's family is quite willing to meet any expense that you feel is necessary. Oh, remind me not to take you on a double date. <laughs> if I don't discover what happened to this boy on the night in question, I'm afraid he might lose his mind permanently. These periods of confusion are becoming more frequent, and sooner or later, 
he won't be able to distinguish between the real and the unreal. I'm going to put him under narcosynthesis this evening, and I'd like you to be present. All right, Doctor. What's the boy's name? William Carter. Be at Bellevue at 8 o'clock and ask for me. The boy's family will be there also, and you can tell them about your fee. Now, uh, just give me a quick answer and leave my motives alone. Is his family wealthy? Quite. Then I'll see you at 8 o'clock, Dr. Gerson. You uh, would have anyway. Goodbye, Mr. Applenocker. You know, you can feel pretty silly when a guy like that walks in and answers all your questions before you got time to think them up. Anyway, I remembered my dinner date with Helen and put in a fast call to the little redhead. She was unhappy, naturally, but she said something about me holding the pucker and to drop around whenever I had the time. At 8 o'clock, I was standing in the long hall at the Bellevue Hospital. Dr. Murray, report to the second floor desk, please. Dr. Murray, to the second floor desk. Good evening, Mr. Diamond. Oh, uh, hello, Dr. Gerson. What's the matter? Dr. You're looking Hacker, a little nervous. Please, the hospitals bother me. That's very Dr. interesting. Hacker, please, the family please, please. is at the end of the hall. Let's go down. Uh, tell me, Doctor, just what exactly happens when you put William Carter under this narcosynthesis? It's an intravenous injection. It unlocks those little doors in the back of his mind. Gets him to talk. You'll see. It's really very amazing. <laughs> right here. Oh, good evening, Doctor. Mrs. Carter. How's the boy? Uh, not much change. This is Mr. Diamond, Mr. and Mrs. Carter. How do you How do? How do you do? How do you do? Uh, Mrs. Carter, uh, Dr. Gerson wants me to find out what happened to your son the night he was missing. Have you any idea? He said he had a date. When I asked him who it was, he wouldn't tell me. That's all we know. I think William will be able to recreate what happened for you, Mr. Diamond. Now I'll leave you to discuss uh, business. And when you are through, stop at the desk. We'll show you where I am. Well, I... <laughs> well, I, I... Yes, Mr. Diamond. What is your fee? Oh, thank you. Believe me. A uh, hundred a day in expenses. And uh, your retainer? One day's work. Mr. Diamond, can you help our boy? Uh, Mrs. Carter, I, I don't really know. I'll write you a check. Oh, thanks, thanks. Mrs. Carter, uh, whatever it is that's strong enough to make your son jump his, uh, uh, lose his memory, it might you be... You think maybe it's something bad? Well, I know it's something bad. How bad? I, I've got to find out. I hope it's not uh, more serious than I think. Oh, yes, I know. Here you are, Mr. Diamond. Oh, thanks. I'll keep in touch. <laughs> I left the Carters with that lousy feeling in my stomach. I looked at the check. Two hundred bucks. For what? Maybe a down payment on a man's sanity. Maybe not. William Carter could have done a lot of things that missing night. Maybe that two hundred bucks was going to be a mortgage on murder. I went down to the desk and an intern showed me downstairs to a small room with one desk lamp in the corner. I'm glad you didn't take too long. The patient will be down in a minute. Oh, uh, isn't this a little irregular, Doctor? I mean, uh, uh, oh, me listening in on a man's secrets? If he's done something against the law, I want you to find out whether it really happened. Well, if he tells you about it, it must have happened. He might have thought it happened. I can't take the chance. If he's committed some sort of a crime, I don't think I'll be able to do much for him. Now, I want you to sit behind that screen there and be perfectly quiet. Sure. Comfortable? Oh, yes, yes. The needle can't reach this far. Uh, this uh, should be quite interesting for you, Diamond, particularly in your kind of work. Uh, you can find out about uh, anything you want with this stuff, can't you, Doctor? If it's a recent shock, why? Oh, I was just thinking about a little blonde I know. Now, here he is. Uh, Roll him right uh, over here. Uh, oh. Now, lift him over on the bed. Uh, oh. It's all right, William. Everything is going fine. All right, thank you, nurse. How do you feel, William? Can you understand me? Say it again. Say it again. Can you understand me, William? Yes. Yes, yes, but keep talking. Say anything. Just, just make my mind stop jumping around. Sure. Uh, it's nice in this hospital, isn't it? Huh? It's nice in this hospital. Yeah. Oh, what's the matter with me? Just be quiet. Think about lying in a boat under the warm sun. 
Lying in a boat. Lying in a boat. Lying in a boat. Uh huh. Just lying in the sun, rocking back and forth. What are you going to do? This won't hurt. You're going to have a nice long sleep. Oh yeah, please, please. I want to sleep. There. Now start counting. Do what? Do what? Tell me again. Start counting. One. One. Two. Two. You're doing fine. Keep counting. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. I sat behind the screen and listened to the doctor begin. At the start, Carter seemed almost glad to talk about it. He described the beginning of the evening. He had a date. A girl named Helena on 53 East 51st Street. Did you have a good time with Helena? Wonderful time. We went dancing. Where did you He go kept dancing? talking all about the evening. Uh, they danced and drank. We went to a little... The doctor kept digging, working at it, really? looking for every little detail. After you got through dancing... We went to her apartment. We uh, had some more drinks. Pretty strong ones. Who made them? What? Who made the drinks? Helena did. Then he came in. Who came in? He did. The man. The man? The man just came into Helena's apartment. Who are you? Helena, who is this guy? What are you doing here, William? What are you doing? What do you want? Get out. Get out. I don't care who you are. I'm not going to get out, William. I don't believe it. You're not her husband. Stop it. Take your hands off her. He's hurting Helena. Yes. I'll fix you. Helena needs help. There. You hit him. Yeah. Gotta get out of here. Why do you? I gotta... I gotta get out. He's dead. I killed him. Well, Diamond, did you hear enough? Yeah. It's up to you. Find out if he really did it. Okay. Thank you. For what? Well, according to William Carter, he'd gone to a girl's apartment, the husband had come in, and he'd killed him. Cases like that don't make me a happy gumshoe, but I had a $200 retainer in my pocket, so I had to keep going. My first stop was the 5th Precinct Police Station and Lieutenant Walt Levinson. When I walked into the squad room, I spotted Sergeant Otis tying a square knot in his shoelace. I'll be right with you, gumshoe. Hey, Otis, what happens when you break one of those shoelaces? Oh, what do you think happens? I get a new one. For those shoes? What do you use, the mooring line off of the Queen Mary? Oh, uh, why don't you lay off? I thought we was pals. Is the lieutenant in? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Otis, if your shoes wear out, why don't you do like the Dutch do? Oh, what's that? Wear wooden ones. Just go out and rent yourself a couple of rowboats. Oh. Hello, Walt. Good evening, Mr. Diamond, and thank you for stopping by so late. Well, now, what do you mean? You've got some horrible scheme up your sleeve, but I don't have to play straight, man. I'm off duty in exactly three minutes. It'll take two. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I want a list of DOAs for the night of November 12th. What's the matter? Can't you find a little old corpse all by your lonesome? Oh, shut up. Uh, does the police department have to furnish you with one? Well, if you just cooperate, sassy, you'll be out of here in two minutes. Here. Now, oh, thanks. Well, hmm, three of them, huh? If that's what it says, why, is the one we haven't found? Two women and a man. Yeah, the man's my department, homicide. Mm. Herbert Fisher, found in his wife's apartment on 51st Street, married to Helena Fisher. Hmm, what about Helena, Walt? We're still looking for her. Neighbors say she and her husband hadn't been living together for several months. The old boy must have come home, found her with another guy, and got heated up. Either the wife or the other guy killed him. Huh? How do you know there was another guy? Well, the neighbors say a young guy started seeing her about a week before. Came up with her that night. We haven't a line on him yet, but we're checking. What killed him? Poker from the fireplace. Beaten over the head. Oh. No prints? Nope. Clean as a whistle. Say, what's with you? What are you so interested in this killing for? Oh, I just like to hear about crimes. Oh, now stop that. If you know something... I do know something, Walt. Yeah, what? One word. Will it help me solve this case? 
I don't know. Well, what is it? Bye. I left the precinct and headed back to Bellevue and Dr. Gerson. I had a hunch that was growing roots, and if William Carter's sanity was going to be saved, it would have to be done in a hurry. Up till now, only four people knew who was in that apartment when Fisher was killed. Myself, a missing girl named Helena, the potential killer, William Carter, and the good doctor. The girl hasn't gone to the police? Why, if William Carter did it? Well, that's what I've been asking myself all the way down here, Doctor. Unless she wants to protect him. That's the only one I could come up with. I want to ask you two questions, Doctor. First, do you think William Carter would pick up a poker and beat a man on the head? That's hard to say. He might. Would he then wipe his fingerprints off? According to what he told me, he killed the man and rushed immediately from the apartment. I'd say no to the fingerprints. Mm, That's what I'd say. He suffered the shock immediately after he killed the man. He knew he had to get out, but after that, he can't remember a thing. May I use your phone? Certainly. Doctor, how could Carter be sure that he'd killed the man? Why, I don't know. If you remember, he didn't say. He just said he'd killed him. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. I thought you were going home. I got to sit up with a headache. Oh, well, I want some information. Where did the murdered man live if he wasn't staying with his wife? Oh, now, wait a minute. We know who did it. Hmm? You do? Sure. Some guy named Carter. William Carter. I sent some of the boys over to his house ten minutes ago. Now, how do you know he did it? Because Helena Fisher walked into the station and told us so. You've got the girl? Yeah, we're holding her till we pick up the Carter guy. Seems Carter was in her apartment with her. I know the story. You do? You do? I'll be right down. Well, they've got Helena, Doctor. She says William Carter killed her husband. Yes, I heard. Well, I'm afraid I can't do much for him now. I think you can. There's one thing that smells too rotten to make sense. Why did William Carter take enough time to wipe off those fingerprints? Because he didn't want to be discovered. Well, if he didn't want anyone to know he did it, why didn't he kill the girl? Oh, good Lord, I never thought of that. I got an idea. And it may mean you bending the law a little, Doctor, but it might save William Carter. What do you want me to do, Mr. Diamond? Is there any way you can find out from Carter exactly what he did after he struck the man? Of course. When he comes out of his sleep, he'll be able to talk about it. Can he be moved? Well, yes, if it's necessary. Then get him out of here. Take him somewhere. Even if his family covers for him, it's just a matter of time until Lieutenant Levinson finds out he was picked up and put in here. Oh, this is extremely dangerous. Look, if he believes he killed this guy, the girl's story will hold water. The only way that I can see to make him snap out of it is to prove to him that he really didn't kill anybody. That's right. Uh, don't you think he did kill that man? Uh, maybe, but I doubt it. Can he walk? Yes. Good. Take him down to my office. Here's the key. Stay there until you hear from me. You know, I, I like you, Diamond, and I respect you, but this is... You want to save the boy's life? Of course. Then get him down to my office. <laughs> the hospital and grabbed a cab back to the 5th precinct. Sometimes when things don't add up like ABC, you've got to go out into left field for the answer. Everything pointed to William Carter and he believed it himself, but I kept thinking about those fingerprints. I told Walt my idea. Are you crazy? So the guy did wipe off the fence but didn't kill the girl. What of it? People do crazy things the first time they knock somebody off. Besides, you can't go around posing as a police sergeant. Oh, now stop that, Walt. Admit it. There's a hole someplace. But you told me yourself the Carter guy admits killing the girl's husband. In his condition, he'd admit anything. He says he did it. The girl says he did it. What more do you want? I don't want any doubts at all. Will you just try the idea? If you'll tell me where you've got William Carter. Promise not to have the boys there? Just you? Yes, yes, I get me. He's in my office. Wouldn't you know it? Okay, Walt. Get the girl in here and tell her just what I told you. I don't need any rehearsals. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Send Mrs. Fisher in here. Right. I hope you know what you're doing. You're putting me in an awful spot. Well, if it works, Walt, the state won't burn an innocent man. Yes, but this... Uh, Mrs. Fisher, Lieutenant. Oh, come in, Mrs. Fisher. Thank you, Lieutenant. Sit down. This is Sergeant Diamond. Oh, Oh, how do you do, Sergeant Diamond? Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Fisher? We've checked your story and everything seems to be all right. You can go home, but please don't leave town. Uh, I'm terribly sorry about this. I, I know I should have told you sooner, but William was... Well, I, I didn't know what to do. You did the right thing. Have you found William yet? No, but we will. But didn't you check his house? Isn't he with his family? No, he didn't come home at all. Oh, and that reminds me. You know, you're the only witness who can prove he did kill your husband. Oh, 
Why, yes, I guess I am. Well, I'd be extremely careful. He just might, uh... You can't. You don't think he might try and, and kill me, too? Well, you never know. After a man kills once and he's got time to think about it, he's liable to do anything. Well, then, I, I demand police protection. And you'll get it. Sergeant Diamond here has been assigned to the case. Oh, how nice. I'll do as much as I possibly can. Well, when do you start? Right now. I'll meet you out in the squad room right after I have a few words with the lieutenant. All right, Sergeant. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant. Perfectly all right. This is ridiculous. All right, all right. You get over to my office and pick up William Carter and the doctor. I'll stall Mrs. Fisher. Take her to a bar or something. All right. But if the commission hears about this, Sergeant Otis will be the new head of homicide. This is nice, Sergeant Diamond. Do you always guard people like this? Just the pretty ones. Oh, thank you. If you really think William might try to harm me, you'll have to stick pretty close, won't you? Mm-hmm. Do you mind? Not at all. What time is it? Uh, 11.30. Getting tired? Yes, a little. It, it's been a hard day. I'll bet it has. What if William comes to my place in the middle of the night? Where will you be? Watching the front door, baby. He won't get in. Watching the door... From inside or outside? Outside, baby. Sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so am I. Uh, here's my apartment, Rick. Oh, well, nice place. I don't like it very much since... Look, couldn't I stay in a hotel? Oh, no. Too many ways for a killer to get in. But do you really think William might try and, and get me? What's he hiding out for? Well, he, he could be scared. All the more reason. Men like that don't hide out for a week if they're going to give themselves up. And if William isn't going to give himself up, he'll probably try to get rid of the one person who knows he did the killing. But William isn't like that. He wouldn't... Uh, wouldn't what? Oh, I was just going to say he wouldn't kill anybody. But he did. He knows he did. Yes. Well, I'm going out in front and check the building. I'll, I'll be back. Oh, do you have to go? That's a good idea. You just take it easy. But, but, but William has a key. Oh, well, then you better give me one, too. I'll be right out in front. Oh, all right, here. Uh, don't be too long, Rick. I can't stand this place long if I'm alone. Sure, baby. Yeah, yeah, I spotted you when you drove up. Hello, Doctor. I hope your plan works, Diamond. Yeah. Well, hello, William. He can't hear you. I put him into a deep sleep. He'll only answer my voice. There's only one way that we can get him into that apartment. Well, let's go. Mrs. Fisher is scared to step. William? Yes? Get out of the car. Uh, come on, Walter. You've got to be there to hear it. We solved this one. I'll never tell anyone how. Let's go. Come with me, William. Now, William, remember, you are to go up to Helena's apartment and go in. Uh, here's a key, Doctor. Do you understand, William? I am to go up to Helena's apartment and go in. Here's the key. Use the key to let yourself in. The key to let myself in. When you're in, close the door and stand in front of it. And that's all. All right, Mr. Diamond. Here we go. Four of us went in through the front door and Dr. Gerson briefed William once more. Then we led him up the stairs and up to Helena Fisher's apartment. I could hear her humming as soon as William tried the key. We all ducked. Who's there? Rick? Answer me, who's there? <gasps> William! What do you want? William, what are you doing here? William, say something. Don't just stand there. Oh, you, you... You've got to get out. The police are looking for you. There's one downstairs right now. Well, say something. Stop scaring. William, get away from that door. Please, William, please, please. I... I, I know what you want, William. I, I won't tell anyone. William, say something. Don't look at me like that. Get, get 
You're going to kill me, aren't you? Look, William, you didn't do it. I killed him. I just told you he was dead after you hit him. When you left, I killed him with a poker. Will you please? All right, Helena. <laughs> oh, he was going to kill me. <laughs> oh, sure. Like he killed your husband. <laughs> How's William, Doctor? I'll wake him up when he gets back to the hospital. He'll be all right when he reads Mrs. Fisher's confession. <laughs> What's going on here? You better go along with the lieutenant, baby. Why? He heard your whole confession from outside the door. What? Why, I, I, I just said he was going to kill me. Also, we found some of your fingerprints on the poker. You're crazy. I wiped them off. <gasps> uh, she's all yours, Walt. Let's go, Mrs. Fisher. You tricked me. You tricked me into saying that. Come on, lady. I don't want to get rough. Oh, can you too? I'll... <laughs> I think you can take her along now, Lieutenant. <laughs> Holy cow. Why, Doctor. Well, I've never hit a woman before, but this one made me very unhappy. Well, you're a good doctor, uh, Doctor, but you're certainly no gentleman. You should have kicked her. kept you out so late. It's after midnight. Oh, I had to stick around and watch Otis turn into a pumpkin. Now, that's Cinderella. Yeah. Can you imagine Sergeant Otis as Cinderella? The good prince would slip his sacrum trying to haul his slipper around. Tell me a fairy story, Rick. Well, once upon a time, there were two idiots. Rick. And they lived happily ever after. Sing. Don't like it? Sing. I liked it. Sing. I'll do as I please. Rick. I love those dear hearts and gentle people who live in my hometown. Because those dear hearts and gentle people will never ever let you down. They read the good book from Friday till Monday. That's how the weekend goes. I've got a dream house I'll build there one day With picket fence and rambling rows I feel so welcome Each time that I return That my happy little heart Keeps laughing like a clown I love the dear hearts And gentle people Who live and love in my hometown well, how was that, honey? Well, Harold Applenocker, where'd you pick up that there song? From my hometown, Mountain View, back up in the hills of Arkansas. Oh, well, that sure was mighty fine. Well, Lula Bell, I'm glad you liked it. Mind if I bust you up with another eight bar? Nope. Bust away. I love the dear heart and gentle people who live in love in my hometown. da 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 <laughs> yeah, I think I did pretty fine, that air strong. Oh, yes, sir. You done busted me up right proper. Oh, you ought to come over to Mountain View sometime, little Bell. Got dear hearts and gentle people all over the place. Oh, I'd like to make the trip. Oh, you'd love the people. You'd love to see them, love to greet them. How would you greet them, little Bell? How would you greet them? What would you say? Howdy. Oh, they love you, little Bell. <laughs> have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Joan Banks, Sam Edwards, and Norman Field. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC Sunday? 
There's a full evening of great entertainment in store for you tomorrow on NBC. You'll hear rib-tickling comedy on the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. And for mystery, there's Sam Spade's latest caper. Tomorrow, Sam meets a Mr. Tom Turkey. For the very best radio fare, always tune to NBC. Coming up, it's Brian Donlevy and Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. Yellen Camps present Pat Novak for Hire. Cinderella lost a shoe and so she got a maid. The modern miss has learned from this in Gallon Camp Shoe Raid. Four miles to a Gallon Camp. Yes, Gallon Camps, the family shoe stores with the yellow fronts, the largest shoe chain in the West with stores from Canada to Mexico to serve the West. G-A-L-L-E-N-K-A-M-P-S, Gallon Camps present Pat Novak for Hire. the sign out in front of my office says Pat Novak for hire down on the waterfront in San Francisco you don't get prizes for being subtle if you want to make a living down here you got to get your hand in the till any way you can you rob Peter to pay Paul and then you put it on the cuff it's a happy life if you don't mind looking up at a headstone because sooner or later you draw trouble a size too big I found that out Tuesday night it was about 11 o'clock when I came out of the office and I started down the waterfront it was raining, and the street was as deserted as a warm bottle of beer. As I got near the corner, an old man stepped out of the darkness and started across the street. It was a short trip because the car started up down the street, and the old man couldn't have made it with a pocket full of aces. Well, I started over to him. The car slowed down for a moment and then turned the corner and disappeared. As it passed under the street light, I caught a glimpse of the license plate in a dull, surprised way, the way you'd grab a feather out of an angel's wing. I bent over the old man and I rolled him on his back. He was breathing hard as I cushioned his head. Please help me. Can you please help me? Well, that's a big order, mister. Uh, I must talk to you. Well, if you got any good quotes, you better get them off your chest fast. My pocket. Inside my pocket. You please put your hand... In here? Yeah. Sure. Two envelopes. What about them? One is money for you. You have the other one. So far. The other one, please keep sealed. And you will give it to John St. John. John St. John? Yeah. Well, where does he live? You don't understand. It's not... I want to tell you... You don't understand. Well, he was right on that one. I didn't understand a thing except he slipped out of my arms and stopped paying taxes. I dragged him over to the side and I went through his stuff. There was nothing there, no identification, just a card with an address on the other side of town. I opened the envelope and $300 tumbled into my breast pocket. The other one was sealed. There was no name on it, but up in the corner there was some kind of marking. It looked like two crosses spliced together. There wasn't anything I could do for him except pray and... I owe some back dues, so I went over to my office and called police headquarters. I told him where the old man was, and then I checked in the phone book. There was no John St. John listed. Well, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. A good guy, but to him, a hangover is the price of being sober. I finally found him singing in a Mason Street bar. Dinky, dinky, Derbyshire, dinky, dinky, day. Jocko, fine Jocko, I want to talk to you. Ah, Patsy, you're just in time for the counterpoint. I'm singing a song, a little sentimental thing from my childhood. It'll keep. I got a problem, Jocko. You'll always have a problem, Patsy, because you can't keep out of trouble. You know that, don't you? You have no self-control. Yeah, all right, Jocko. You all have right. no more self-control than a bucket of mercury dumped in a marble staircase. All right, Jocko, check the bright talk. I just saw a guy get killed. Uh, you're like some violent disorder in nature. Some large but unprofitable storm. Yeah. You keep whirling in circles, Patsy. 
And if you ever go more than ten feet in one direction, it's because some woman is nine feet away. Yeah. Then it begins all over again. Are you all through? Yes. Get to the point. That's another of your troubles. You never get to the point. Some old guy was killed down on the Embarcadero. He checked out 50 feet away from me. Who killed him? I don't know. Then why do you care? Professional jealousy? Some car came out of nowhere and clipped him. You sure it wasn't an accident? Yeah, just like the fall of France. Will you stop kneeling me, Jocko? I told you the guy got killed. He was murdered right in front of me. I gotta find a guy called John St. John. How St. John? John St. John. I don't feel like vaudeville tonight, Jocko. The old man gave me $300 to deliver a letter. I made him a promise. Well, you can break it now with only the slightest risk. I got the license number of the car. I want you to hop down and look it up. Then check at headquarters to see if the guy's got a record. I don't like policemen. They depress me. Check it. I gotta go out here to this address. Here. Uh-huh. Well, what kind of neighborhood is it? Well, it's not exactly a neighborhood. It's more like an architectural afterthought, a lingering defense against the early California bear. All right, all right, no speeches. Just check on that license plate. Now, if I'm not at my place, try this address here. Yes, that's always very interesting at this time of night. Uh, goodbye, lover. <laughs> Well, Jocko was right about the neighborhood. When I left him, I doubled by my place and I left the envelope. I put it in another envelope and stashed it behind some books. Then I headed out to look up John St. John. It must have been about midnight when I got there, and it was the kind of a neighborhood where a for rent sign reads like a ransom note. I found the place, though. It was an old rooming house, a third floor apartment. I knocked at the door, and when she opened it, I knew it was time to wire home for money. If they pick a Miss Blowtorch of 1946, she'll be right up there in the running. A tall, blonde blister with lots of Fahrenheit. She stood there leaning against the door, smiling and looking at you as if you had gold-plated muscles. Gave you a weak feeling where your dinner ought to be. And her voice came right out of the oven. Well, you're out kind of late. Yeah. I'm looking for a guy named John St. John. Oh? Won't you come into my cobweb? Sure. For a spider, you're nice and chubby. Well... A Spider-Man. My name's Lee Norton. You want to write it down? Hmm. I'm Pat Novak, and I'm looking for a guy named John St. John. You seem to be running a temperature on the subject. I don't know a John St. John. Well, I found a dead man lugging around your address. Why? I don't know. Perhaps he admired me from afar. Like a sunset or something. No, he stopped admiring sunsets about 20 years ago. I see. What are you, the avenging angel? He gave me a sealed envelope. And you were supposed to give it to a man named John St. John. That's huh? right. He gave me 300 bucks to ease the pain. Yeah, I figured that. You don't look like the charitable type. He was a nice old guy, so I'm going to find his boy. Perhaps I could help you. You got a clear, fast track. Let's see you go. I told you I don't know John St. John, but I'll do this much. Yeah, I know. You're going to be big-hearted and offer to take that letter just in case you ever meet someone named John St. John. Huh? How did you pay the rent this month? Keep the kettle on. I'll only be a moment. Hello, Lee. If we're early, just give us a magazine. No. Come on in. Thank you. Well, just enough for bridge. You're right. You're only gone a moment. Who are your friends? Don't suck. Did they lock the manhole before they left home? His name's Novak. Yeah, that's a pretty name. Don't rhyme with anything, but it's pretty, huh, Joe? Yeah, it's all right. Let's have the letter, Novak. You got hold of a bad rumor, fella. Uh, the one I got's good. Let's have it. I don't want to strain your mind, Junior, but try to understand. I don't have a letter. Ask him again. Come on home, mister. You're not going to get anything out of me except a small tip. Now, if you're a good boy, I'll give you a nickel for your friend, too. All right, Joe. Now, <laughs> uh, hold him up. Yeah. Just a minute. He's got a head of hair. Hold him up. <clears throat> All right. All right, Mike. That's enough. Oh. Well, that's enough. All right, baby. Don't look so sorry. You can't have everything. <laughs> We'll be back to Pat Novak in just a moment. Have you ever worn uncomfortable shoes? Perhaps the size was wrong or the shoe was the wrong shape for your foot. But no matter why, there's nothing more uncomfortable than shoes that don't fit. The more you're on your feet, the more you know it. Gallon Camp specialize in properly fitting shoes for the whole family, right from the toddler's first important step. And Gallon Camp's good shoes are built to give support to active feet. Listen to an authority on shoes. He's Mr. John F. Stahl, 64 years young, a retired postman with a hobby. You guessed it, he likes to walk. 
He says, I've been on my feet most of my life. Since 1935, when I retired as a letter carrier, I walked 10,000 miles. I just walked to San Francisco from Trinity Center, California. That was 410 miles. Walking is fun, but take it from me, you must have good shoes. That's why I stick to gallon camps. Gallon camps are good shoes. And there you have it from a man who knows. Gallon camps are good shoes. That's why Gallon Camps are the West's favorite shoes, and Gallon Camps' tremendous volume makes possible Gallon Camps' reasonable prices. For style, for quality, for reasonable price, for good shoes for the entire family, visit the stores with the yellow fronts. Mr. Stahl walked 410 miles to shop at Gallon Camps, but there's a store in your neighborhood. And now back to Pat Novak for Hire. You know, it's easy to sleep if you got the right friends. When those two gunoffs were through, I hit the floor and made Rip Van Winkle look like an insomnia victim. I didn't like the floor, but it was in better shape than my face. I don't know how long I was there, but it must have been a couple of hours. I rolled over once and tried to get up, but it was like trying to barbecue a cake of ice. There was a sick, sweet smell in the room. I tried to place it, but my nose was out on strike, so I went to sleep again. The next thing I knew, it sounded like New Year's Eve. <laughs> Here you go, Patsy. Up on the couch. <coughs> What's the matter? Nothing. If you're a kitchen stove, the room's full of gas. Oh, some of my playmates, I guess. Well, you weren't at the apartment, so I tried here. Yeah? What time is it? Two o'clock. Who got the quaint idea of the gas chamber? A girlfriend. It was love at first sight. Did she get the letter? I left it home. Yeah, getting smart. Yeah, $300 worth. They lifted my dough. Uh, you couldn't use it where you were going. I uh, checked on that hit-and-run car. It's listed under the name of Sidney Bronson. Has he got a record? No. Well, everybody's a beginner. Well, let's go home. It'll be dull, but you'll get used to it. <laughs> Wait till I wash my hands. Sure. Hey, Patsy. Yeah? What did your girlfriend look like? Was she the lively type? Yeah. Why? What's the matter? Because she's not anymore. Yeah. Those gunsels play rough. She's kind of pretty. What did she do besides send out vibrations? I don't know. But she knew all about John St. John. Yeah? She picked up a bait like a hungry bass. Also, look at that ring. How did you get around to that? The insignia on it. It's the same one that's on the envelope. Spliced crosses. Let's go home, Patsy. The police will be here. Yeah. Even Hellman will know she's dead. Come on, we bet. On your way out the door, Jocko, try it sideways because I think it's blocked. Hello, Novak. You look pale. It's my color scheme. What do you care, Hellman? None. She looks peaceful. Yeah. Be quiet or you'll wake her up. Oh, tiptoe. She always cut her throat before she goes to sleep. Who is she, Novak? I don't know. It's awful cozy here for a bunch of perfect strangers. I don't know every dead girl in town, Hellman. You'll have to check. You can still write, can't you, Novak? Huh? That's all you'll need down at headquarters. Come on. Get out of the haze, Hellman. You don't know who's dead yet, but you're going to book somebody. Yeah. What are you doing up here, praising the joint? I came up to find a guy named John St. John. She doesn't look like a guy named John St. John. She was my lead. I came up here to smell out a rat. She had a half Nelson on me when two gunsels walked in. They came up to fix the gas meter, I think. You stay out of this. I'll make every effort. Now, if you're smart, you'll fingerprint this place, Hellman. Those boys were cute. They've been in somebody's jail. I'll handle my job. You stick to murder. It'll go a long way to pin this on me, Hellman. I can go a long way, Novak. Not with what you got to drag. We get a call in the middle of the night, come up here and find you standing over that dead girl. That's right. And you want me to sprinkle powder all over. Back up and take a better look, Novak. The view's fine, Hellman. And if you'll take a good look, you'll know why. You haven't got anything to give the DA except a slim lead and a fat hand. You're going to need help. Not on this one. You need help to find the street. Come on back to center, Hellman. Even with both hands, you couldn't... Yeah. Oh, forget it. So take the medicine like a good boy. I'm not going to walk out and let the two of you tour the town. I'm going to book one or both of you on a murder charge. All right. Book Jocko here, then. 
I love you in a generous mood. You got a string then, Hellman. Somebody's got to find John St. John. Yeah, who's going to find Jocko? Stop worrying. I'll bail you out. You haven't got the right size heart, Novak. You'll let him die on the vine. Helen, sometimes you're guilty of unexpected wisdom. I know it's reflex action, but it's consoling anyway. I want you, Novak. I want you bad. I'll take this guy as a down payment, but I'm going to close out with you. Remember that. I will. All right. Come on, mister. Wait a minute. Patsy, you're not going to let him lug me off like this. What else can I do? The guy likes you. Now, it was a bum curve to throw Jocko, but somebody had to dig us out of a hole, and Jocko wasn't the boy. You can't shovel dirt with a bar rag. I had no idea where to start. There were two murders, and they were both tied up with John St. John. He didn't look like a good guy to know. There was that insignia, too. The one on the letter... And the girl's ring. Oh, sure, it could be coincidence, but that's what they said about Bluebeard. The only thing I could do was open that letter. So I went back to the apartment. I didn't have to turn on the light. They were running in pairs tonight. She was sitting there on the couch, proud of a pair of long, silk legs and smiling like a guy who knows he's got a million bucks in the bank. She was blonde, too. A little more lemon juice, maybe, but blonde anyway. She was nice and comfortable, and I got the idea she'd just signed a lease. Good evening. How do you do? Not very well so far. A sly remark, Mr. Novak? No, I'm just bringing you up to date. Your girlfriend's dead. Yes? Yeah. I just want to let you know the gas jet's out in the kitchen. Oh, don't shout. I'd like you better if you could. I don't need your vote. Who's John St. John? I don't know John St. John. Is he worth breaking your heart over? There's a good guy down in the clink sweating out a murder rap for me, so I want John St. John. Mm, you've got nice friends. Who's Sidney Bronson? How does that fit into the picture? This started with a waterfront corpse. The leftovers belong to an old guy that was hit by a car. The car's registered in the name of Sidney Bronson. Mr. Novak, you seem so intense. It's a pity to waste it on random speculation. I told you. I got a friend in the jug. Mm, loyalty's a nice trait. One of your nicest. Yeah. You're a pretty thing, Patsy. Well, don't get fooled by the rapper. I'll take a chair. Anybody ever brief you on trouble? You're hard to see that far away. Come on over and focus, Patsy. Yeah. You're pretty, Patsy. You look like you want a bill of sale. I'm the gentle kind, Novak. I'd just like to break your ribs. Go ahead. I can get a brace. Come here. Hmm. Mr. Novak, I'll bet you do a swell rumba. Yeah? What's on your mind? What you're going to say when you find out about this gun. Huh? That's right, sweetheart. My finger isn't hollow. Back up and take a look at the gun. Hmm. Well, you got to that purse, huh? That's right. Well, you've ruined my confidence. Now, I'll give you a testimonial. In the meantime, I want the letter. You go after everything the same way. I want the letter. Mm -hmm. It's in the desk. Come on. Right here in the top drawer. <clears throat> oh, let go. Stay away from me. I'm already here, lady. <laughs> Come on, all right. Drop the gun, sis. Drop it. Well, you can let go of my arms now. Well, that's your version. Let, let go of me. Let go of me. I... Oh. What was that for? A little something on the house, and I'll beat it. Well, you've ruined my confidence. You're lucky. Go on home. You won't change your mind about that letter? No. Well, suit yourself. I'll be going. Oh, Patsy. Yeah? I can't help you on John St. John, but I wouldn't worry about that fellow, Sidney Bronson. Huh? Why? Because I'm Sidney Bronson. See you soon. Dad began to look like a big, fat, well-fed double cross. I had to find out what was in that letter, so I made tracks for the bookcase. All I could do was browse because the letter was gone. Well, things didn't look rosy for me or Jocko. I was about to buy a file and bake a cake when the phone rang. Hello, Novak. Oh, Hellman. The coroner got a report on that dead girl. She died at 12.30. Well, that's pretty close. What's he got? A stopwatch? Fifteen minutes either way. Those fingerprints panned out, too. Yeah? A couple of L.A. strong-arm men. Well, that's new for L.A., you got a call out? We already picked them up. Your favorite's name, Welcome Dangleers. Well, I could make a joke. I already got one. 
They're set up with a perfect alibi for 12.30. That means I killed the girl. Nobody's arguing. I got some more news. Yeah? I'm out at the Seal Rocks. Well, you've got the figure for it. I just found an envelope floating around the water. It's one of yours. You better come on out. You found an envelope? So what? So the envelope turns out to be in some guy's pocket. Come on out. <laughs> Well, that only meant one thing. Whoever took the envelope out of my place got popular. It was getting late, so I grabbed a cab and rode out to the beach. When I got there, Hellman was standing down in the water. He had Jocko with him. The surf was rolling in, and Jocko wasn't much better. Hello, Patsy. Hello, Jocko. How's jail? Dry. Thanks for coming, Novak. You're sweet. Where's the envelope? Here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the same one. That makes you look good. There was a letter in here. Did you take that with the guy's money, Hellman? You got all there is. Hmm. This guy on the beach is the third one. It's my opinion the case will solve itself. We're running out of people. Who is the guy? His name's Walter Avery. Here's his stuff. Yeah, what's left? Well, the spliced cross really gets around. Eh? Keeps bobbing up. Here it is on this guy's fountain pen. I'm going to run this guy through the morgue, and then I'm going to look you up, Novak. Yeah, sure. We want you done with us. That's right. I'll introduce you to all the best people. Good night, lover. It was close to five, so I tagged by my place for some sleep. I tossed around like a fish on the living room rug. Hellman called about nine to throw more dust in my eyes. He said one of the airlines had a passenger to Portland named Walter Avery. Just to make it tough, the guy made the 12 o'clock plane and got off at Portland. I had left field all to myself. I got dressed and I looked up Sidney Bronson's number. There was no answer, so I went over. The place was locked and I looked up the janitor. He wasn't going to let me in, but it turned out that his wife had a birthday coming up. Well, I found something in the apartment. It was a card and it said... Bellcrest Sanitarium. Down in the corner, there was a guy's name. Dr. Emil Schoenig, psychiatrist. Vienna, without the walls. The Bellcrest Sanitarium was down on the peninsula, so I borrowed a car and headed down that way. Everything was fine until I got in the front door. They didn't even let me register. I woke up on a couch in Schoenig's office. It was dark outside, and my left arm was throbbing like a love story in a woman's magazine. The radiator sitting beside me was Sidney. Mm, you're a deep sleeper. I think I got some help. What happened to my arm? Hypodermic. You only need one arm, anyway. In your case, I need a spare. Who did it? Dr. Schoenig. Oh, he's a darling boy. Where is he? Out on the phone, trying to figure out what to do with you. What's that make me, a patient? Mm, that's one way of putting it. You made things easy. We were coming to you for the letter. Hmm? Do you want to try that over again? We were on our way when you stumbled in. You're wrong, Sid. Somebody's given you a fast pitch. That letter was gone when you were up at my place. I don't want a bum rib, Patsy. I want that letter. You're trailing the field, Angel. I told you, the letter's gone. A guy by the name of Walter Avery took it out of my place. Walter Avery? That's right, and somebody thanked him. They found him this morning, making like a dead seal. Walter Avery left for Portland last night. A plant, sweetheart. You better read up on your friends. Yeah. Thanks, Betsy. I told you to watch him, Sid. You had more shots. What's the difference? Oh, none, I suppose. Uh, why don't you mix us a drink while I talk to Mr. Novak? I'll be right with you. Well, Mr. Novak, you're one of my best patients. Well, that's because I like your needles. You better go easy on that drink. Yes? Why? Well, you'll get drunk and run somebody down the way you did that guy on the waterfront. Oh? A good guess. You should be proud. That's a good, sensible, final emotion. Here's your drink, Emma. Thank you, my dear. As to you, Mr. Novak. Sorry, there's no drink for you, Mr. Novak. He probably will be. Huh? Forget it. Hamill, I talked to Mr. Novak before you came in. He thinks you're a heel. He does. And so do I. I can stand it. He told me about Walter Avery. I'm sorry about that. Walter got that letter. You killed him and took it. I was supposed to blunder around until you got rid of me, too. That's a bum choke, Emil. You're getting hysterical. With laughter, Emil. You put one of the boys on the plane. Only Novak aired the wash too fast. Suppose I did. Somebody ought to bring you up to date, Sydney. You've been hanging on too long. The free ride's over. I might as well tell you. Now you're all through. I carried the whole bunch along and... <coughs> and I'm all through. 
<coughs> that I am. What's the matter with me? <coughs> What's the matter with me, Sid? Give him a hand, Novak. He just had a bad drink. You wouldn't do that, Sid. I'm full of surprises. You got a stomach full of poison. You got a stomach full of poison in 15 seconds, Emma. <coughs> Put down that gun, Emil. I want you to, Sid. Please, Emil, put down the gun. I'm a selfish fellow. <laughs> this happens kind of fast for you, fellow. Lots of noise, huh, Patsy? Yeah. I'll get you a pillow. I'd rather have your lap. Uh, you get mercy, not love, baby. Yeah. Thanks for small favors. How do I look? Not so good. That was the three and two pitch. Yeah, I had it coming up. I'll tell you about John St. John. I know. There was no such guy. That's right. It was the name of the group. Those spliced crosses? Yes. You found out a little late, but it's always that way. That's the way I found out about you. Yeah. I had a funny little hunch about you and me. I found out a little late. But I know now, Patsy. Does that help? Well, John St. John was the name of an organization buying and selling government information. That old man tried to tell me, but he checked out too fast. I began to figure something like that when those spliced crosses started showing up. Shoney killed the old man in Sydney's car. He couldn't stop because I was around. The two girls and Walter Avery were both in on the deal. Shoney knew who I was when he saw me go into my office. He trailed me to my place and left Avery there to look for the letter. He killed that girl up in the rooming house, and then he found out she didn't have the letter. When Avery showed up, he took it away from him, threw him to the fish. He was trying to shake Sydney by sending her up to my place after he had the letter. The scheme went haywire when I showed up at the sanitarium. He was trying to work himself out of that one when the payoff came. John St. John? Well, right from the start, Jocko said he was either dead or in the state pen because anybody with a name like John St. John would have killed his parents as soon as he got old enough to find out about it. We'll return in a moment to find out what bothered Inspector Hellman. But now it's Cinderella time. Cinderella lost his shoe and so she got a maid. The modern miss has learned from this in gallant camp she'll rate. A pretty face, a graceful figure, lovely shoes. That's a combination that no man can resist. What a delightful feeling to know that from the top of your head to the tip of your toes, you are the picture of glamorous perfection. Here's what Marilyn Buford, Miss America 1946, says. Probably the most fun of being chosen Miss America is modeling the gorgeous clothes. What girl wouldn't be thrilled to select costume after costume from a collection of America's leading designers? And after seeing the importance they attach to the right shoes for every costume, I'm glad I learned about gallon caps years ago. Yes, Marilyn, there's magic in a pair of shoes, as every woman knows. And having the right shoes is no longer a luxury thanks to gallon camps, the home of lovely shoes at reasonable prices. And that's why Miss America's favorite store is the favorite store of America's Misses. Cinderella lost his shoe and so she got a maid. The modern Miss has learned from this in gallon can she wait. And now back to Pat Novak. Oh, it worked out all right. They found the letter out at Shoney's place, and there were some plans for jet planes and a few other trifles. Hellman asked only one question. How come Shoney didn't kill me before I could talk to the girl? <laughs> it's always that way with a guy who commits murder. Either he goes too far or he doesn't go far enough. Be sure to join us next Sunday evening and every Sunday, same time, same station, for radio's newest show, Pat Novak for Hire. And don't forget the store with the yellow front is the Gallon Camp Shoe Store. Gallon Camp Shoes are good shoes. There's something about them you'll like. Franklin Evans speaking. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Ladies and gentlemen... 
the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak for Hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. You gotta put it in block letters because down on the waterfront in San Francisco there's a price tag on everything. You gotta do that or marry a rich widow. I don't like to work that hard. So I rent boats and do anything else that's cash and carry. Oh, it's all right if you don't mind trouble. Because that's one thing you can't duck. It's like trying to dance the minuet in skis. And the best trouble always looks good from the outside. You're all smiles and feel like a kid opening a hand grenade under the Christmas tree. I found that out Tuesday night. It was around 7 o'clock. I was getting ready to close the office when this little guy showed up. He was about the size of a golf bag with arms. And if he had a cigar box, he could see over a pool table. He walked up to the desk and started talking in a voice that made you think he was trying to put Lily Pons out of work. Hello, you know that? You're doing all right so far. What's on your mind? I'm Jackie Gregg. You heard of me, huh? You're the shy type, I know. I'm Jackie Gregg, the jockey. You heard of me, huh? All right, now I heard of you. Put the show on the road. I'm looking for a horse. You want to find me a horse? Yeah, I breed him in the back room. What color do you want? You're so tough I got to take that from you? Calm down before you wind up in a boy's choir. If you got anything to sell, put it on the line or beat it. I'm riding a horse tomorrow called Fleet Lady. She's disappeared. She's not here. I'm supposed to ride the sixth race with her tomorrow. The Bonanza handicap and she's gone. All right, she's gone. Maybe your horse likes to go out at night. I haven't seen her. Get to the point. I'll give you 200 bucks to find that horse. Somebody took her in a van. I uh, trailed her down here at the waterfront. But you lost him up at the ferry building. That's right. Something funny's going on. My mom disappeared and you gotta find her. This is a big waterfront and where's the 200 bucks? You'll get that all right. Down by Pier 19. The van turned in. Think you can find Fleet Lady? I don't know. Who owns her? woman named Sybil Thornton. She's, uh, mixed up, I think. Yeah. Why steal your own horse? I don't know. Run a ringer, maybe. That's a tough trick. This woman's got some good ones. You want the 200 bucks? Yeah. How are the odds? What's the difference? You're gonna open a book? You better take the 200 bucks now. Yeah, the dough will keep. You sound frightened, Junior. And you sound nosy. Here's the 200. I want you to find the horse. You let me know at the Kingston Hotel, huh? Sure. And if you don't find anything around the waterfront, maybe you better try the track. Ask around there. Yeah. By the way, how do you fit in? How come you got $200 interest in that horse? Maybe I love horses. What do you care if maybe I love horses? I don't. A guy like you's got to love something. Oh, yeah. It was a sweet proposition. A jockey in search of a horse. There's something phony about the whole thing. I had the 200 bucks, but I didn't feel good. It was like a guy stealing a murder gun to help out in a scrap metal drive. Well, after the little guy left, I closed the office and started to hit the docks, but it didn't work out. You know, you can buy good whiskey these days, so you feel funny walking up to some guy on the pier and asking, have you seen a racehorse around here, mister? By nine, I was sure the horse wasn't around, so I borrowed a car and drove out to the track. I found out where Sybil Thornton's horses were quartered and headed down that way. It was pretty dark, so... When I bumped into her, all I got was a vague outline. She had a good-looking vague outline. Oh, I'm very sorry. Yeah, I'm full of regrets, too. Should we try it again? But you're a little mixed up in your animals. They keep horses here. You don't seem to mind. No, you lean nicely, but you'd probably feel safer with a platform. Yeah. Well, we try this again when I've had three good meals. That's a horse. Yes, I know. In fact, I own it. I see. That'd make you Sybil Thornton. Yes, what would it make you? A guy named Pat Novak looking for your horse. I was hired in the waterfront to find her. My, they grow big on the waterfront. You must get a lot of sun. By the way, is Fleet Lady Missy? Your jockey says she is. That's why I'm snooping around. Didn't know he had any friends. He's got a checkbook. How about Fleet Lady? Is she tucked in bed? Yes. Well, let's take a look, huh? Find it very dull, Mr. Novak. Yeah, that's what they said to Anthony. 
Let's see the horse. Suit yourself. She's down this way. Okay. I'm doing this out of the bigness of my heart. I think you're wasting my generosity, Mr. Mulray. I don't use it all this trip. It's from the stable. Come on. Down about here. Fleet lady stall. Here. There's a flashlight on the wall. All right. Poor thing. Do horses die broke, too? Who is it? Fleet Lady? Yes, are you satisfied? No, I'm going to ring up headquarters. You crazy. Then I'm going to call Jackie Gregg and tell him his hunch paid off. I wouldn't do that, Mr. Novak. Stop kidding me, sweetheart. She didn't get killed in the fight with another horse. Gregg figured somebody was telling the machine. That's why Fleet Lady's dead. That's why I'm going to call headquarters. Suit yourself, but remember what happened to Fleet Lady. Are you getting tough, Angel? No. You just wouldn't look good with a saddle, Mr. Novak. <laughs> as she turned and walked out of there. It was the kind of a walk that makes you flip the calendar and find out how far away spring is. I looked around a while, but it didn't do any good. The place was full of doors, so whoever killed Fleet Lady got out easy like a rumor at a church picnic. I closed the door and went down the line to call headquarters. As I stood in there talking, I saw Sybil Thornton drive away. It was a long convertible with red asbestos seat covers. After I called headquarters, I went back and waited near the stable. About a half hour later, a police car pulled up, and when I saw who got out, I began to get unhappy like a three-legged man in a ballet school. It was Hellman from Homicide, and he had a squad with him. All right, all right, I'll talk to him. Hello, Novak. Where's your trainer? Your boys get paid to laugh at you, Hellman. I don't. Yeah, where's the horse? What are you doing on the case? I came for the ride. You mind, Novak? No, I just wondered if they wised up downtown. Yeah. Because you could find a dead horse, Hellman. If they staked it out in the middle of Market Street, you'd find it before long. I'll try this time. Where is it? Stall 18 over there. Uh, keep an eye on them, boys. I'll be back in a minute. In here, Novak? Yeah, the one with the teeth like yours. You better shut up, Novak. Don't get jumpy. I, you haven't seen the horse. Just shut up, huh? It wasn't going to be much of a conversation anyway. What color horse was that, Novak? What do you mean? Take a look at it. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I just took a look. It's a smart horse, Novak. What? That's right. That dead horse in there is wearing a double-breasted suit. Hellman got the message straight. I walked in and took a look. Jackie Gregg was lying there on the floor as dead as last year's love. The sickness didn't show until we rolled him over on his stomach. Somebody had gone duck hunting in the middle of his back. I began to feel a little sick myself, and I was ready to send out for the same gun when Hellman started to talk. You forgot to mention the guy when you phoned headquarters. He wasn't there. I was in here before, and the guy wasn't around. What was he doing under the horse? I don't know. Hellman maybe crawled out of a crack. I don't know. There were two shots. I came in and found the horse. Yeah? Check the horse. You're trying to tell me the horse shot back? Who is he? A guy by the name of Jackie Gregg. He gave me 200 bucks to find a missing horse. Yeah. A horse called Fleet Lady running into Mara's handicap. This is the end of the line. How do you know it's the same one? I don't. Maybe you got to be a horse to tell. Why don't you ask one of your boys? <laughs> yeah, your boy's real tough. Call him off, Hellman. He's nasty. We all hate him, Novak. That's all right. I'll put it on your bill, Hellman. That's good. You can write it up at headquarters. Hellman, you ought to rent an idiot. The heavy thinking's too much for you. I can piece this together. We come out here and find a dead man with you kicking up dust 40 feet away. Look, Hellman, I didn't kill the guy and call up headquarters. I know they're bad in homicide, but I'm not that big-hearted. We got a spare hook for you, Novak. That's where you stay until somebody gets you off. Well, you can start out with Sybil Thornton. Another horse? She's got the speed for it. Look her up. She owns Fleet Lady, and she was dashing around in the dark here, playing easy to get. I'll look her up. You better leave the boys behind, after all. She's only a woman. When you see her, ask her about that van down on the waterfront and what she was doing before I made that phone call. I'll tag all the bases. Don't worry, Junior. And if things fit together, you'll both be in the jug. I'll see you later. I got work to do. Yeah, it's getting late. You better put the boys back in the cage. I began to worry after Hellman left. There was no murder gun, and he didn't have too much to go on, but there was no one else wanted my job. Oh, I knew the girl was going to have an alibi, and I was the last guy that Jackie Gregg had seen. I had about as much chance as a fat girl at a Princeton prom. Hellman didn't like me, and he was a smart cop with a disposition like a ton of rhubarb. Well, I had to start right from scratch. I felt like Adam the first morning he woke up. 
So I looked up a guy named Jocko Madigan, an ex-doctor and a boozer who will give you a lift if you show him where the stirrups are. Well, he's a good guy, but he thinks all food makes a gurgle. I hit all the bars and finally found him up at Maggie Nielsen's apartment. She's a good-looking voice that lives up on the hill, and Jocko was working his way into her liquor supply. Hello, Patsy. You're just in time to join me for my first drink of the evening, uh, or uh, one of my first at least. Yeah, I see. Maggie's not here, but I found her whiskey. It was in plain sight, locked in the closet under some newspapers. All right, Jocko, when are you going to sober up? Oh, I plan to do it briefly on April 1st, when the rest of the world plays the fool also. Look, I'm in trouble, Jocko. you got to help me. Good. I have a special bottle I use to forget your troubles. Now, look, stop caressing that jug and listen to me. I'm in a jam. Patsy, there's... Nothing in nature so sad as a half-empty bottle. It's like a broken vow or an unfulfilled promise in the skies. A falling star, almost. All right, Jocko. A falling star, and you shrug it off, never realizing that a whole world has ended at that moment. Yeah. A hundred million dreams, maybe, and you watch it fall and make an asinine wish. That's all the good it does a star to fall. It gives some kid a chance to wish for a bicycle. You all finished now, Jocko? Yes. What kind of trouble? Anything I could aggravate? I'm mixed up out at the track. A guy by the name of Jackie Gregg is dead and I don't look good. Oh, Hellman? Yeah. The guy's a jockey and he hired me to find a horse named Fleet Lady. Did you? The horse and the jockey ran a dead heat, but there's something funny about the whole deal. Did you talk to the jockey? No, not enough. Oh, Patsy, you've got to break yourself of the habit of waiting until people are dead before you think of a question. Jocko, I want you to hit all the horse rooms. Find out what you can about the sixth race tomorrow. It's the Bonanza Handicap. Now hurry up, will you? Well, if it's the sixth race, why can't we wait a while? Start now. Get everything you can and call me. I'll leave a message at your place. Where are you going? I don't know. Maybe up to see the girl. Oh, Patsy, you're going to be waving at the hangman's wife when they spring the trap door. I gotta see her. She owns Fleet Lady. Well, why don't I see her? She's got a stake somewhere and I got a lot of questions. What could you do up there? Ah, oh, yes. If it weren't an academic question, I'd argue the point. Oh, it looked like a bum deal right from the start. Patsy, you have the instinct for recognizing trouble, but not the intelligence to duck it. Save your breath, will you? You're like a man walking under a scaffold on a building. You realize it may crash down and kill you, but instead of hugging the building where you can't get hurt... Like every other dope, you scurry for the edge of the sidewalk where you're bound to get hit if it falls. Jocko, will you get out to those horse parlors? I need facts, not fables. Now, give me a hand. All right. Give my love to Fleet Lady. Her name's Sybil Thornton. I bet I'm not far wrong. Good night, lover. <laughs> up the NBC program director, Paul Stangl. We pulled out the clips on Sybil Thornton. They were nice and fat because she'd been to Reno four times and hadn't broke training for years. She'd been traded around more than a Red Sox pitcher. The clipping said she was 32. There were a lot of pictures. And from her eyes, you got the idea she was around 35. But there were arguments the other way, too. Well, there weren't any stories on her for the last few months, just a few items from the columns. They all said the same thing. She was hitting the night spots with a gambler named Rudy Hauser. There were pictures of him, too. Now, he would look good in a cave with heavy curtains. I asked Paul. He said Hauser had a gambling place out on Geary, so I took a cab out there. For ten bucks, the guy at the door said Sybil Thornton had left the place an hour ago. That made me feel good. When Hauser opened the door to his office, I lost the glow. Yeah? What's with you? I got a problem. You got the wrong door. Well, you can't get any tougher, so I'm coming in. Mm. Suit yourself. I never throw anybody out until I'm sure they've lost all their money. What's on your mind? A horse named Fleet Lady. She disappeared at 7 o'clock tonight. Now you check under the rug, I'll try the cabin. She got back just in time to greet somebody's guns. If I say no, will you go out and lose your money like a good boy? Fleet Lady was owned by a gal named Sybil Thornton. The columns say you're number five on her list. Well, they never lie. The whiskey's too good. Also, a little bird says she was in your office an hour ago. That's right. She said your name's Novak. Yeah. Next time you got a bombshell, give it a test run. With Fleet Lady dead, your money's gonna look real good in the six tomorrow. Well, it makes you think the gal would throw a race. For the same reason she goes out with you? Huh? When a gal takes a great dane like you out in public, it generally means the guy's a few bucks ahead of her. <laughs> want to fight the team now, Novak. Yeah. Just remember, sometimes you can't be right in a gentleman, too. Yeah. I hope that's the way you feel when they pick you up for Jackie Gregg's murder. Huh? Oh, you do a real nice double take, mister. The jockey checked out with a horse. 
I didn't know that, Novak. Yeah, with no brains, you built this gambling club. I didn't know he was dead. If I told you that, Novak, I meant it. He was all right for a little punk. I'm sorry he's dead. So's he. I'll see you later, Hauser. I gotta nose around and find out where you were tonight. Yeah. You seem all right, Novak. So I'll tell you. If you got any dough left when you leave my table, it's better than a horse named Fleet Lady in the sixth race tomorrow. Do you always bet on a dead horse? You got the tip? Use it or bury it, but don't loan it out. Oh, the case was a regular grab bag when I walked out of Hauser's office. I began to tick off the things that didn't add up. First on the list was that van down on the waterfront. If it was Fleet Lady, who got shot in the stable? If it was the ringer, that meant Fleet Lady would run tomorrow. Oh, I couldn't figure out why Hauser was so sure she'd win. An idea kept racing around in the back of my mind like an ant in a cookie factory. Jackie Gregg lied about that van down on the waterfront, but why? Not to bail me out of the poorhouse with 200 bucks. Oh, I got part of the answer when I stopped with the pay telephone and called Hellman. Yeah, Hellman talking? There's Novak. I got some news. You'll have to put it on the back page. What do you got? Your friend Jackie Gray had some love life. Well, there's a chance for you, Hellman. Who's the girl, Sybil Thornton? Yeah, we found a picture in his wallet. The gooey kind. I'll bet you stole it for long train rides. What time did he die? The right fit for you between 9 and 10 o'clock. Two shots from a 32 caliber pistol. How about the horse? 45 caliber. Two people. It's getting involved. Maybe, maybe not. You got two hands, Novak. Look up a guy named Rudy Hauser. He's got a joint out on Geary Street. I got enough friends. You look him up. I did. He's still talking about Fleet Lady and tomorrow's race. All right, maybe he's sentimental. Look, Novak, I'll pick out my own work. I don't need free help from you. Jackie Gregg paid 200 bucks and look what he got. That suits yourself, but Rudy Hauser and that gal are close friends. Yeah? Like two-part harmony in a telephone booth. Get off the dime, Hellman. Hauser's got that gal in his hip pocket. She owns Fleet Lady and he's betting her to win. You're trying hard, Novak. It's got to be a slow field to lose to a dead horse. Wake up, Hellman. You couldn't smell a rat in a basement full of cheese. I did all right in your apartment. Huh? That 32 caliber pistol, we found it in your place. See you later. <laughs> too worried about that. Hellman's smart enough to know a phony plant. I began to think about that 32 caliber pistol. It's a woman's weapon. Well, that doesn't prove anything. So is a bread knife if she's in a bad mood. Must have been about midnight when I got to Sybil Thornton's place. She was wearing black lounging pajamas tied tight around a slim waist. She looked like a wasp with a nice sting. She had company. Come in, Mr. Novak. Yeah. Mr. Novak, this is Ronnie Stark. Hello, Novak. Yeah. Well, he's not very friendly, Sybil. He's just parting because they're going to arrest him for Jackie's murder. How do you like Hellman? You've known him longer. Yeah. Somebody left the murder gun up at my place. Where well, you've been all night. Please, Mr. Novak. You're embarrassing Ronnie. That's right. I'm blushing, and it's not the whiskey, Novak. I see. You must stay longer, Ronnie. Uh, she's persuasive, huh, Novak? See you tomorrow. You won't forget, Ronnie. No, I won't forget. I'm betting on you, Novak. What won't he forget? Mr. Novak, I hope nobody ever asks you that question. Hmm. You don't want to talk about putting that gun in my apartment? No. Let's talk about Rudy Hauser, then. Hmm? Your meat grinder friend. We just had a good talk, and he opened up a new road. What'd you tell him? Don't break a spring. He's all right. Will you do me a favor, Patsy? Like not talking to Hauser anymore? Huh? That's right. Won't do you any good, Patsy. It'll do me a lot of good. How's he going to know which horse got killed? I bet you lied to him, Angel. It's my apple cart, Patsy. Leave it alone. Sure. But play your hand right, baby. Because I'm going to watch your cards. And if you got one that says Jackie Gregg, I'm going to call you the hard way. Patsy, you nice beast. I really think you would. Sit down. Yeah. A drink? No. Do you good? Not right now. Well... You've read the book. Just a couple of chapters. I bet they're the right ones. You better watch out, baby. I may be a long shot. Well, you care as long as I bet. I don't. That's good. I didn't think you'd mind. Aren't you beginning to crowd the beachhead? Don't be a sissy, Pat. See, you can't live forever. All right, Angel. It's time to wire the folks. Mr. Novak, just wait until you know me better. That's for me. I left the number. It's your fault, then. Yeah. Hello, 
all, Patsy. What'd you find out, Jocko? Not much. Nobody seems to care about the sixth race. I care about it. Well, that's because you killed one of the jockeys. The rest of the people have a more casual interest. How do the odds run? Oh, no heavy favorites. Vin Air and Sleepy Time Gal figure to be the best at around five to one. What about Fleet Lady? Down the line somewhere. I talked to one fellow... He says she's a dog and couldn't beat a paralytic goose over a hundred yards. Yeah, what else? Well, that's all. What do you mean, that's all? Start digging, Jocko. We're not getting any place. Not even at your end? Huh? I counted on you to do better than that. Good night, lover. On the way home, I bought the morning papers. There was no story on Jackie Gregg, no details, and most of the story was a statement by Hellman on Hellman. There was no mention of Fleet Lady, and at one o'clock in the morning, there was nothing I could do but roll into bed. I woke up about nine, called Jocko. It was like sending a message out to the Farallones by Indian Runner. He just muttered and said he'd meet me out at the track. Well, I had to have some more dope, so I called Ira Snow. He calls the races and bets on them. The way he does it, a horse is a real beast of burden. He was playing Elf when I got him on the wire. Yeah. Ira, this is Novak. What do you know about the Bonanza handicap? It's a horse race. Oh, you're funny. What about the field? Are the horses any good? Uh, for hamburgers, maybe. Nothing else. How about Fleet Lady? Eastern track. Nobody knows. Would she be worth a heavy plunge? Yeah, if you want to be a muck. What's this all about? Ira, I'm in trouble. How about a fix? Could they run a ringer in on Fleet Lady? Yeah, it's been done before, but it ain't easy. That's what I figured. How's Rudy Hauser on horses? He ain't. He got burned a long time ago. He never bets. Well, I think you're wrong. Look. Novak, I know every guy in town that's got the itch. Rudy Hauser, no. You know a guy named Ronnie Stark? Sure, he runs a book. Why? Nothing. May see you at the track. I'm going to make a bet. Yeah, I'll tell the horses. Well, that left me in a hole. If Ira was right, Rudy Hauser on Fleet Lady didn't make a bit of sense. I got out to the track about 2.30. Jocko was there, and Hellman was wandering around up in the grandstand where they couldn't push him into a starting gate. Sybil Thornton waved from her box as I walked by to get a better shot at the starting line for the sixth. They were almost at the post when Jocko came back from the betting window. Well, Patsy, uh, I bet two dollars on a horse called Scotch Victory. Uh, it seemed like a good omen. Yeah. I saw your friend Rudy Hauser at the window. Huh? He was pouring money down on the favorites to win. Well, that's why the odds have gone down on Vin Air and Sleepy Time Gal. Look at that board, will you? Yeah, Fleet Lady's gone all the way up to 12 to 1. Yeah, from 8 to 1, all the way up. Maybe the word got around she's dead. No, no that's the funny part. She's down there, see, number 3 on the rail. Yeah. Not a peep out of anybody. Stand up! <laughs> Sleepy time gal by a head. Fleet lady between the horses is running third by one length. On the outside, it's Vinair and Old Soldier. Going into the clubhouse turn, it's hot weather by two lengths. Sleepy time gal by a half length. Fleet lady is moving up on the outside. It's Vinair fourth by one length. And Old Soldier... Down the back stretch, it's hot weather by two lengths. Fleet Lady moving up on the outside is now second by one length. She runs Running well for a ghost. Yeah. Rudy Hauser would better hurry up or he won't see much. What? He better hurry. He left the track ten minutes ago. Huh? Are you sure, Jocko? Yes, I heard him tell someone he had to make a phone call just before the betting closed. Well... Jocko, you're a sweetheart. Oh, I like to think Come on, let's go to that stable. Uh, the race is no good. It was over five minutes ago. Well, how about my two dollars? Come on, will you? There's only one person who will try to fix a horse race. That's a horse. Well, I knew there was going to be trouble fast. The horses were just coming under the wire when I waved to Hellman and started for the stable. When we got there, Sybil Thornton was clearing out like a fire sale. I'm in a hurry, Patsy, darling. Let me by. No, you made a bad play, Angel. Stick around. Let me by, Patsy. You heard him, lady. Stick around. Thanks, copper. I'll take charge. That's a big gun, Hauser. I got a big beef. You let me drop a hundred grand, Sybil. It's your idea, Rudy. Not this way. You let me drop a hundred grand because you ran Fleet Lady. The program said Fleet Lady, and that's who ran. I brought those odds into line at the window. My other lady looked bad on Fleet Lady. You didn't stay to watch her trail the field. All right, I didn't stay. You lost your hundred grand. You killed the ringer. 
You were a smart big shot who was going to sew up the race. You ran Fleet Lady and cost me a hundred grand. All right, cop, I'll move away from her. Over this way, Sybil. Oh, don't let him do it, Patsy. I want to see how tough you are. Come on, Sybil. Let's you and me move against the stall. Watch out, Hauser. You're back into the horse. Grab the horse, Novak. He's going to trample him. You grab him. It's your idea. Yeah. Yeah. You should have learned the first time you can't beat the horses. That's a bump joke, Novak. I guess it is. Now that we're all here, who do we book for Jackie Gregg's murder? I'll answer that, friend. Who's this guy? It's one you missed, Hellman. Hello, Stark. I am Novak. Well, what are you waiting for, Sybil? Tell the man you killed Jackie Gregg. Had enough trouble today, Ronnie. Oh, you got more coming. Well, you figured it out yet, Novak? Hauser dumped his 80 grand on you. That's right. It's a lot of spending money. Oh, wait a minute. Ronnie, I don't like this. Well, you get your half, baby. I'm going to write out an I.O.U. When they book you for murder and the vote's in, you can't use it. You wouldn't do a thing like that, Ronnie. A dead girl can't spend 40 grand. She killed your guy, Copper, and tried to palm it off on Novak. I was there, so I'll testify. Ronnie, you're a no good guy. Ah, don't be silly. I love justice. A booker for murder, Copper. I want to tear up that I.O.U. <laughs> finally worked it out. It started out as a fixed race, and when they were all through, it was up to the horse. Rudy Hauser put the squeeze on Sybil for some dough. She offered to run a fast ringer and place a fleet lady so Hauser could pick up a bag full. Rudy just wanted to make sure, so he sent one of his boys around to knock off fleet lady. Only the guy killed the ringer instead. Now well, that was a break for Sybil. She made a deal with a bookie named Ronnie Stark to take all of Hauser's bets and guarantee him that Fleet Lady couldn't win because she wasn't that good a horse. It panned out that way. She let Hauser think Fleet Lady was dead. He spent the 20 grand at the window pushing up the odds on Fleet Lady and dumped another 80 on her to win. The moving van? Now well, that was a phony story Greg used to get me to scare Sybil. He wanted in on the deal. He went back to the stable that night, got in a beef, and she killed him. She had him out in her car. When I went to make that phone call, she figured it was a good way to pass the buck. Well, Hellman asked only one question. Why would a nice, tame horse go crazy and trample a guy to death? Jocko had the answer. The horse that killed Hauser was a filly. <laughs> Company has just brought you the fourth of a new series, Pat Novak, for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced and directed by William P. Rousseau. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. In our cast were Virginia Gregg, Tal Avery, Stacey Harris, Hugh Thomas, and Carlisle Bibbers. This program is being released to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Be with us again next week when over most of these same ABC stations we will bring you Pat Novak for Hire. This program came to you from Hollywood. Listening reminder. Tonight, don't miss Jane Wyman when she guest stars and explains how she created her unforgettable role as the deaf mute in Johnny Belinda. Hear Jane Wyman tonight on this ABC station. This is ABC, the national broadcasting company. <laughs> The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The 
people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Even the busiest detectives can't always be detecting. And on this late Saturday afternoon, we find Mike Shane and his pretty assistant, Phyllis Knight, driving through the timber country high up near the Nevada border. They're on their way to keep an important date, a date with a wedding. But no, not theirs. It's the wedding of Betty Harrison, daughter of the timber tycoon, and Mike has been unwillingly dragged along to help Phil carry out her social obligations. You know, I ought to have my head examined coming way out here to see two people I don't know get married. Oh, Mike. Betty was my closest friend at finishing school. Yeah, but I only finished uh, high school. Now, where do I fit into this high society stuff? Michael, it's a quiet wedding. We're the only guests. And I'm supposed to hold the bridegroom's fevered head? Mike, where is your romance? Romance I've got, Angel, but when it comes to rice and orange blossoms, I'm strictly allergic. Mm -hmm. You're hopeless. Hey, look. Look, there's the Harrison place. Place, you say? That, my love, is quite a shack. And there's Betty. There's Betty waiting for us. Yeah, say, honey, that, that guy with her looks familiar. Huh? Mike, that's Inspector Faraday. In the flesh, and that spells trouble. Betty? Betty? Phyllis. Phyllis, I'm so glad you've come. Oh, you look wonderful. Me too. Betty, this is Mike Shane. Hello. I'm pleased to meet you. Well, I'll be. Mike and Phyllis. Say, Inspector, aren't you early with your vacation? No, I'm here on business, Mike. Mr. Harrison phoned me. Said he was leaving on the second section of 98. But he transferred to his own private trainer for me to meet him here. Father wasn't planning to come up for the wedding. Then all of a sudden, I get a wire that he is. Well, that must be Harrison's train now. Yes, it runs up to a little station behind the house. Well, then why don't we walk over and meet it, huh? Let's. Father will be surprised. Betty, hey, where's the bridegroom? Someone should have been here by now. Oh, bridegrooms are always late. Those last three hours. You be hey. quiet. Betty! Oh, there's Don coming now. Hey, he's a bit of all right. I'm hmm? sorry I'm late. I had a flat tire. Oh, Don, dearest, this is Phyllis Knight, Hello. Mr. Shane, Mr. Faraday, Don Manchester, my fiancé. How do you do? Hello, there. How are you? Well, there she is, a coming around the mountain. You know, this is something That's to see an engine train. pulling one coach. <laughs> they dropped the lumber cars off at Camp Junction. Oh. Hey, look. There, there's somebody getting off. Oh, that's Mr. Oliver, father's business associate. Oh, that's Mr. Miller getting off the back platform. I still don't see Mr. Harrison. No. Oh, Mr. Oliver. Oh, hello, Betty. Where's father? Oh, as usual, in his private compartment. Hasn't even stepped out since we left Northwood City. He's probably napping again. Oh, he certainly was fine company. Well, I'm going up to the house. Mm, that's one happy character. Let's climb aboard and get farther. Sort of like a welcoming committee, mm -hmm. huh? Okay. Uh, Inspector, watch mm -hmm. your lumbago on these steps. Never mind my lumbago, Mike. <laughs> watch out for those fallen arches of yours. <laughs> oh, get <Old> him. Man. <laughs> Here's Father's compartment. I'll sneak in and shout boo. <gasps> Father! Something's wrong. What is it? What is it? Father! It's Harrison stretched out on the floor. Oh, Betty's fainting. Here, put her on that couch, Don. Wait a minute. Rub her wrist. Wait a minute. I'll get some water. Well, Inspector, how's Mr. Harrison? He's dead, Mike. Looks like a heart attack. Uh-huh. Maybe so, Inspector, but this heart attack has had a little help. What are you talking about? About murder, Inspector. Froth on the lips and dilated eyes don't spell a heart attack. Somebody slipped Mr. Harrison a nice big slug of poison. Oh, there you are, Mike. Get Betty up to the house all right? Yes, Inspector. Phil and Don are taking care of her. You still think Mr. Harrison was poisoned? I know so, Inspector. Look at his neck, stiff, and his jaws locked, eyes wide open and staring. Mm -hmm. I've got a little plan, Inspector. Would you like to try it? You know me, Mike. Well, look, no one knows we suspect murder, and whoever pulled this job figured on the local dock calling it a heart attack. So? Now, you take Harrison's body into Northwood City, along with that thermos of coffee we found by him. Mm -hmm. While you're checking for poison, Uncle Shane here will keep his big o ears open here. <laughs> All right, honey, how's Betty? Oh, she's a little better, Mike. She's sleeping now. Oh, the poor kid. 
Say, uh, what was that Betty said about her father not coming up for her wedding? Well, originally, he didn't like the idea of her marrying. But she was going to go through with it anyway? Yes. Then Mr. Harrison changed his mind, that's all. Uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Mike, when you start double-talking, I get worried. Angel, look, there were three men on that private train making a 50-mile trip. Now, come to the end of the line, what happens? Well, I'm listening, Mike. Miller gets off the back platform and scoots. Oliver hops off the front and goes away mad. And we go aboard and find Mr. Harrison dead. Uh-huh, that's it. This Mr. Harrison is the big boss, honey. You'd think those other two would wait for him, sociable-like. Oh, it's probably just a coincidence, Mike. Uh, and is it a coincidence that Faraday is here? On business? All right, all right, mastermind. So what do you make of it? Uh-uh, Angel. A good detective works from facts, so let's go get some. Facts? Where? Where, Mike? Mr. Miller's room is at the end of this hallway. Let's stop in and say hello, huh? Oh, I hope you know what you're doing. Yeah, me too. Here's his room. I'll knock. There's no answer, Mike. So, being friendly people, we'll go in and wait. Well, you can't just barge into somebody... Why not? The door's not locked. Come on, come on. Mike, I don't like this. Well, now, don't you worry your pretty head. Wow, the remains of a fire in the fireplace. I always love to poke around ashes. Now, let's see. Those look like letters. Mm -hmm. Letters they were. Letters to Betty. Well, she's asleep in her room. While someone conveniently burns her mail. Mike, let's get out of here. What's the matter, Angel? There's just us two. That's where you're wrong. Mike. Huh? Well, well, Mr. Miller... And with a nice shiny gun. We don't like snoopers around here. Get going. Uh, just a mistake, Miller. Just a mistake. That kind of mistake isn't healthy. Get out while you're still lucky. Sure. By coincidence, we were just leaving. Come on, Angel. Right away. The gentleman doesn't like our type. And I'm afraid the feeling is very mutual. <laughs> These couple of scraps I took from Miller's fireplace don't help much, honey. Well, I can't understand why anyone would burn Betty's letters from her father. Mm. Oh, well. Yeah, plenty of books around. Michael, after all, this room is the library. Encyclopedia. Modern timbered methods. Look, honey, here's a book, Famous Scotland Yard Murder Cases. Well, that ought to help you, Mike. And here's a bookmark. In the section on poisons. Mike, here comes Don. Mr. Oliver's with him. Huh? Mr. Shane. Bro, well, what's up, Don? I told Mr. Oliver you're a detective. He wants to talk to you. <laughs> yes, uh, something quite confidential. Miss Knight is my assistant. Oh, never mind. Uh, never mind. I'll go look up a sandwich. Okay, dear. All right, Oliver. Now, what's the trouble? Mr. Shane, I want protection. Protection from what? Miller. He threatened my life on the train. Oh, what happened? Well, shortly after Miller came aboard Mr. Harrison's private train at Northwood City, I discovered him going through some of Mr. Harrison's private papers. Then what? We had an argument, and he drew a gun on me. What is Miller's position in the company? Frankly, I don't know. He's on Harrison's personal payroll. And Betty's been rather worried. She felt that Mr. Miller had some sort of a hold on her father. Yes, that's it exactly. There was a very suspicious relationship. And uh, you want me to do what? Watch Miller every minute. He's dangerous. Mike? Yes, honey? Mike? Yes? A telephone call for you here in the den. Oh, okay. Oh. Friday. All right. Okay, Phil, close the door. All right. Hello, Faraday. Well, what's the dope? Yeah? Well, that might help. Oh, sure, sure, they're all here. Don't worry, I'll be careful. Okay, Inspector, hurry back. So long. What did he say, Mike? I was right, honey, 100% right. Harrison was loaded with strychnine. Well, then it, it was murder. And that's not all. I heard the click of an extension phone... There are extensions all over the house, Mike. Someone listened. We're keeping company with the murderer, honey. And the trouble is, we don't know who he is. But he knows we're looking for him. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Dirty or burned-out spark plugs can cost you a lot of gasoline. In fact, as much as one tank full out of ten. Now, that's a serious loss in mileage, particularly so when it's unnecessary. Your neighborhood Union Oil Minuteman is equipped to give you complete spark plug service. The performance of each plug is accurately measured on a special tester, and you can see the results for yourself. 
If your plugs are dirty, the Minuteman will clean and re-gap them to the proper setting. If they're burned or worn out, he can furnish you with correct replacements. Then you'll not only save gasoline, but your engine will run smoother. Union Oil spark plug service takes but a few minutes and costs but a few cents. A cost you'll soon save in extra mileage. So, friends, if it's been 3,000 miles or more since your spark plugs were checked, or if your engines seem to be rough and listless, drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil spark plug service. It will make driving easier. Gas coupons go farther. It is a few minutes later. Mike and Phil have learned that what started out as a happy wedding has turned into a grim case of murder by poison. We find them walking rapidly towards the station behind the Harrison's house. The murdered man's private coach is still there on its siding, made almost invisible by the tall trees which turn the weak moonlight into gloomy shadows. Come on, honey. I'm hurrying as fast as I can. I want to see if that briefcase is still in the car. Inspector Faraday remembered that Harrison mentioned some important papers he was bringing up with him. Well, then whoever was listening on the extension, they know about it, too. Right, and I want first crack at that briefcase. Hey, maybe you do, Mike, but so does someone else. Yeah, flashlight. In Harrison's private car. Maybe it's the murderer. Hang on, honey, we'll find out. Mike, there he is at the end of the car. Hey, honey, look out! Mike, Mike, did he hit you? No, no, a clean miss. Oh, he got away out the front. Could you see who it was? No, a flashlight in my eyes. Well, we'll catch up with him sooner or later. Oh. Let's go look over the compartment. Here it is, the briefcase. Oh, what a break for us. We frightened him away without the case. Uh, uh, sorry, honey, bad guess. The lock on the briefcase has been forced open. Oh, and whoever was here opened it and got what he wanted. Correct. Now, here's some papers. Business letters, checkbook, some kind of a report. Honey! What's the matter? This report. It's from the Atlas outfit. Atlas? Uh Uh-huh. The the detective agency in Los Angeles? Sure, sure. Listen to this. On the basis of our completed investigation, you have sufficient grounds to instigate criminal action against Z. Z? Evidently, Harrison didn't want the name mentioned. Well, Mr. Harrison was certainly checking up on somebody. And getting ready for the kill. I'll bet that's why Inspector Faraday's here. Mike, this is the motive for the murder. All we have to do is find out if Miller or Oliver is the Z in that report, and we've got the murderer. Partly right, Angel, partly. But I'd say it was better this way. Find out which one of them is Z, and the other guy is the killer. Huh? I don't get it, Mike. Look, Angel, look. The murderer listened in on my my telephone conversation with Faraday. He heard the inspector tell me about this briefcase, and he knew it held evidence that could hang him. Well, of course. That's why he dashed down here. Right, right? Angel. He beat us to the briefcase, and yet this report is here for us to find. Oh. You see? Mm -hmm. He wanted us to find this report, and that means the killer isn't Mr. Z. As soon as we get back to the house, I'll send a telegram to the Atlas people. Okay, but these high heels don't go very well with forests. Yeah. Mike. Yeah. Yeah, I heard. There's someone on that other path. Freeze behind this tree. Right. Whoever it is, he's walking fast. He's going past. No, he isn't. Hey, you hold it. Hey, what the... Mike. Mike, it's Miller. I say... What's the big idea of roughing me? I just want to ask you a few friendly questions, Oh, Tom. now, look here. First, about a gun that took a couple of shots at us. Oh, you're off the beam. I'm not carrying a gun. No? Well, don't mind me. I'll just search. Oh, go ahead. Well? Well, Mike? No, no gun. But you could have ditched it easy enough. Oh, Miss Knight, Mr. Shane. It's done. Well, what's the hurry, Don? Uh, I was out for a walk. Is something wrong? Plenty. I'm glad you're here. Oh, I don't understand. Yeah, Shane. How about you doing some explaining? Okay. Mr. Harrison was murdered. What? Murdered? But why? Who? That's what we're finding out. Miller, you're on the spot and it's plenty hot. Are you saying I killed Harrison? He was poisoned on that coach and you and Oliver were the only ones aboard. Oh, that doesn't prove a thing. It proves there's a 50-50 chance that you're it. Listen, smart guy. Your mathematics aren't so good. There were three of us on that train. Sure, sure. But only you and Oliver walked off. I don't mean Harrison. Somebody else got on that coach. (laughs) Now we have the ever-present mysterious third party. Not so mysterious. He's standing right next to you. All right, Don. 
That means you. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Shane, I did get on Mr. Harrison's train at Mill Junction. Well, Shane, guess I can be running along while you turn the heat on him. Uh, not so fast. I still think you know some of the answers. You know, maybe I do. And maybe I might just do a little talking to the right party. And when it will do me the most good. You're sticking your chin out a mile. This is murder. Well, I'll be around resting in my room. No, I don't trust him at all. Yeah? But you're still right in the middle of this, Don. You were on that death train. Oh, but I only stayed a minute. You see, Mr. Harrison was asleep, and I didn't want to disturb him. Which still doesn't explain why you drove out of your way from Northwood City to meet the train at the junction. Oh, it's a very personal matter. Look, Don, look, a man has been murdered. Wait, why should I want to kill my future father-in-law? Harrison wasn't too happy about you marrying his daughter. But he changed his mind. That's why he sent me a telegram this afternoon, asking me to meet his train. Oh, and what kind of a telegram might that be? Well, I have it right here. Read it for yourself. Here, honey. Huh? I'll hold the flashlight. All right, Mike. Wait a minute. Uh, Don, have changed my mind. Happy to have you as son-in-law. Meet my train at Camp Junction. We'll ride in together. Much to talk over. Harrison. Sounds all right. Let me see, Angel. Yeah. Yeah, from Northwood City at 3.20 today. Yeah, I wish I could help in some way. Yeah, sure, but... Hey, what was that? It's a window. Someone lowered it. That's Mr. Oliver's room. Mike, he must have heard everything. Yeah, something tells me we'll be hearing his little story very soon. That's right. The telegram is to the Atlas Detective Agency, Los Angeles. Uh, this is it. Please advise immediately. Name of Z. Yes, Z, the last letter in the alphabet. Name of Z in report to Harrison. Right. Sign that Michael Shane. That's right. Send it right out, please, and phone the reply here to me at Harrison's place. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, the answer to that telegram should mean a lot, Mike. Well, it'll help, darling, but there's some angles I don't get. Miller is a mysterious employee of Harriet Harrison's, all very hush-hush. Oliver's scared stiff of Miller... And Don goes walking around in the moonlight right after somebody takes a shot at us. Oh, you can't blame him for that, Mike. Here the night before his wedding and his future father-in-law is poisoned. Yeah, sure, sure, but there's one thing we do know. There's a killer here. Well, there's a car outside. That must be Inspector Faraday and in a big hurry. It's too bad you haven't the murderer all signed, sealed, and ready to deliver. Now, Angel, now sarcasm doesn't become you. Well, well Mike, Phil... How goes the home front? Oh, quite a few interesting details for you, Inspector. Whatever you're figuring, Mike, forget it. Ah, uh, huh? uh, that means the Inspector knows something. Plenty. While you two were taking it easy, I cracked this case wide open. Yeah? Well, give. Who's the murderer? Miller. Miller? Sure. I thought his face had a familiar profile, so I checked on him with headquarters. And found what? He's got a record a mile long. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll be willing to wager it's for blackmail. That's right. But how did you know? Inspector, are you forgetting? Mike is smart. All right. I hope Miller's still around. He said he'd be in his room. Good. Let's go pick him up. Okay. Let's go. Well, Mr. Shane, it looks like Faraday beat us to it this time. Oh, he's just a good man, honey. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, what's the line on Miller? All the usual stuff. Hires out as a private investigator and then turns the information he picks up into blackmail. Wow, cute boy. That racket should put him in clover. Yeah, but this time, Mike, it'll put him right in the middle of the lethal chamber at San Quentin. Ooh. Here's Miller's room. Yeah, no need to knock, Mike. Just open it up. Okay, here goes. Miller, we want you... Say, what? Well, there's your man, Inspector. You can take him in. But unfortunately, he's very dead. We'll return to Mike Shane and his adventures in just a moment. It's true that clean spark plugs make a difference in engine performance and gasoline mileage. But it's also true that even the finest spark plugs cannot fire properly if the ignition cables are defective. These cables are the small, fine wires which carry the electricity from the distributor to the spark plugs. They should be carefully inspected whenever your spark plugs are checked because old or damaged ignition cables leak electricity which means that only a thin, weak spark reaches the plugs. 
So to get new performance out of old engines, ask the Union Oil Minuteman to check both spark plugs and ignition cables. Then you'll be sure of more power and better mileage. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil Ignition Service. Thank you. Phyllis, Mike, and Inspector Faraday have just burst into Miller's room, only to find him dead, shot through the heart. This new development has put quite a crimp in the inspector's plans, and Mike is pointing this fact out to him. Looks like you were wrong about Miller, Inspector. At least wrong about his being the murderer. Miller could still have been the one who bumped off Harris and then somebody took care of him. Well, that would leave us with two killers. Well, could be, but it doesn't stack up that way. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to take Oliver in and charge him with murder. Okay, so you're charging him with murder. But how are you going to make it a stick, Inspector? How about motive? What, what evidence do you have? Oh, two and two make four, Mike. Harrison must have been poisoned on that private train. So it had to be Oliver. There's Miller lying there, absolutely eliminated. All fine and good, but it leads us to one other little item. Don was on that train, too. Don? Betty's fiancé? Mike, you saw the telegram Mr. Harrison sent him. Don couldn't have been the murderer. In this business, honey, we've got to figure every suspect guilty until we know they're innocent. Yeah, Mike's right. Oh, Phil, would you step into the other room and phone the coroner down at Northwood City? Yeah, yeah, sure, Inspector. I'll give him your compliment. You know, this business is beginning to make sense. The one who poisoned Harrison had to get rid of Miller because he knew too much. Miller said he might do some talking when the right time came. Well, Mike, for my money, Oliver fits into the picture. He's our man, and I'll get some evidence out of him. Oh, I'm sure he knows Inspector. plenty, but... Yeah. Inspector, I tried to call the coroner, but the telephones are dead. Uh-oh, the wires have been cut. Well, that don't make much difference. Oh, yes, it will, Inspector. You see, I'm expecting a reply to a telegram I just sent, a very important telegram. About this case? Yes, sir, in connection with the detective agency's report to Mr. Harrison. The answer to that why might be just what we need. Oh, now that the phones are dead, what are we going to do? Do? Simple, darling. The inspector will sit tight here while you and I go for a nice moonlight ride back to Northwood City. There it is. There's the telegraph office just on the other side of the tracks. Okay, I'll park the bus here. Now, watch it. Easy crossing these tracks, honey. Oh, thanks for the tip, old boy. But you could have carried me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> More trains. Yeah, this is the main line from San Francisco. Isn't this the place where Harrison transferred to his private train? Correct. Well, here's the telegraph office. Folks, can I help you? Uh, yes, I'm Mike Shane. I'm expecting a wire from Los Angeles. Mm, Shane, let me see. Here are your telegrams coming in now. I'll have it for you in just a minute. Okay. Look, Mike. Hmm? There's another. The train just pulled in. Now, oh. that's 8.20, miss. Only stops for a few minutes. 8.20? Well, it's late. It's 8.35 now. Nope. Train's on time. That there's the second section of the 8.20. Oh. So many people traveling, huh? Yep. Too many. That's why they run two sections. Like this afternoon, the second section of 98 came in at 3.40 with a whole pass of the folks. Is that right? You know, honey, that's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Of course it is, isn't it? What are you staring at me that way for? Well, here's a telegram, mister. Oh, swell, swell. Oh, come on, come on. Who was Mr. Z in that report? Well, this does it, honey. This does it. That Z is nobody else but Oliver. Oliver? Then Faraday's right. No, Angel. Faraday isn't right. Oliver wasn't Harrison's murderer. But uh, come on back to Harrison's place for a little meeting of the minds with Inspector Faraday. <laughs> All right, is uh, everybody coming? Yeah, they're coming. Mate. I told Betty, Don, Oliver. Good girl, good girl. Now, uh, now to open these French windows. There. Okay, Faraday. Now out on the porch with you. Right, Mike. Bill, drape that beautiful body in that chair. Oh, thank you. Yes, my Lord Master. Well, here comes Betty and Don. Oh, hello. I'm sorry it was necessary to bother you. Don and I understand. I'm glad to help in any way, Mister Shane. Thanks, Don. Come over here. Stand by me, out of range. <laughs> Certainly, but. Uh, how to range? I don't understand. Now, what is all this rigmarole about in the middle of the night? There's nothing to get excited about, Oliver. I asked Miss Knight to call you downstairs for a conference. A conference? About what? About mysterious happenings around here, but particularly about why Harrison had you investigated by a detective agency. Hmm? Mr. Shane, what do you mean? 
I mean you've been cheating the Harrison Timber Company out of thousands of dollars. Oh, that's ridiculous. Why, Mr. Harrison trusted me implicitly. He did, until he finally caught up with you. That's why he was going to turn you over to Inspector Faraday today. I won't listen to this. There's no proof. There's plenty of proof, all written down in black and white. What's more, you knew Harrison had you dead the rights. That's why you poisoned him. You're mad. I never killed anyone. It's no use, Oliver. You're hooked like a fish. No. I didn't murder him. You can't frame right, me. He's running. He's running towards that window. I'll stop him. No, Don, no. Drop that gun. That's better. You knocked the gun out of my hand. You let Oliver get away. Oh, no, no. Here comes the inspector. And he's got our friend Oliver by the well-known collar. Oh, no. no. Max squirming, but safe and sound. I didn't do it. I'm innocent. Take him in, Faraday. You've got enough on him to make it stick and stick hard. Yes, he's a dead duck. Oh, Mr. Shane, I can't believe Mr. Oliver would kill my father. But, uh, he didn't, Betty. What? Well, you just told the inspector to take him in. Sure, Don. I'm taking Oliver in for theft. But for Mr. Harris's murder, we'll take you. Me? Oh, wh- what are you saying? Sorry, Betty. Don wanted to marry you in the worst way. He married a couple of other girls with wealthy parents. Oh, Betty, don't listen to when him. When your father suddenly wired he was coming up, Don knew it was the showdown. That's ridiculous. Oh, no, no, no. You had a hunch Harrison engaged Miller to investigate It's you. a lie. You saw the telegram Mr. Harrison sent me just this afternoon. Sure, Don, sure you got a telegram. A telegram you sent to yourself. All you did was slip over to the Northwood City, wait until the train pulled in, and then send that telegram to your own address and sign Harrison's name. Oh, nothing but lies. No, lies. no, 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 son. It's a fact, a fact that we can prove. Because you made a mistake, a bad mistake, Don. You saw the train pull into Northwood City and thought that Harrison was on it. But you didn't know that there were two sections of that train today and that Harrison was on the second section. You sent that telegram 20 minutes before Harrison got there. <laughs> Mike, hmm? you know it's wonderful to be getting back home, here by the Golden Gate. Oh, I like it. You know, honey, one of these days they're going to put up a statue for me, right on Market Street. Oh, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it at all. You're such a genius. <laughs> well, maybe not a genius, but quick with the answer, mm. huh? Speaking of answers, a hmm? couple you still owe me. Oh, please, honey, no more questions. Now, remember, remember, Mike, that statue to a genius? Okay, okay, shoot me the question. When did you know for sure that Don was the murderer? When we found Miller shot, of course. Why then? Don't you remember, honey, when we caught uh, up with Miller sneaking back to the house from Harrison's private train, he said he would talk to the right person when it would do him the most good? Yeah, yeah, I thought he meant Faraday. Oh, no, no, no. Our blackmailing friend was talking right through us to the only other party there, which meant Don. He was throwing out a hint for a payoff. Well, of course I know, but how about... That's all, honey, please, that's all, positively all. And hold on to your hat because I'm turning. Just a minute, this isn't the way to the office. You're turning into Golden Gate Park. Ha <laughs> ha, is that bad? Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover.
the mid-afternoon light of Maytime, Broadway shimmers and Langer walks the street. The dream walk, rhythm to the pulse of the sleeping neon. To the sun-warmed blues yawned out of loudspeakers. To the slow, erratic dance of the litter of night, held close, thrown away by a gutter wind. And with the rest of Broadway you stand and watch, or follow the crowd, and lend your heart to the whispered cry that this day, this time, will not get away from you. But it does. It always does. The web of blood in the alley was already dust heavy. Its threads leading you to the man huddled in a forgotten anguish against the flaking brick of an alley wall. His hand still clutched to the bullet wound as if he tried to claw out the pain and never made it. And the other man leaning over him being gentle and polite as he searched the dead man's pockets, then finding something and looking at it, then making the only observation left to him. It's a nice day, wasn't it, Danny? What did you find, Muggerman? Found him like that, all broken up about the bullet in his chest. He tried to tell me why it was there. The word never got out. It was phoned in? Yeah, from the back room of a bar down the alley. A friendly chap wandered out for a breath of fresh air, saw this, ran back to the bar, made his phone call, bought drinks for the house. He's still celebrating if you want to talk to him. You talk to him? Yeah, friendly lush, invited me to a cold beer. I didn't take it. He knew this man? Never had the pleasure, he told me. All the citizens of the alley never